Hello, everyone, and thank you for joining me for another restful episode of True Scary Stories to Help You Fall Asleep. Today, we have a very long compilation of a bunch of different types of true scary stories. I hope you enjoy them. So, now, without further ado, lay back, relax, and enjoy these true scary stories. I'm new to the group, so I wanted to share an experience that I had back in the spring of 2018. I've had a few of what could be considered paranormal experiences in my life, but this was the most recent and unnerving. I'm an avid outdoorsman, and I love to hunt and camp around the Francis Marion and Sumter National Forest. Back in 2018, I took my young son and dog out to a remote area in the National Forest to test out a new camper shell on my recently purchased truck. We found a secluded area off a dirt road, made dinner, and then packed it in for the night as soon as it got dark. Around 11 p.m. at night, I sat up and looked out the back of the truck due to my dog growling. In the distance, I saw what looked like hundreds of small white balls of light darting around, then hovering for a few seconds and slowly converging to our campsite. They looked just like the dust orbs you see on videos, but these were producing light in a completely dark forest. They soon surrounded my truck. Seemed like hundreds of them. They were soft white light, and they didn't blink. Lightning bugs were out early evening, but those were yellow and blinking. After 30 minutes of them floating around and concentrating around us, I finally worked up the nerve to open the truck and lit a lantern, and they promptly disappeared. After turning off the lights and looking back up, they came back. My son was fast asleep, thank God. I watched them until I finally fell asleep again around 1 a.m. The next morning when we tried to leave, the battery was dead on the new truck. There weren't any lights in the back cab where we would have used any power. A week later, I had to replace the electric control module. Not sure if that is relevant info, but I thought that I would add it. Has anyone had any similar experiences? Just thinking about them again makes the hair stand up on my neck. Just a heads up, this is going to be a long one, and the whole story might be a bit hectic because it still terrifies me to this day, even to think about it. But after binge reading multiple similar stories here, I decided to share as well. So the whole thing happened back in summer of 2016. For some context, my parents go on holidays quite often, and I used to stay home alone for two weeks at a time to look after our dogs and take care of the garden in general. I've always been kind of a scaredy cat due to my experiences with being harassed and followed home alone a couple of times. My neighborhood was relatively new at the time, so the whole thing was surrounded by forests. And oftentimes, you could come across some junkies lurking in the forest while walking home from shops. However, despite that, I usually felt very safe in my house staying with four big dogs and all. Nothing would ever really happen since most of my neighbors were my dad's friends, who were all in the army. For some reason, it gives me this odd sense of safety because who would be stupid enough to try to break in in an area like that? Oddly enough, during that particular summer, a couple of break-ins happened on my street, but my parents still decided to leave me home alone, reassuring me that I have nothing to worry about because I have my dogs and our house is surrounded by a big fence. My fence has little spikes on top, so it's almost impossible to jump across it without hurting yourself. So the first couple of days were fine. Nothing weird happened, except for some thuds that I heard in my garden, but I thought nothing of it since usually it was just some small animals causing mischief in my mom's flowers. It would happen so often that even my dogs would ignore it at that point. Two days passed, and I finally had to leave for the shops, but due to having loads of stuff to do throughout the day, I had to go in the evening when it was getting slightly dark outside. So I went to the shops, got my stuff, and would walk back home through my usual path. People would usually walk their dogs there, so it was quite busy in the evening, because it was something in between a park and a forest. 
So I was just casually walking, minding my own business, texting someone on my phone, when I noticed that some guy I passed suddenly stood up from behind the bench and started walking behind me. But again, I thought maybe it's just someone from my neighborhood that I don't recognize, and he's just walking in the same direction as me. So I exit the forest into a normal road where houses start. I live right at the end of that road. Guy's still walking behind me. I still think that maybe he lives in one of these houses. But no. I get to the last junction where my house is. The guy is still behind me. And at this point, I know he's not one of my neighbors. So my blood runs cold. Luckily, my neighbor who lives to the left of my house was outside watering his plants. And he spotted me as I was walking by and started talking to me. He knew my parents were out of town and was clearly concerned why I looked so stressed. So the guy who was walking behind me immediately noticed and just started running away again towards the forest, which ultimately gave me the creeps. He was clearly trying to follow me to my house. I called my parents to tell them what had happened. But again, they told me that I have nothing to worry about. Our neighborhood is safe. I had my dogs with me and so on and so on. So I try to calm down and go on with my things as usual. So for some more context, whenever my parents are out of town, I sleep in their bedroom downstairs, since I don't want my dogs to walk the stairs in the dark and possibly hurt themselves. That night, as usual, I was laying in bed, reading a book, my dogs already soundly sleeping in bed with me. I suppose they could sense that I was stressed because they usually sleep on the floor around the bed. I heard a thud coming from outside, like a little thud on the window in the room next to mine. Again, I thought it was just little animals. But this one time, my dog started growling at the window in my bedroom. Couple of seconds of silence. Another thud. This time on the window in my bedroom. That already made me panic, but I tried to stay calm nonetheless. However, the third got louder, each coming from windows on the ground floor. Someone was banging on every window of the house, making my dogs go absolutely insane, running around the house wherever the bangs were coming from. At that point, I was in tears, knowing exactly what was happening. So I got out of my bedroom and walked to the center of my house. The house has an open concept, so I could see the main door. And here's the thing. My main door has a window on it, so you can see inside. So I sat down in the darkness, just a couple of feet away from the door, just waiting to see what was going to happen, hoping and praying that someone will get scared of my dogs barking. But no, I wasn't that lucky. First, I see my dogs rushing to the door, barking at it before there's anything there. But then I see a black silhouette outside my main door, peeking inside and then banging on the little window as I'm sitting there helpless. I moved out of sight, hiding under the table. I got my phone out as I'm still hearing that man trying to break the glass. I called my dad, barely being able to breathe. He didn't pick up. Right. It was like 2 a.m. and they were on holiday. I tried two times more until my mom picked up very confused at why I'm calling in the middle of the night. I managed to spit out. Someone's trying to break in. I don't know what to do. At that point, the man was trying to open the door, banging with his whole body on the frame to the point where my mom could hear it on the call. My dad was frantically trying to call everyone who could come and help me. His brother, my neighbors, my grandma... Everyone was put in a full mobility at that very moment to come here as fast as they could. My neighbors, the same one who spoke to me earlier that day, was the first one to come outside and scare the guy away. He rushed to my back garden, but I was still too afraid to open the main door, despite the fact that I could see the neighbor standing in front of it. I knew that man was still on my property, but back of the garden was pitch black, and my neighbor didn't want to risk going out there on his own and getting potentially knocked out with something heavy. Ten minutes later, my uncle, aunt, and grandma all pull up into my house, and I can see them all outside. My uncle had a key, so he opened the door, letting my dogs outside so they could chase after the intruder. My dogs are hunting dogs, so they're not cute little puppies for strangers. My uncle and neighbor went in the backyard with torches, accompanied by my dogs to check every corner and make sure that it's safe now. I will never forget how my grandma and my aunt approached me when I was clinging onto the chair, absolutely in tears as my mom was trying to figure out what was happening on the call. The man escaped through the garden into my other neighbor's garden. I'm guessing trying to get away from the dogs, but he was finally gone. 
He did manage to damage the little window on my main door. The glass was already slightly cracked. The door itself got loose on the door hinges. I don't want to think about what could have happened if they didn't get to my house that quickly. Edit. For those who are asking why I didn't call the police, I forgot to mention that the whole situation happened in Poland. That's where I'm originally from. And the police here are not exactly reliable or helpful. So I'm guessing my parents were aware that it would do more damage rather than help. I was hiking in the Catskills. I live in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania, but I come up to the Catskills fairly regularly throughout the year because sometimes the Pecanos get a little boring. I started at the trailhead parking lot where I parked my car and began walking up the same trail that I've walked up a thousand times. After about an hour, I started to feel kind of weird. It felt like the woods were a little bit quieter than they usually were when I had come up here before, but I wasn't initially very concerned about it. After I sat down to have breakfast, I started hearing rustling above me, and some sticks fell down right behind me. I wasn't really worried about this earlier, as I just assumed it was some squirrels running around or some chipmunks throwing things at me. This has happened to me before. I finished my breakfast without incident, and kept walking towards the summit. This was fairly early in the morning, around 6am, so I would think there would be a lot of birds chirping and a lot of other activity but things just kept getting quieter and quieter as I ascended. This definitely creeped me out, but I tried to push it out of my mind because I've already been hiking for a while at this point, and I'm definitely not turning around. Eventually, more sticks fell to my right, somewhat close to me, and they sounded heavier. These were the kind of small twigs that would generally fall from squirrel activity. I went over and checked them, and these were fairly substantial. This continued to happen in a higher frequency, until I finally reached the end of the trail. On my way back, it happened continuously, increasing in frequency as I descended, until suddenly, it just kind of stopped when I was about a mile from the car. When I finally returned to my car, I found all of the doors open, and it seemed like a lot of my stuff had been very violently rummaged through. I had a bag in there with some of my clothes in it, and this had been torn up. A lot of my clothes were outside the car, leading back into the woods. I thought about calling the police, but I live in Philadelphia, so I knew that there wasn't really anything that was going to happen. To this day, I still get freaked out when I think about it. I don't necessarily think that it was connected, but I do feel really uneasy about both of these things happening at the same time. But then again, maybe I was just robbed. When I was about 12 years old, my mom was working later than usual, and because of that, I ended up being home alone. It was late summer, so 7.30 p.m. it was dusk, but not fully dark. I heard the doorbell go and assumed that my mom had her hands full and couldn't find her keys. I opened the door, and I stopped cold in my tracks when I noticed three males. They said they were from some kind of energy company and asked if my parents were home. I lied and said my mom was upstairs in the bath and closed the door. I quickly sped down the hall and went into the living room, where I dropped to the floor in a panic and crawled to the window to look. I could hear them laughing, and they sounded like a body group of lads on a night out. They knocked a few more times. This is when I started to fully panic. They even opened the letterbox for some reason a couple times. Finally, I heard the sounds of them getting quieter, so I peeked and they were leaving. They never went to another house in the neighborhood, and I have this awful feeling knowing that they didn't knock on any other houses after mine. So, quite a number of years ago, my cousin and I were on summer break at her house playing 007 on the GameCube and passing the time when we heard what sounded like broken glass on tile. The TV was up pretty loud, so we paused it, tensely waiting for another sound. 
Then, we heard the sound of flip-flop sandals walking around in the kitchen area. So my cousin called her mom slash my aunt. She asked my aunt, who was a nurse, if she was home from work yet. My aunt was not home and, of course, wanted to know why we were asking. Once we told her, she told us to crawl out the window and run to the neighbors as quickly as we could while she called the cops. The bedroom window luckily led to the backyard just next to the gate, so we got the crap out of there. Fast forward an hour or so, and the cops informed my aunt that there had been an obvious break-in. The window on the back door had been broken, and there was a note left for my aunt. Now, my aunt had recently gotten into a serious relationship with this super nice guy. We'll call him Josh. Well, Josh's ex-wife, however, was not so nice. She had, at some point, followed my aunt home and found where she lived. She then proceeded to break in through the back door, rummage through a bunch of stuff, and leave a horrible note for my aunt. I can only imagine what it said. From what I heard, she was arrested. I'm not sure if any charges were pressed, but she later unalived herself, leaving behind a daughter and son, whom I both went to school with. I also later found out that she suffered from severe bipolar disorder and a couple of other things. Tragic, but I'm glad that me and my cousin weren't caught up in her psychotic episode more than what we really were, and it still freaks me out to think about it. I was recently diagnosed with COVID, so I was home alone. The days have turned into a bit of a blur as I've just been resting and repeating. The other night, I heard some groans on our front porch. Our house is old and almost always has something falling apart, so I generally don't think too much of it when I hear strange sounds occur. When I found enough energy to look outside, I thought I could see someone on my porch. I froze scared and crept back into the living room. I phoned my fiancé and my parents, but by the time they had gotten over, no one was there. I figured it must be because I'm sick and just scaring myself. This morning, I woke up to let my dogs out and saw the same person or figure on the front porch. I ran to wake up my fiancé, and by the time I was back, whatever it was or whoever it was was gone. I'm sure I'm being paranoid, but I can't stop thinking about all the times the last couple of months that I thought someone was outside my house. What if they really were? Or maybe I'm just overanalyzing everything based on these two creepy occurrences. I've ordered a ring doorbell, and I'm hoping to figure out what's happening. It's just odd. When I was about nine or 10, I was invited to a classmate's birthday party at some swimming baths. All of us were the same age. It was a small class of about 20 kids, and I'm pretty sure that everyone was invited. Just to clarify, I'm a boy. Anyway, I kind of got separated from everyone, and it was just me and this girl alone. I wasn't particularly close friends with her, but I did know her as she was in my class. To describe the location, it was in a tunnel that connected to the main wave pool to a lazy river. There wasn't really anybody else there, just me and her, when she suddenly lunged at me without warning. She grabbed my head and held it underwater. I was a pretty skinny kid and she was bigger than me, and a bit of a tomboy. About 20 seconds went by as I furiously tried to free myself, but she wasn't letting go. Fight or flight and mass panic took over, and I eventually fought my way free. I was coughing and spluttering water as I emerged. I remember looking at her and just being in shock. I think I began to ask why she did that when she lunged at me again. She again held my head underwater for what felt like a lifetime before I fought my way free. Both times, I genuinely thought I was going to drown, and she didn't let me up. I had to fight my way free. I couldn't swim at this time, but the water in the lazy river and tunnel was just maybe chest high. I began to backpedal away from her. She was giggling as if it was funny and had this kind of crazed look and grin on her face. I couldn't just climb out to escape as it was a tunnel, so I had to try and get out of there. As I was backpedaling, she was following me, and I made sure to keep distance so that she couldn't lunge again, but she was gaining on me. I actually managed to reason with her as I was so scared of her I was babbling at her. 
I tried to distract her by suggesting we go down a water slide together. It worked as I could see her thinking about it, and she stopped chasing me. I managed to exit the tunnel and water, and she slowly followed me, but seemed a bit unsure. I immediately felt more safe as I was out of the water and could see other people around as we headed towards the slides. I kept talking all the way up about how fun the slides were, but she didn't really speak at all and had a strange look on her face the whole time. Anyway, after we went down the slides, I caught up with my friends and just stuck with them for the rest of the time as I was a bit shook up. I never told them about it and it was a bit embarrassing to admit that a girl had tried to drown me and I was worried that I'd get teased. Anyway, fast forward to adulthood. She got with her partner who had two or three kids from her previous relationship. Turns out, they were very abusive to the kids and eventually because of what they were doing to the kids one of them passed away she is currently serving a life sentence in prison i told my friends about this swimming pool incident after hearing about her crimes and i'm pretty sure that they think that i'm just messing around as none of them took me seriously maybe as i kind of lightheartedly said that i was almost victim number one however nonetheless it is a bit crazy to think back as she obviously was a genuine psychopath, and if I'd never fought her off me to escape and then convinced her to go down that slide, I genuinely believe that she would have killed me. In February of last year, me and a bunch of my friends went camping at Moss Park, a county park to the southeast of Orlando. This county park is on a forested island with two large lakes to the east and west, and two extensive nature preserves to the north and south. We were just hanging around the campfire drinking beers and smoking pot. Around 11 p.m., me and three of the friends decided to go for a walk into the nature preserve to the south. Our destination was a dock on a pond slash cove of the large lake to the west. I normally am not the type to go walking outside in the woods at dark. I do a lot of hiking, but always during the daytime hours. I guess being slightly inebriated and with some friends made me feel braver than usual. So we went trekking off into the woods in the dark with nothing but a flashlight to protect us. At first, the trail was taking us through a large swamp, and nothing felt out of the ordinary. Next, the trail entered a thick pine forest. Here, things began to feel a bit different, and in retrospect, it was very quiet, but I wasn't concerned at the time. We got to the dock and started shining the flashlight around, hoping to see some alligators. There were no alligators, no bugs, and no signs of life in general. I thought it was a bit odd, but again, I wasn't too concerned. Then all of a sudden, something changed. Within a few seconds, all four of us said something along the lines of, do you feel that? Something all of a sudden felt very wrong. Then one of my friends said, listen to how quiet it is. We all shut up and listened. It was insanely quiet. Not a single frog, insect, or bird. Even the wind had stopped. It was the quietest thing I had ever heard in my life. It was like we were inside of a vacuum. Remembering this lack of sound gives me chills to this day. Next, we all remarked how cold it was getting. I started getting goosebumps. It felt like the barometric pressure had just plummeted. At this point, we all agreed that we needed to get the F out of there. There was a strong feeling of impending danger, like something wanted us to leave ASAP, and we would be in big trouble if we didn't. I was able to feel that all of this energy was coming from across the pond towards us. I think all of my friends could feel this as well, because we were all focused on the pond. Nobody was paying any attention to the dark woods behind us. It felt like a charge of energy was running through my body and I could feel exactly the direction that this energy was coming from. We all agreed that we had to leave and started walking back at a fast pace. The bad feelings were still present while we were walking back through the pine forest. One of my friends actually started crying. I wasn't too worried though. It felt like we would be okay as long as we kept walking. Once the trail exited the pine forest and into the swamp, all the bad feelings were immediately lifted. It was like we had crossed some sort of threshold and everything felt fine again. I think we may have been run off by a Sasquatch, 
because I've seen them myself on a few occasions, and I've heard that they can put these bad feelings into people. But we didn't see anything, so I can't say for sure what it was. About 15 minutes after getting back to the campfire where the rest of our friends were, we heard what sounded like someone or something whacking a tree with a big stick one time just across the campground. This may have been related to what happened earlier. The campground host immediately got up and started walking around with a light, as if they were equally surprised by this sound, or possibly this kind of thing had happened before. I had to leave the next morning to go to work, but some of my friends stuck around and went back to the dock during the daylight hours, and they reported that nothing was out of the ordinary this next time. I still go hiking a lot, but I'm not planning on doing any more hiking in the dark. I felt like we were in legitimate danger, like whatever it was could have made us disappear if we didn't leave as soon as we did. I lived in the middle of nowhere, in the country. The closest house was a few miles away. My parents never let me be home alone, but they had to go get groceries from a town 40 minutes away, and I begged them not to make me go. I just wanted to stay home and play Barbies. They agreed. I was having the time of my life, and all of a sudden I hear both of my dogs barking outside. They only bark like they did when a car pulls up. I'm on the second floor of my home. The front door is on the first floor, right by the stairs to the basement. I look out my window and just stare because I had a sinking feeling in my stomach and start screaming. I see a man walking up my driveway. So I start hyperventilating and crying and wondering how this person even got here. My driveway is pretty long, thank God, but it's covered in trees. He's about 20 feet from my front door and that thing is never locked. So I bolted down the stairs and thankfully got there in time. It was right out of the movies it felt like, because as I was in front of the door locking it, I heard a pounding on the door. Then I heard the door handle trying to open. I book it to the dining room to make sure that the screen door is locked, and I call my dad on the home phone, and he starts swearing. Not directly at me, but like, WTF, blah, blah, blah. I hear him going through the garage, and I'm just freaking out, and he's still trying to open the door. He eventually goes through the yard and seemed to be looking for something. My dog is small, but she's barking a storm. I try to call my closest neighbor who was a retired cop, but of course he wasn't home. Felt like 30 minutes, but the guy finally leaves and my dad and mom get home. Turns out it was a very, very drunk neighbor. His house was like seven miles away and he came into our yard looking for my dad because he drove his car into the ditch and we live on a tire farm. It wasn't uncommon for my dad to help these people. They were drunk all the time and looked for rides. Anyway, my dad took his gun and went to their house and threatened them to never do stuff like that again. If I remember, they were trying to get into our vehicles too. It was the scariest time of my life. I didn't stay home alone for a long time after that. Even thinking back on it now, my heart races. I don't think he would have done anything to me because they respected my dad. My dad's like six foot five and has anger issues. But at the time, I didn't know that. Edit to add, these people ended up making me a dream catcher in a tribal blanket. They had 10 people living in a two bedroom house of theirs, so I didn't recognize the man. But their house ended up getting raided for drugs or something and two dead dogs were found stacked behind the stove. So maybe they were like 50% nice and 50% harmful. Years ago when I was 11, I was staying home alone with only my little brother who was seven. At that time, it was about 9 p.m., dark and pouring rain, and we were reading in our room, right next to the front door with a big window and open blinds. That's when I hear the front doorbell ring, followed by knocking. I thought my parents had arrived. Strange though that they didn't use the garage or their keys. I looked outside to see their car, but nothing. As I approach the door, I hear a man's voice that was not my father's yell through the torrent. Would you like some cookies? We're selling Girl Scout cookies. I'm shocked at this, 
considering the weather and time of day. I say nothing. I check the peephole and peer through the side window, only to see that it was not a father with his girl as I expected. My heart dropped. Standing there was just a fully grown man maybe in his late fifties. No cookies in sight, soaking on my doorstep. I can remember the gut-wrenching feeling of having to check the locks while he was right on the other side. For sure he heard this. The two locks were the only things separating myself and my brother from a potential monster. He continued to knock and mention his cookies, as I considered calling the cops. That's when I remembered the blinds were open in my room where my brother was, with the light on. As I turn the corner into the doorway, I see the man carefully peering into our window, possibly eyeing my brother, distracted in his book. My heart was pounding now as I began to panic. In a move that took all of my willpower, I quickly turned off the lights and ran over to the window to close the blinds, in full view of the man. As fast as I could, I double-checked all the locks in the house, closed all the blinds, and told my brother to go hang out in one of the big closets in the interior of the house. I didn't tell him what was going on so he wouldn't be frightened, and for some reason I never did call the cops or my parents. I just waited in the hallway until he left. Still, thinking about it gives me the shivers that so many things could have gone wrong that night. My worst fear since is a stranger getting to the unlocked door before I do. For context, I am now 26 years old and I met my stalker at the ages of 14 or 15. So when I was 14, I decided to take ballroom dance classes. That was kind of normal for teenagers in my generation in my country. There you had to change partners each song, so every girl would dance with every boy. In my group that consisted of mostly teens between 14 to 17, there was a really tall, almost two meter 21 year old guy, Philip. We had a nice chat the times we danced, but he seemed weird. And because I was young and naive, and that's how I normally made friends, I told him where I lived when he asked me. So the stalking began, and at the time I did not realize that it was stalking. I just thought he had a lot of time, and that it was annoying. But anyway, Philip would ride on his bike from his home, he only lived one town over from me, to my house, and asked if I wanted to spend time outside with him and play. After doing that for a few times, I asked my parents to tell him that I was not home when he would come over. Both my parents and I were very oblivious about his actions for a very, very long time. At one point in time, the stalking ended for a few weeks, and Philip also did not come to dance classes. At that time, I became part of a friend group of a boy that I fancied. For some months, he had a girlfriend, but they split soon after, and I became his girlfriend. Unfortunately, Philip was also friends with the best friend of my boyfriend, so he was also part of the group. They told me Philip was in a mental hospital. In the span of his stalking, Philip was in several mental hospitals multiple times, and every time he was, I was glad, because I would get some peace. When I was 16, my family and I had to move because our landlady had thrown us out. She wanted to live in the property herself. So we moved one town over. We started living two streets apart from my stalker, and every time Philip was out of the hospital, he would be at my house. It wasn't as often as before, but still. At my father's birthday, he rang again, and because my family had guests, they told me to open the door, and there he was looming over me, like a dark, menacing shadow man. I told him to leave, and I tried to close the door, but he blocked it. So I was standing there, afraid, begging him to leave. At one point, I even ran inside to get my dad to send him away, but my dad said, he's your friend, so it's your problem. So I went back to the door, and I begged and pleaded that Philip please leave. At one point, he was kneeling slash setting in my doorway. After almost two hours, he finally left. And at that point, it was obvious for me, finally, because I had realized what type of behavior it was, that he was a stalker and he was fixated on me. The next day, I sat down my parents and told them that I was afraid of Philip. And my dad also apologized to me for putting me in that situation and not helping me. The next time Philip came to my house, my dad was there and told him that I do not want any contact with him, so he left. After a few more incidents like that, he stopped showing up at my door, and I thought that we finally got rid of him. 
but every time I started to live happily, starting to forget my fear of him, a letter, an email, or a gift would show up and would send me back into my fears. At the age of 20, I was out of school, and to pass the year, I had to wait to start my job. I worked in a grade school in a voluntary after-school care club for grade schoolers. After a month or two, my mom woke me up in the morning and told me to get dressed because she had called the cops. Apparently, Philip was again every morning at our door and would ask for me, and my parents didn't tell me so that I wouldn't get scared again. Finally, after the cops told Philip three times to leave and he ignored them, they arrested him, and he screamed and screamed my name and that he was burning for me and that the cops hurt him. My parents and I were standing in the kitchen listening. The situation was so absurd and so much for me that I started laughing hysterically. We filed a report at the police for stalking and trespassing, but the officers said that they could not do anything because he hadn't hurt me physically. We tried to get a restraining order, but it didn't go through. A week later, Philip had sneaked into our garden, and like in a movie, he threw rocks at my window. And just as a side note, Throwing rocks at a girl's window is not romantic. It's creepy. But idiot me opened the window, but I did not see anything until it clicked, and I ran downstairs and told my dad that he was in the garden. Philip escaped before my dad was able to go check. A week after that, I was in the kitchen cooking when Philip rang the doorbell again, and because we have no way of seeing who was at the door, I opened it. And there he was again, telling me that he missed me and saying that he had peeked through the blinds of the windows in the living room the past week to see if I was there. My parents weren't home. If they had been, I would have ran. But like this, I had to swallow my fear and stand in the doorway listening to Philip talk until my boyfriend, different guy than before, came. I had to send him an SOS text message, and he was on his way. After my boyfriend finally arrived, he told Philip to leave, and he did. Philip mentioned in passing that he also now has a girlfriend. After that, I did not see Philip for a long time. A friend told me that he was taken by the men in white coats because he had believed that his mom was possessed by the devil. I was glad. It wasn't until two years later when I got a letter from court. I was a witness and told to attend in the case of assault of Philip. Apparently after coming out of the mental hospital, he had a big fight with his girlfriend and he hit her. And because she was scared, she played dead. Philip called an ambulance, and the police finally had something against him. After the hearing, he was admitted again to a mental hospital, and I finally got a restraining order, and he was ordered to stay at least 30 meters away from our property. I was so glad. The restraining order also implied that if he broke any of the requirements, he would go to jail. So it was over. Two years ago, I also moved out of my parents' house. I'm posting this only now because I believe I'm seeing him again. But it can't be. He doesn't know where I live, and he also hasn't shown up at my parents' house. But I believe that I have seen him when I leave the house. I just need reassurance that it's not him again, and that I'm safe at my home. Update. So I installed a security camera, and my neighbors also told me that there's a man that looks quite similar to Philip working at the senior living center at the street over. So for now, I think I'm safe. I believe that I saw that person and not Philip. So a little bit of background. I'm from Spain with family from Italy. This story is 100% true. Me, my dad, and my brother are all three familiar with camping, nature, etc., we don't get scared easily, and we aren't really superstitious or whatever. Also, excuse me for any grammatical errors I might make in this. English isn't my first language. But anyway, now on to the story. This happened in 2010, I believe. I was eight years old, and we were on summer vacation in Italy, in the region of Tuscany, where some of our family is from. We, my brother, dad, and me, were hiking in the country far away from any towns or any other form of big civilization. We were not very familiar with this route, though. All of a sudden, we stumble across what looks like an abandoned Tuscan farmhouse. Not very big, though. We all look around and yell, asking whether there was someone. It looked very abandoned. The door was missing. 
plants all growing over the place. Safe to say, no one lived there. So since we love adventure, and it didn't seem like a bad plan to do with two children, we decided to take a look at the place. As we're going to enter the house, out of nowhere comes a barn owl flying out of the house. It was dark in there. So we had a quick scare, but nothing too bad. It's just an owl, right? Now we enter the house, and we just find the typical stuff that you would imagine to find when you're in an abandoned house. Cutlery and plates on the ground, a candle, some old paintings. Nothing really valuable, though. Now we see an old wooden ladder that leads up to a hole in the ceiling. It was not a very big hole. My father couldn't fit. To give you an idea, he's like six foot two. And so, since I was the oldest of the two kids, I would go up and tell them what I saw upstairs. Now I went up the ladder and I got in a room where I could barely see because the windows were covered with wood boards. So I could make out some stuff by a few sun rays that would get in through the gaps. I could see graffiti signs. Typical for an abandoned house, right? And I saw another room. So I told my father and brother that I would advance to there and see what was up. As I opened the rotten wooden door, I immediately stood still. A disgusting rotten smell penetrated my nose. I almost had to throw up. I wanted to know what caused this bad smell. Then, in the corner of the room, I could make out a silhouette. I got closer to investigate what it could be, and I could barely make out that it was the lifeless body of a dog. A big dog. And, spicy detail, the body was skinned. No fur or anything. Just pure, rotting flesh in the shape of a big dog. I don't remember how long I stood there, frozen. But I woke up from my shock with the screams of my brother, because apparently the barn owl had gotten back inside the house and it almost hit him. So my dad yelled at me to come back and I gladly obeyed. When I got back downstairs, I told him what I had seen, and the look that he gave me was that of a man who was scared to crap, but doesn't want to admit it in order not to scare his young kids. He just got close to my ear and whispered to run. We ran out of that place and never got back, or even close to the route leading to it. Now, it might not be very scary compared to other stories on this page or very backwoods related, but I thought I'd give it a go since someone said that they wanted to hear stories from outside the Northern America sphere. It was still in the country part and there were woods around it though. I'm sorry in advance for my English. When I was a teenager around 2004, we used to sneak down through a quiet area of scrub over the dunes on the beach to smoke weed. I lived in a very small coastal town on the mid-north coast of New South Wales. Typical wildlife was possums, wallabies, and maybe the occasional kangaroo. Definitely no dingoes, crocs, or other apex predators around. One night, as we quietly made our way down the path, we noticed a shuffling, rustling sound in the undergrowth near the path. We stopped moving, and the sound seemed to stop as well. There was absolutely zero light except from some houses in the distance in the moon. After a brief pause, we decided to keep moving. We heard the rustling sound again, and this time noticed some bushes moving. We stopped, and my friend whispered, Holy crap, did anyone else see the trees move? I whispered back, I only saw the bushes move. We stood there frozen for a few beats. In my head, I was weighing up the option to either continue on the path or leg it back home. We took a few more steps forward when we heard the sound like leaves crunching underfoot. At this point, I reached out and grabbed my friend's hand, thinking maybe we were being followed by someone. It was right then that I noticed I could smell something awful. What's that smell? My mate whispered. His voice came out so small it frightened me even more. We stood there for so long but probably only a minute or two, until we heard a low groan slash growl sound coming from a few meters away. Now, brush tail possums are quite common to the area and are known to make a kind of grunting slash coughing sound, but they are, at least the ones I've ever heard, distinctly higher pitched and more chirpy sounding than what we heard. This was a low and more sonorous sound, kind of like a with some scratching sounds at the end. Needless to say, we wordlessly booked it right back up the path the way we came. 
It sounded to me like a huge commotion of leaves crunching and branches shaking and crashing behind us as we ran. But reflecting on it with my adult hindsight, it definitely could have been us making all that noise. We never went back to that spot again and would bring it up from time to time, trying to speculate what could have followed us that night. Our best theories were that it was a big possum or a person trying to scare us. The biggest issues we would argue over was why would a possum follow us, let alone down on the ground? Although my mate says that he heard tree branches moving as well. And if it was a person, how did they make that sound? And what was the smell? And why didn't we hear any footfall? Maybe it was just a coincidence of events. A person following us, a nearby possum growling, and a nearby dead animal stink wafting over at just the right moment. But it still makes me shiver to think about it now. This happened to me just last Tuesday, and I can't stop thinking about it. I'll start this story by saying that I'm a 30-year-old female who lives with my fiancé and our two dogs. I have two huskies. One is two, and the other one is four months old. My huskies are not guard dogs to save their life. They don't bark nor howl. These dogs just love people so much. My brother-in-law and friends have walked in on multiple occasions, and the dogs don't make a peep. So anyways... It's 8 p.m. It's dark out. I'm home alone. Fiance had a hockey game. I'm in the bathroom with the door closed and the blow dryer going, so I can't really hear anything going on around me. That is, until I hear one of the dogs howl. I stop the blow dryer and listen, thinking that the dogs are fighting again. Then I hear a faint knock and the dogs are going crazy, barking, howling, jumping into the bay window so bad that I thought they'd break it. I'm thinking, what the crap is making them move crazy like that? Maybe a dog or a skunk? I look out my bedroom window, as it was the closest view to the front door for me. Well, lo and behold, there's two men in hoodies, standing right at the front door. They start knocking louder, and this time my two-year-old husky jumps from the bay window to the front door and starts growling and ramming his body into the door. I'm watching this from my bedroom, as the dog jumps into the front door, one of the men jumps back startled, looks at the other guy, and they just walk away. I called my fiancé to get home ASAP. I watched them walk away down the road. They weren't selling anything as they didn't stop at any other houses. I was so creeped out and still am. Thank goodness for my crazy dogs. So this happened to me a few years ago in April, and I still can't shake off how terrifying and strange it was. So I was home alone, getting ready for my 12 o'clock college class that morning, and I opened my blinds to let some natural light in. I glanced out my window to see a man in his mid-30s wearing a baseball cap roaming around my property, with his hand on his hips, walking with a lot of weird confidence. Our yard is kind of like a cliff and it looks over onto our five acres of property down below. I live in the Pacific Northwest, so it's a pretty scenic view. I was really confused and thought maybe it was a worker that my mom had hired for our renovations on the house admiring the view. I'm a little uncomfortable at this point because the dude walks to the side of my house out of sight. I head upstairs to see him now roaming around my front yard and my driveway, looking at things, checking out my house, etc. He still hasn't seen me at this point. I call my dad and ask him if we have hired anyone to come by the house, and he says not that he knows of, and he tells me that he's going to call my mom and ask her, and then call me back. I'm waiting for the call when I notice this strange dude's car. It's a white Honda with no license plates, just parked parallel to my front door. The man still hasn't seen me, and he's still wandering around, so I take this as an opportunity to remember that we have a security system and I armed it. So if he did try to break in it would immediately alert the police. If this was some sort of professional or worker, he would have rang my doorbell or knocked at least once. He did neither. Just then I get a call back from my dad 
saying neither him nor my mom has hired anyone to come by today and that I need to call our local police station immediately. I went back downstairs after making sure to lock every door and window upstairs and called my city's police station. I explained to a woman on the other end what is happening and she decides that she's not going to send an officer out and instead gives me a number to call their emergency dispatch line and told me to talk to them. I call the number she gave me and immediately I get an automated message saying, thank you for calling my town's name, non-emergency hotline. Nobody is available to take your call right now. If this is an emergency, please hang up and dial 911. At this point, I'm really irritated because 15 minutes has passed and this weird dude is still lurking around my house while I'm home alone. And apparently that wasn't enough to warrant an emergency to the lady that I called at my local police department. I hung up and decided to call 911. After getting in touch with the 911 operator, I was asked a series of questions about his appearance before they would even alert officers near me to start heading towards my house. The whole thing seemed really weird. Nobody was in a hurry to have officers come up to my place when I was a younger girl home alone with a strange man. I asked the officer if I could stay on the line with her when she finally, after what seemed like forever, alerted police to come where I was. She agreed and I went back upstairs to check on the weird guy and he's now sitting in his unplated Honda, either listening to a radio show extremely loudly or on a phone call with someone through his car. It was a very prominent loud male voice coming from his car. Then all of a sudden, I hear the tone you hear when someone hangs up on you and the operator was no longer on the line. I was really confused when my thoughts were interrupted by an unrecognized phone number calling me. I assumed it was the operator calling back, so I picked it up. Instead, I was greeted by really heavy, creepy breathing. I'm not sure whose it was, but it really freaked me out. I hung up immediately and dialed back 911. I had been pretty calm up to this point, but that phone call put me in panic mode. I got on the phone with another operator, who already knew my situation and address before I even could explain it to her. She said the cops were on their way. 20 minutes had passed at this point. The dude is still here in his car, and the cops aren't. Keep in mind, I live in a smaller town, so there is no reason why it took the cops as long as it did to come down. Finally, this guy is leaving my driveway right as the cops pull in, and they stop him and ask him a few questions. A cop then comes to my door and hands me a sketchy looking flyer saying it was just a landscaper. He said he had an appointment. I was really relieved and irritated that it was just a dude my mom had hired, until I realized that it wasn't. I called my mom back and said, the cop said it was just a landscaper that you hired and that he had an appointment. My mom replies with, I can assure you, we never hired a landscaper. We don't even need one. I'm a 29 year old female and I grew up in a nice suburban neighborhood. I lived in the same house my entire childhood and only left once I moved out as an adult. I always felt safe, leaving our doors unlocked, window open, going for late walks as a teen. I was around 17 when I noticed strange things started happening around my house. My house was also haunted, so weird noises and things moving on their own were not a new thing. But this isn't a paranormal story but this is probably why I and my family dismissed my experiences for so long. As a teen, I worked at a movie theater, and I did not work until the afternoon, and I would get off very late at night. I turned into quite the night owl, and it was normal for me to stay awake until about 3 in the morning. It started off as my dog reacting to things outside. I would peek outside my window and I would never see anything, so I assumed that my dog was just hearing noises and overreacting. Not too long after this started, I was outside and noticed that there were handprints and a mark between them on my window, as if someone were pressing their forehead against the glass. At the time, I just dismissed it. I had plenty of friends coming in and out of my house, and they would knock on my window sometimes as they arrived. My window was by the driveway as you walk out the front door. The weird thing is that this window is very large. The window would start about three feet from the ground and went at least eight feet high and was about four feet wide. It was a one-story house. The forehead and hand marks were at least six foot five off the ground. I definitely did not have any friends who were that tall, and everyone in my family is less than five foot six. 
Soon after that, I woke up around 5 in the morning to my car alarm going off. Again, I did not think anything of it and just dismissed the situation. This happened a few more times within the next few weeks. Always between 4 and 5 in the morning. But the last time I noticed handprints on the top of my car, as if somebody was trying to crawl through my open sunroof. After that, I made sure to close all of my windows and lock the doors. Again, I dismissed it thinking just some hoodlums were trying to get into an unlocked open car. Not long after the car incident, things started to escalate. One morning as I was leaving to school, I found a small stepladder outside of my window, leaning against the house, as if somebody was looking through my window. I had blinds that would move from the top and bottom. I normally had the blinds closed on the bottom and left about two feet open on top to allow sunlight in, but still have privacy. When I looked at my window, I could still see the handprints and forehead mark were placed right above the opening of my blinds. This means that they were able to use a step ladder to get a good look into my room. With the ladder against my window, I started to piece together the events over the last few months and realized that I had a peeping Tom. I brought this up to my parents, but they didn't seem to worry and made no effort to do anything about it. Over the next year, I found the ladder against my window many more times. This person would use an old step ladder that we had in the side yard that was unlocked. I would continuously put the step ladder back in the side yard, but it would continue to show up next to my window on many mornings. I don't know why I did not just put the step ladder in a place that was not accessible. To be honest, I was a teen smoking a lot of weed at this time, so I feel as though I was not using very much critical thinking. I have two other sisters who lived with us, but they did not seem to notice anything weird happening. About a year after I noticed the occurrences, we found my sister's bra was out in the yard, and we did not have any explanation. This made me think that somebody may be trying to actually get in the house when we were gone, with some success. I became extremely paranoid. We would often hear male voices outside our front doors, but it was common for us to hear disembodied voices due to the house haunting. My sisters and I were often home alone, and when unexplained voices happened, we would just go to our room turn on some Spongebob and try our best to ignore it. Again, my parents were aware that all of this was happening, but did not care to do anything about it. The last incident before we called the police was after a rainy night we found bare footprints outside of my sister's window in the mud. The screen had been fiddled with as if somebody was trying to get it off the window. Once this happened, my parents started to take it more seriously. It's funny because they did not care when incidences were happening directly to me. But the moment my sister has an experience, they decided to report it. The police could not do anything about it. They offered to send police every once in a while to fill out their paperwork in front of our house to make it seem like there was a police presence. This only happened one time and they never came back. My older sister made her boyfriend aware of the situation, so they decided to sit in the car all night and watch for the guy to show up. Every time he would try to pull an all-nighter to watch for this person, no one would show up. Looking back now, it makes me think that someone very close to my house must be the peeping Tom, because he must have been close enough to see that we had another person watching out for us. After a few years of these experiences, my sisters and I all moved out, and we have not noticed anything weird happening since. It still bothers me knowing that this person was never caught, and that we still have no idea who it was. It makes me frustrated knowing that it could be a next-door neighbor who we thought was normal, but was actually a pervert. This was all happening around 2010 to 2013 and was before we had easy affordable access to security cameras such as Ring and Blink. I wish we had cameras so we could know who this person was, but there was no point in dwelling over the past. All I know is that now I'm an adult. I always have my security cameras around my house, especially if I have young daughters. I have also bought my parents some security cameras. They still live in the same house. Maybe one day those cameras will catch the peeping Tom, but I don't think he will come back now that my sisters and I are all moved out. I mentioned this story in a reply to someone else a while back and I thought I'd give it its own thread. Location is a campground that may or may not be currently accessible. I know it was closed, gated off from the road, for quite a while, a good few years ago. 
Factory Shoals Campground, a good 20 minutes outside of Covington, Georgia. Yes, that's where they filmed the Vampire Diaries. Anyway, Factory Shoals Recreation Area, the campground. I'll say that I've never seen many other people out at this huge park, even on the nicest days, but a friend lives in a subdivision down the road. The area is sporadically rural, if that makes sense. You'll come across a school, a gas station, and a pretty big neighborhood, but nothing else for another six or seven minutes down the road. The campground is next to the Alcove River. In order to reach it, you have to drive through Newton Factory Cemetery, an old cemetery with mostly older graves sitting on the side of the road, slightly hidden by trees, smack dab in the middle of nowhere. I've often wondered about this. The graves date back to the 1800s. Maybe illegible ones are even older. And at some point, someone says, Hey, let's put a road through the cemetery and create a campground. So you go down this janky road through the cemetery about a quarter mile, and there you are, barely managed campground. There's maybe seven sites, mostly next to the river. I'm with a friend. It's a nice evening. The light bustling of the river is calming. There's only one other campsite occupied a bit down. No street lamps. The only light you have is the fire in your flashlight. So when we're headed to bed, fire extinguished, it's pitch black. You can see the stars. There must not have been a moon that night. I'm laying down and closing my eyes and I realize it's too quiet. Deafening silence. I jump back up and go to my friend's tent and tell her that I'm suddenly feeling really creeped out. We both realize the bugs and even the river have gone silent. To be fair, the river is only about eight foot across and about two feet deep here. We had commented on the peaceful lull of the river all through the evening. With curiosity stronger than fear, we walk over towards the water and observe a mist or fog lifting from the water. We're a little anxious and don't want to get right up on the bank to see if we can see the water moving. So my friend remembers a light up fishing lure type thing that she has in her bag. She fetches it, tosses it in and it just sits there. It doesn't flow down, so it's like the river came to a complete stop in its movement, is releasing a thick mist, and is completely dark and silent, except for that lure and its faint red glow barely visible through the thick mist. We both kind of start muttering that we should maybe pack up quick and leave before I see the spark and hear a gun firing not 15 feet away from us. Shine a light for a split second before we're both in the car. It's cranked, and we're tearing out of there. I didn't see anyone either from shining my light or from the headlights, and I about had a panic attack coming through the cemetery after that with the elongated shadows from headstones and monuments. I didn't sleep that evening, even after crashing on my friend's couch. Logic tells me the quiet could have come from a prowling human with a gun, but the mist and a river current stopping? And what if the who slash whatever followed us? I didn't even gather my tent and sleeping bag before going home the next day. I luckily had placed my bag in my car for some reason instead of taking it inside, so my only loss was the small old tent, the sleeping bag, a battery-powered lantern, and a camp chair. So it's maybe a year later and I'm in the area with my husband, and he doesn't believe me about the campground on the other side of a cemetery. It's midday and I decide to show him, pull up, and I see that the road is now blocked off beyond the graves, with a sign that states the campground is currently closed. We get out a minute to walk around the cemetery. It's a dirt road. There's a lot of kicked up dust settling. So much that my husband asks if there's water in my trunk. He's coughing. I go to get it, cursing under my breath at the thick layer of settled dust already on my precious sports car. And I notice a very clean and distinct fresh tiny handprint on my trunk. It had to be really fresh because I stood there and watched the still settling dirt start to stick and fill it in. We'd never made it more than a few feet from the car. There's nobody else out there. Again, we book it out of there. I know there's a legend about parking cars on hills in certain areas at night, and you'll find little handprints on the back and your car will have moved. My car didn't move, but those were legit fresh little handprints. I'm not sure if the cemetery brings playful souls. The entire area holds on to some type of energy. Or there's just some incredibly sneaky people that hang out in a minimally trafficked woods and back roads. I'll reiterate that this is part of a park, a recreational area that has grills and picnic tables about three minutes down the road. 
and I never saw anyone there the few times I visited aside from my friend, husband, or the other tent that I saw further down the river when we tried to camp. I've never gone back. I've been to other places in Newton County, though, that offer similar vibes. The Alcovey Trestle, Gaither Plantation, a random church smack dab in the middle of the woods, that creepy old gas station, but never back to the place that was in this story. And that's it. That's all that happened. That's the story. This happened when I was 13. I lived in a duplex with my dad and my brother. It was a two bedroom and I shared a room with my dad while my older brother had his own room. It wasn't uncommon for both of them to have plans at night while I stayed home to play video games alone. This night was no different. My dad was probably at some bar and my brother who knows where he was. I was playing the original Resident Evil on PlayStation and at around midnight my eyelids were getting too heavy so I decided to go to bed. I slept with my bedroom door wide open. Now, not one time in the years that we lived in this place did my dad or brother come home by entering through the back sliding glass door. A couple of times, my brother didn't have his key for one reason or another, and he knocked on my bedroom window and asked me to let him in. My dad always had his key and would always come home through the front door. On this night, I heard the back door slide open. It was an old door, and sliding it open wasn't easy. It was also very loud, so I heard it crystal clearly. I lay in bed, wide-eyed, my imagination going crazy. I heard whoever it was walk through the dining room, through the kitchen, and then into the living room. They made no attempt to be quiet. After a brief silent pause, I saw someone walk by my bedroom doorway. This scared the living hell out of me as you can imagine, and my heart throbbed. Whoever was in my house walked into the bathroom right next to my bedroom and flipped the light on. The light poured into my bedroom and I was laying there, terrified, completely exposed by the light from the bathroom. Why didn't I shout for my brother or my dad? Because like I mentioned earlier, I knew it wasn't them and there was no one else it could have been that would have made sense. Not a family member, not a friend. I knew it was someone that didn't belong. The person then walked out of the bathroom, left the light on, and went into my brother's room and started making a ton of noise. It sounded like they were searching for something. All I did was lay there shivering. After a few more minutes, the person walked by my bedroom again. I expected at any moment a stranger would walk into my room, but they didn't. I heard them making noise in the living room, walking around huffing and puffing. Then they started walking back and forth by my bedroom repeatedly into the bathroom and back out over and over. At this time, I was 100% sure that they were messing with me for some reason. They knew I was there, whoever they were. I heard the person making noises. By this and by the huge figure that I saw walking back and forth, I knew it was a man. They continued walking around each room except the one I was in. And then suddenly I heard them walk back through the house to the back sliding door, open it and then leave. I lay there in bed terrified, wondering what the hell just happened. After a while, out of sheer exhaustion, I fell asleep. In the morning, I found that my dad and brother were home. I've always asked both of them dozens of times, and they both promised that it was not them. Plus, again, why the hell would they go through the back door and then leave again through that same door? This was 21 years ago. I'll never know who it was or why they were there. Nothing was missing either. What really makes me wonder to this day, why the hell did they never come into my bedroom? The door was wide open and they walked by it at least 20 times. So I've had quite a few bad experiences with strange people in my house. From when I was young, an old man would come banging on our door late at night, demanding to see me, causing me to have to hide in the house and not be allowed into my garden alone for years. Or when a man came knocking on our door late at night with a knife because he mistook our house for my neighbors. 
these experiences all caused me to be very cautious about opening the front door to anyone or even being in the house alone, especially at night. But one evening was definitely the worst. It was around 6 p.m. in November of 2018. I'm from England, meaning it was already pitch black outside at this time of the year. I had just got home from work and was sat in my room upstairs watching YouTube on my laptop. My mom shouted up to me that she was going to pick my brother up from work and would be stopping off at a petrol station on the way home. So she'd be gone for a little while and asked if I wanted to come. I just said no and carried on with my video. I heard her close the front door and pull out of the driveway. I was 17 at the time, so being home alone at night was nothing new to me, and I was used to the eerie feeling of it. But after around 10 minutes, I started hearing noises coming from downstairs. At first, I thought nothing of it, and just related it to my cat noisily searching for food in an empty bowl, until I remembered him sitting at the end of my bed. I paused my video and listened more at the sound of banging on the back door. This instantly creeped me out until it was followed by the sound of keys jingling. And I just thought, oh, my mom must have just dropped my brother off before going to the petrol station, and now she's just trying to go outside. So I let the noise continue as I kept watching my video. He can get quite angry sometimes, so the loud banging was nothing out of the ordinary. But it just kept carrying on, banging and the sounds of keys jangling, then dropping, then banging again. Then the fear really hit me. I don't think it's my brother. I walked out of my room slowly and sat on the stairs listening carefully to the noise. It definitely wasn't him. I'm a very anxious person, and everyone gets those times late at night when they hear noises and immediately think the worst. This is just one of those, I told myself. So I decided to bite the bullet and just walk straight into the kitchen and face whatever it was causing the noise. Our kitchen has the door straight to the garden, but as I turned the corner into the kitchen, I heard a loud bang and clatter of footsteps run away. The cat flap had been ripped off the door, and there was a plastic from it everywhere. In fear, I still tried to console myself into thinking that it could be anything other than people breaking in. I sat back on the stairs and called my mom, just to check again that it wasn't my brother home early and just in a bad mood. But then he answered my mom's phone while still in the car. Are you at home? I shouted at him. No. Then my voice started to break with terror. Please be serious. Are you at home right now? No. What do you want? Even though he said he wasn't, I still begged in my mind that he was joking just to get a scare out of me. But he heard how scared I was and began to worry. I explained to him what happened and he started to scream at me to call the police. He's never been the protective type, but I could tell now that he was really worried and told my mom to rush back home straight away. While dialing 999, I tried so hard to stay calm. I told them exactly what was happening as I hid back in my room with the door tightly locked. Then I heard talking and the banging of doors again downstairs. They were back. I burst into tears to the dispatcher out of pure fear and sat on the phone for what felt like forever until my mom, brother, and police all pulled up at the same time. Everyone charged the house to the back door and we instantly saw what they'd done. The people saw the keys to the back door on the side of the kitchen, took a broom from outside, broke it in half on the door handle, got the broom through the cat flap, knocked the keys off the side and pulled them through the cat flap. Although out of pure luck, as they broke the broom in half, they also managed to snap off the door handle, making it impossible for it to be opened from the outside. Otherwise, they would have gotten in no questions asked and I would have been sat quietly in my room completely oblivious. It was clear afterward that they had been watching the house for a while, waiting until the exact moment that they saw my mom's car pull out of the drive. I'm not sure if they knew that I was there alone or not, but I know that after they initially saw me and ran away, they made the conscious choice to come back. I'll try to keep this as accurate as possible, but it's been shoved deep in my memory bank for years. Certain details are fuzzy, but here goes nothing. A little over a decade ago, I was working for the local cable slash internet company. I was fresh out of high school and it was my first real job. I should mention that sometime in my preteen years, 
I developed a habit of snooping through people's things. Whether it was at a family member's house or a friend's, I would always manage to slip away into people's rooms, closets, bathrooms, etc., and poke around, looking for secrets and hidden items. I would never steal anything, just take mental note of the things that I found and put them back without leaving a trace. So as you can imagine, landing a job that placed me in people's houses to install cable was almost guaranteed to stir up a desire to indulge in my long-forgotten habit. When installing wires for TVs and computers, I'd end up in crawl spaces, closets, behind desks, and sometimes under beds to reach outlets and such. I'd stumble upon things like adult film collections, embarrassing personal hygiene products, and a more than a few times extremely large collections of toys. After a while, it went from stumbling upon these things to outright looking for them. Most homeowners were too lazy to follow me from room to room, so they'd either be downstairs or outside in the yard while I went about doing my job. Like I said, I wasn't taking anything with me, just observing. About four to five months into me working this job, I ended up at a woman's house. She was in her late 20s or early 30s, I guess. White with sandy blonde hair and a sort of hippie slash bohemian vibe that was popular around my area mixed with a bit of emo. Weird combo, I know. She had a pretty big house for a single person. Three bedrooms, two baths, and multiple living areas. But it appeared that she was the only one living there other than her cat who would occasionally run by as I was doing my job. She let me know that she'd be outside on her porch and to let her know if I needed anything. The house was quiet and big, so I knew I'd be able to hear her coming and have plenty of time to clean up if I happened to do some snooping around. The perfect storm. All in all, it was pretty uneventful. I carried on with my work, but every so often I'd take a peek around at her things. She was pretty good looking, so I probably would have been excited to find something that would allude to her promiscuous side. But no such luck. Just papers, knickknacks, some stuff that appeared to be schoolwork, etc., but peeking out from her pillow was a notebook, similar to the old cow print ones we'd use in school. I knew for sure, given the placement, it had to be a diary of some sort. I looked around to make sure that she was still outside, and then I cracked it open. Boring. The first few pages were random notes, planning, grocery lists. Far from the scandalous journaling about escapades and one-night stands that I'd hoped for. Just as I was about to put it back, I turned the page and saw a few words that caught my eye. Something along the line of panic, anxious, safe. With concern slash excitement, I went on to read a detailed story written in first person about her hitting a man over the head, realizing he wasn't conscious, recruiting help cleaning up the mess, and dumping the body in a nearby river. She also journaled about the anxiety and paranoia she was feeling about everything that happened, and the stress of sharing the secret with the person who helped her dump the body. I remember being extremely uneasy and feeling more creeped out in that house every minute that passed by. The silence of the house that I previously found peaceful started to bother me. Even the jingling of the cat's collar was beginning to haunt me like something out of a horror movie. I was terrified that I'd be caught and she'd take me out to ensure that I wouldn't tell about what I read but I managed to power through the job and get the heck out of there. On the drive home, I managed to convince myself that I probably just stumbled on her notes or an excerpt from some fictional novel she was writing. It did read more like a novel than a personal diary passage, but honestly, there's no telling. I laughed it off with a few friends later on and never spoke much of it again. It's been so long, I can barely remember the woman's face, her house, or even the town. But for my sake, possible murderous hot hippie chick, let's not meet. I was in my first semester of university. I had just graduated college not too long ago and it entered into a program that, after a while, I would come to resent. During that time with adjusting, and taking daily transit an hour and a half away from where I grew up, into the big city in order to study was somewhat of a new adventure to me. In a lot of ways, I was just beginning to sprout as my own individual, and trying to carve a path for my life, 
while simultaneously opening myself up to new experiences and a new environment. I have longtime friends who go to the same facility as me, but at the time, our schedules wouldn't always line up. This meant that a lot of my days were spent traveling back and forth and walking around the city alone. I really wanted to try and expand my horizon of experiences and friends during this period. In a lot of ways, I was really desiring to find a good community on campus that could help satiate my boredom and loneliness. I can be extremely extroverted, but sometimes I find that it takes a lot out of me to try and actually pursue and maintain friendships that haven't been established years prior. I've made friends before from different classes in college, but ultimately, and I know this makes me a jerk, but I would end up texting less and less until eventually either side would end up ghosting one or the other. Because I'm a busy guy, I don't find myself prioritizing people who I feel like aren't as important to me as others. I know, it's a really crappy thing to say, but nonetheless, it's the truth. One day, however, I met Joel. I was on the phone with my fiance, and I distinctly remember exactly how it all went down. As I was walking out of the school's Starbucks with a decaf coffee, I had one headphone in and was heading to class through a small stretch of underground passageway under the street that connects the school's library building to the actual building that possesses classes. As I was hastily making my way, I saw this short and stout guy, looking roughly my age, which was at the time 21 years old, with a thick brown beard and a hat on. Our eyes met, and as I was about to simply walk past, he asked me something in a very charismatic and calm tone. Hey, sorry to bother you. You look like a pretty busy guy, but I was wondering, do you mind doing a survey about religion? It's for one of my classes. To this, I regret answering and wish I had simply continued walking. But at the time, I was becoming more and more compelled by the notion of formal religious institutions and questioning my own religious faith, particularly leaning towards Christianity. Sure, I replied cordially. He then introduced himself as Joel. And after we went through a small survey pertaining to religious affiliations and perspectives on religions, Joel informed me that a small group of students like himself were planning on getting together as a group and discussing various religions in order to gather new insights and to create a community. Of course, with the prospect of finding some new friends on campus and also exploring my own spiritual perspectives, I gave him my phone number after he asked for it, and he said that he would contact me in the next following days. Upon entering our first meeting, I sat down in a very crowded place with seats at our school facility and was greeted by Joel, alongside a bunch of other members. They introduced themselves to me and vice versa, and they were all extremely kind to me. We began our small group meeting, and I was a bit shocked to find out that the sole topic that we were to discuss was Christianity. I wasn't aware that we were only going to be discussing Christianity, which was against what he had proposed this group to constitute upon our meeting in the tunnel. That being said, I was still curious enough to continue, and I was accompanied by three other young guys of my age, who after a bit of talking with, I found out that we had a lot of similar interests. Joel, who now presented himself as a leader of our study group, relayed how we would be discussing and analyzing Christianity through a multi-step program designed to unveil the holy power associated with the religion to us. Since I was curious and wanted to learn more about the religion, as well as having made some newfound friends, I continued to attend this study group for the rest of the semester, in which there were a few circumstances where I questioned Joel's interpretations and was met with hard resistance. It felt like at times my wavering belief in what Joel was saying would be met with straight dismissal as opposed to actual conversation. I continued to brush that off as the group that I was working with got closer. The school's club, which I was now a part of, provided me with exactly what I had wanted. We even went to a church-run event together, where I quit vaping, and many individuals reported mystical experiences. Things only started to get concerning with Joel during our one-on-one -on -one conversations. I discussed my personal experiences and belief in my newfound religious beliefs, and all of my former spiritual experiences as well, and Joel exposed to me a story and a few incidents that, at the time, I definitely certainly should have taken his red flags. For example, when he was younger, he had gone on a retreat where, when he was in prayer, he said that he began to hear the voice of God talk to him. I questioned at first if he was referring to the voice of God as more so a metaphor, 
but he had reassured me that he literally heard God speak to him before. When he told me this, I became a bit unnerved. At the helm of this community was Joel, but in all other senses, I was satisfied with who I was with and what we were doing together. Though I'm not entirely dismissive of strange occurrences, especially pertaining to spirituality, his experience talking with God in his head came off as uncomfortable for me. He also said that the way that he would pray would involve a direct conversation and a reply from God. Out of discomfort, I wouldn't prod him on what he meant by this. This, of course, was just the beginning. After the summer had ended, I found myself in the most religiously devoted state I had ever been in. Throughout all the summer, I had had a treacherous injury which made me housebound for months and to call upon God in a lot of ways for strength. With my newfound devotion, I was elated to fall back into the community that I had nurtured and grown with throughout the last semester, relating to something that I found deep joy in. At the first lesson of the semester, something was very different. Joel, as before, was at the helm of our study session, but he was now perpetually interrupted by people coming to greet him and give him praise. It was so bad that we literally essentially sat and watched for 20 minutes before we could get on with our lesson as more than 10 people, mostly young men of our age, came to greet this man. As aforementioned, when not unnerving, he was extremely charming and gave the impression that he cared deeply for everyone. Once our lesson began, he introduced us to the second phase of the program. He explained that this was one of the toughest programs of the different levels that there were, as it required even more devotion and more importantly, an emphasis on sacrifice for those who engaged. He showed us a diagram of a small stick person, and he showed that in this program, we would have to accept Jesus at the center of our life. He explained that by making our lives surrounded by Jesus entirely, that we would not be losing something, but be gaining. He also began to go over the notion that intercourse before marriage is a sin, and that if we were to continue with this program, we would have to make the sacrifice of giving that up in our relationships and prove that we weren't. He said that many guys weren't able to continue because of this. I talked about this afterwards with one of the members of his group, who, not unlike me, had been in a serious relationship with someone that they loved for years. In my personal opinion, though we weren't married on the altar, I knew that both me and this other member felt devoted to our partners, as if we already were married in a sense, and we both expressed how Joel's behavior surrounding this was off-putting, controlling, and intrusive. After our lesson, I was a bit dumbfounded by the intensity with which he gave his speech about this new program that we would be engaging in this semester. Joel and I sat down for a few more minutes and talked in which I expressed experiences of devotion from the summer and explained my entire catastrophic experience with my injury. He then went on to tell me that at times, he was actually able to know things beforehand. This seemingly random and strange statement shocked me. He said, for example, he was able to know something another member had before they had even mentioned it, and it was the way that he described it. It sounded as if he was saying he had some form of mystical foresight, I was a bit jarred to say the least though. I felt like it would be impolite to question any further. Joel then went on to tell me that he believed that if I successfully completed this program, that I was primed to become a teacher for the first program I had done the semester prior, leading others who would join, and that I had a bright future in the organization. In that moment, with what he had laid down on us in that lesson, I felt overwhelmed by his expectations of me. It also became evident that Joel was not a student at our facility. In fact, he was in his mid-30s and had kids. He was actually just a part of an organization that recruits people to become Christians and missionaries that works on our campus. This means that he actually lied to me when I first met him. He wasn't a student. There was no group talking about various religions, and his whole purpose was to convert me to make me join the organization that he was a part of. At this point, school began to pick up a lot, and I was also working part-time to help support myself. As I was on the train to head back home the next week, I had forgotten that my second lesson of the program that semester was supposed to happen. So I texted Joel saying, Hey man, I actually got onto the train and forgot about our lesson. Sorry about that, dude. I'm not going to be able to make it. I also have work later. To which he replied, Can you get off the train? Try and get here as soon as possible. I was a bit dumbfounded at this question, 
Since I live an hour and a half away, it wasn't as easy as getting off the train and heading back the opposite direction, and he knew that. He knew the area I live in is remote and a long distance away. I also told him that I had work, which he had plainly disregarded. No, man. Unfortunately, I can't come. Have a good lesson, I replied, to which he said again, Come on, man. Just get off the train and come back. At this point, I was annoyed. Not only did I feel like he was commanding me, but that he was also blatantly disregarding the fact that I said no and that I had work that day. I didn't answer him. I talked with my fiance about how I was starting to feel about the whole idea ordeal and how I felt guilty about having feelings of wanting to distance myself from the group while simultaneously not wanting to lose the community and friends that I had established along the way. My fiance told me that by the way that Joel was acting and with regards to the things he had said, that she was starting to become uncomfortable with the whole situation. I remember sitting in bed thinking about leaving the group and how the prospect made me feel physically ill. After all, I had been given everything I wanted in a community, except that the helm was a seemingly increasingly controlling and persuasive being who was making me and possibly other members more miserable. There was an event the following Friday that was going to be at the church, which was organized by the community. Originally, since many of the folks from this group were going, I intended to go. But alas, I was scheduled by my boss to work that day, so there was no way that I was going to be able to attend. I knew that Joel would be insistent upon me coming anyways, so when Joel texted me reminding me that the event was Friday, I told him that I wasn't able to go because I had work. To this, he replied and simply said, What? Bro, no way. You've got to come. Take work off and find somebody to take your shift. God wants you there. I was expected. He dismissed my decision and also said that I had to be there because God wanted me there, as if he was his mouthpiece. I went on to text him again and inform him. No, sorry, man, I can't do that. I just got a promotion and I have to be there. I hope you guys have a great time anyways. To which he then again replied similarly to what he had before. This was my personal breaking point. He knew the importance of my financial situation and his dismissal of my personal boundaries as well as his commanding made me decide to text him explaining that I was done with the group and that I wanted to pursue my own religious exploration without the group from then on. I felt as if he was slowly but surely increasingly controlling me and trying to take what he could, commanding me as if he were the leader of my life in any way possible. It was even up to him if I was allowed to have relations with my fiancé. He replied with a long paragraph persisting in this sort of overly kind manner that I had to continue with the group and that it was God's will for me to show up to this event, even though I was completely unable. He was certain that this group was meant for me and that God had told him that this was where I was supposed to be. He replied with a long paragraph persisting in this sort of overly kind manner that I had to continue with the group and that it was God's will for me to show up to this event, even though I was completely unable to. He was certain that this group was meant for me and that God had told him that this was where I was supposed to be. After I responded again telling him to stop and that I would not, he sent me another paragraph of similar length repeating what he would say. No matter what I would say and whenever I would say no, he would overstep my boundaries while maintaining a kind and friendly tone in order to try and push me into submission when I had clearly said no. At this point, I said I did not want to talk to him anymore, to which he replied, bro, why? Can we meet up? I want you to explain why you don't want to continue, bro, so we can meet up and do that, and I can get a better sense and we can figure out what we do from there. Even in this, I knew that he was trying to elongate his chance at bringing me back and continuing his reign of control. I said I didn't want to, so he asked again. I decided at that moment that I needed to block him, so I did. A semester later, I was walking down the street of my school, and as I walked by a pizza parlor, lo and behold, who came out? Joel walked over to me with one of his friends and said that I was one of his friends to his buddy. I uncomfortably stood there, and his friend went inside for a moment while Joel turned around to look at me and asked with a disarming gentleness, Did you block me? I replied, Yes. He then said, You should unblock me so that we can meet up and talk because I really want to know why you left the group. To which I evidently was frustrated, said okay, and just went on my way. 
That night, he messaged me on Instagram, insisting that we meet up again, so I blocked him there too. In short, I'm thankful for my fiancé, who is the love of my life. Without her, I'm not sure I would have been strong enough to have left the group and his control. The fact of the matter is that there were other guys in that group who had absolutely nobody. They had nothing, and they were prime targets for a charismatic and controlling freak. There were members of that group who were in higher levels, so to speak, who had done all the programs, who seemed as if they were emaciated, but they had become such restricted fundamentalists that their lives and their openness to new experiences were significantly thwarted. Beware of who you let into your life. And just because somebody is nice to you does not mean that they might not have ulterior motives. Also, learn to stand your ground and respect yourself. If you say no, mean it. I was tree planting near Smithers, British Columbia, about an hour and a half into the mountains on old dirt roads. I tried my best to just forget this incident even occurred, as I simply could not find a way to rationalize what happened. I don't care who believes me or not, by the way, but what happened is this. It was almost midnight and I was trying to sleep in my tent. My tent was near a bunch of standing dead trees that would creak when the wind picked up. A very loud and distinct sound. Now on this particular night, it was dead silent and still. I started to hear sticks cracking and steps being taken that slowly got closer over the course of about 15 minutes. I was loud enough that I was certain that there was a bear approaching my tent. It got so close that it had to be no further than 15 feet away from me. Cracking sticks and padding around the forest floor. I decided to yell out very loudly. Silence. I was answered with nothing but deafening silence. No sound of the creature fleeing or doing anything at all. I sat in silence, too scared to move, trying to rationalize to no conclusion. About 20 minutes of dead silence later, I heard the eeriest, unnatural, and unexplainable noise. It was the exact same timber and volume, and just basically the same sound as the trees outside creaking. But instead of being a regular creak, it began, and then held the exact same note of creak for a full five seconds or even longer. It was like an unnatural drone that was obviously not a tree creaking. There was not a hint of wind or any other trees creaking as per usual. I got barely any sleep, and the next day was tough, and I just had to forget about it. I didn't ever make the connection that skinwalkers are known to imitate sounds like that until a few weeks ago. This happened in July of 2022. If anyone has had a similar experience, or has any ideas of what this could have been, I'd love to hear. So me and my boyfriend were in my fourth floor apartment last night around 1 a.m. I don't live out in the wilderness, but my apartment is in the corner of the building where one side faces toward a green belt directly outside and one side faces towards a fairly busy street near my university. I was asleep and my boyfriend was next to me playing on my PC when he woke me up and said that he thought a cat had been hit by a car outside and was going to go check it out. I was half asleep and didn't really process what he said until about a minute after he left. So I called him and asked what made him think that there was a cat out there. He told me that he could hear it and to go out on my balcony and I would be able to hear it too. I got up and walked into my living room and already I heard awful screaming outside nearby the woods without even having to step outside. It was like nothing I had ever heard before. I frequently hear coyotes howling slash yipping, but this was nothing at all like that. Granted, I have never heard a dying animal before, but it didn't sound like a cat or anything familiar. I felt very uneasy and called my boyfriend and told him to come back. At this point, he had reached the area where the suspected animal likely was, in a small and shallow drainage ditch at the edge of the woods that goes under the street. He told me when he got back that he had leaned over the railing by the sidewalk, and suddenly, the screaming, coming from directly below, stopped and turned into some sort of loud purring sound. 
He also said that when he reached the spot, it was as if the sound changed location. However, it was too dark to see, and he was getting a bit spooked and uneasy himself and left. The whole experience had us both very unnerved. Was this likely an animal that was hit by a car? This took place last year, at the beginning of summer. I was with my mom, headed down to my Nana's farm to visit for a weekend. For some context, she lives on a farm way back in the country, right at the foot of a mountain in rural South Carolina. It's a very rural, secluded area, so the roads are badly maintained and barely wide enough for two cars to pass one another. The houses are also spread out, and set far back into the tree line from the road, so there's very little ambient light besides the headlights of a car. So, my mom and I are driving along, her in the driver's seat and me in the passenger. It was around 11 p.m., and we are about 15 minutes from Nana's house, deep in the woods with the radio down to almost silent. We come onto this straight stretch of road in a heavily wooded area, and suddenly this blur of a creature darts out across the road, right at the edge of our headlights. It was moving pretty good, but both me and my mom were able to get a good look at it, and we both agree on what we saw. It was a fairly large creature, roughly the size of a person, maybe bigger. Neither of us could make out the head, but we both remember it appearing to have a segmented body, my mom's words, as if it were emaciated and its rib cage was poking out. The reflection of light made it hard for me to tell color, but it moved across the road. It didn't run the way a dog or horse would, with all four legs. The best word to describe it would be loping using its front limbs to pull itself along, and it was moving considerably fast. We both said something along the lines of, what the hell is that, as it crossed in front of us. As we got up to where it had crossed, I turned to look at it just as it reached the other side of the road and out of our headlights, and I swear on my life, it stood up and ran, not like a dog rearing on its hind legs. It was definitely bipedal. I immediately yelled that it had stood up, and we both started getting nervous. I honestly would have thought that I was going insane had I not had another person in the car with me. My mom has always been a pretty level-headed person and not superstitious, but she was very nervous and made me agree to not tell my Nana about it to avoid scaring her, which made me recognize how serious this was. I should also mention that there had apparently been a series of attacks on livestock slash horses in the area around the time that this happened. People were saying they found wire fences ripped through and their animals attacked. I don't think any died, but if I remember correctly, there were a few horses that were severely wounded. There have been a few other strange instances in the area, but that was my personal experience. This happened when I was 15, near Algonquin Park. My father and I were driving up to our cottage in the middle of winter. I was always so amazed at the beauty of Algonquin Park and Muskoka, and had grown up enjoying the beauty of it every summer. Our cottage was on a large lake, about a 30 minute drive from the nearest town. There were probably thousands of cottages on the lake. During the summer, the lake and the town's population tripled. It was cottage country so people would spend all summer enjoying the lake and warm nights around campfires with family and friends. I spent every summer there growing up, and it still brings fond memories of sunshine and laughter and the sounds of motorboats on the lake. But the winters were different. The people that didn't live there all year would venture back home to the city life, leaving the area mostly deserted, with cottages boarded up for the winter. There were a few people that still frequently would come up every couple of months for a few days or so but the most part, the lake was silent during the winters, and the town was just filled with locals. The beautiful pine trees were always all covered with snow, making the forest quiet. Our cottage was on a dead-end road. There were about 20 other cottages on the road, with ours being somewhat in the middle. The cottages were quite spaced out, however, with our closest neighbors being too far away to see through the trees. My dad had needed to head up to the cottage to do some painting that my mom had been bugging him to do. It was at the end of February, 
and it was a long weekend, so I tagged along so we wouldn't be alone and we could spend some quality time together. It was about a five-hour drive from our home, but turned out to be an eight-hour drive due to the heavy snow. It had gotten dark out quite early, and it was around midnight as we drove through Algonquin Park. It was deadly quiet and pitch black, except for the headlights of the car. We finally passed through the park with only about 30 minutes left to get to the cottage. It had stopped snowing, and we were both eager to get there. As we turned onto the familiar road, I remember my dad cursing. It hadn't been plowed yet. This wasn't surprising, however. It probably wouldn't be until later the next day that we would even see a snow plow. As we drove down the road, I noticed there was a fresh set of tire tracks. The Smiths must be up for the weekend, my dad had said. All of a sudden, as we drove around the bend, following the tire tracks, the headlights of the car shone on a white van that was parked on the side of the road. It was almost hidden by the vast trees that were covered with snow. What the? My dad mumbled. As we drove past the white van, I remember looking back through the back window and very clearly seeing two figures in the front seat, illuminated by our retreating taillights. I told my dad this and he shrugged. Maybe they're lost. I nodded but couldn't help to think about how it was a dead-end road and why they would feel the need to park there. As we pulled into our driveway and we started bringing our stuff in, I couldn't shake the feeling that something wasn't right. I couldn't stop thinking about that van and why it was there, with two people just sitting in the dark in the middle of the night. It spooked me so much that I begged my dad to let me sleep upstairs with him, instead of sleeping downstairs in my room that my sister and I usually shared. It had big windows with no blinds that looked out into the blackness of the forest, and my 15-year-old self was already scared of the dark, even without seeing the white van. It wasn't a big deal when my older sister was there, but not tonight. As my dad got ready for bed, I sat in the living room reading a book. My dad had turned all the lights off, and I was just using a small lamp next to the couch to try and get through one last chapter before bed. It was so quiet I could almost hear my ears ringing. I also started to get the feeling that I was being watched. The living room had large windows, also with no curtains, that overlooked the lake. And it was black except for a light or two from the cottages across the lake. I shut off the lamp and got up. Now that the cottage was dark, the moon was shining brightly, illuminating the snow. It was beautiful, and I walked towards the window to get a better look. Movement caught my eye, and I remember my heart dropping as I saw two figures down by the back porch, below the window, barely hidden by the surrounding trees. I dropped to the floor and crawled towards the bedroom where my dad was sleeping, my heart in my throat. I wasn't sure if they had seen me or not. I woke up my dad and by the time he got to the window, the two figures were gone. Where I had seen the figures, two sets of footprints in the snow led back around to the front of the cottage and back down the driveway. I begged my dad not to go outside. He double-checked the locks and turned on the porch lights, hopefully to scare anyone off. My dad wasn't as freaked out as I was, but he still set the alarm before he headed back to bed. I remember being very freaked out, and I lay there all night next to my dad, terrified that I'd look out the window and see someone staring back at me. The next morning, my dad went outside and confirmed that there were two sets of footprints leading from the road to behind our cottage, and then back around to the front of the cottage and back up to the road. There were tire marks that showed the vehicle had turned around and then gone back up to the main road. My dad guessed that they were probably looking to break in and steal stuff, as it was the middle of winter and not too many people were up at the lake, but they knew we were there. They would have seen our tire tracks leading up to our cottage, and my dad's car parked out front. They also may have seen the lamp that I had turned on to read, and or seeing it go off. My dad didn't have an answer to that, and after much back and forth, he called the non-emergency line and reported it. Apparently, there had been some break-ins in the area, and some stuff had been stolen from some cottages that were boarded up for winter. But again, and I still wonder to this day, why would they be interested in stealing from a house that clearly had people inside it. My story takes place two years ago, sometime between the first two lockdowns in France. 
I was home alone in my small apartment, working on something for my internship that I was really stressed about. It was the beginning of the afternoon, around 2 p.m. Someone knocked on my door, but I wasn't expecting anyone. I went to open up, and it was a guy that I knew. Let's call him Jim. Jim and I had slept together a few times a few weeks before, until he pushed me away without explanation. We were still friends, but I was a little hurt. Was I that bad? Had he gotten what he wanted and wasn't interested anymore? I didn't dare ask the question because I was getting a little attached, and I preferred to wait for it to pass, especially since we were bound to run into each other again. Indeed, Jim had recently gotten a room in the flat of a friend of mine. The situation was quite funny because he had stumbled upon the ad without knowing that I knew the other tenants, and my friend didn't know yet that I knew the new roommate. I was going to tell her about it in person when we met again in college for our midterms. So, I knew I was going to see Jim again, but I didn't expect to run into him so soon after he moved in, let alone during a surprise visit from him to my apartment. I asked him what he was doing there. He said he was bored at the dorm and was just passing through. I invited him in. I was a bit uncomfortable because I still liked him, and he had left without any explanation about his rejection before he moved in with my friend. We talked for a while about trivial things, but strangely enough, I still remember the main points. Then he wanted to show me a new kind of massage against my stress that he had seen on TikTok. I hesitated a bit as I was still uncomfortable. Do you trust me? He asked. Yes, I replied. I sat on the floor and he touched my back for a while. Then, ditto once I was lying down. I don't remember everything except that at one point his arm was around my neck and I thought, I'm not sure I can breathe. And then I blacked out. Of course, the memory of choking didn't come back right away. It took several months. But I'm trying to tell you the story in chronological order. When I came to, it was dark. I was still on the ground bleeding. I don't remember if I noticed the injury right away, but I had a large hole in my right side with many cuts underneath. The events are pretty fuzzy in my memory, but I wondered where Jim had gone and why I was alone. I went to look in the hallway, but my keys, which are normally always in the lock, were missing. I found the spare and looked outside. No one was there. Then I had my first stupid reflex. I thought, I'm hurt. I need to disinfect and started to take a shower. I think I fell asleep and had nightmares of being tortured and kidnapped in the shower, probably a way for my brain to try to warn me that something bad was happening. I then looked for my phone, which was also missing from my apartment. I was confused, probably drugged, I realized later. I decided to go to bed to resume the search after resting. I told myself, if I'm still hurt when I wake up, it must be real. It seemed very logical in my mind at that moment. When I woke up, my mind was already a little clearer, but I was still not totally myself. It was 8 or 9 p.m., I think. I was still bleeding. I looked for my phone again and I started to panic as I couldn't find it. I tried to calm down and told myself that it was probably there somewhere. I just had to ask someone to call me. I contacted my best friend, let's call him Tom, via messenger through my computer. I still had a hard time unlocking my computer. I couldn't type my code. I think the drug was still taking its effect. Luckily, Tom was online. He tried to call me on my phone, but no ringing could be heard in the apartment. I think he figured out that I wasn't in my right mind because he called me on messenger to see if I was okay. It was he who gave me the details of our conversation. I have almost no memory of it. I said, if you think you've been hurt, do you call the fire department or the police first? He freaked out and asked me to explain what was going on. I was very confused, but I think he got the gist of it. He asked, Did Jim do this to you? I don't know, maybe. I was still in denial at that point. Tom called the police for me. He couldn't come to help me himself because he was studying in another city. As I waited for the cops to arrive, I began to realize that I had completely messed up the crime scene by touching everything, looking for my phone. Not to mention the shower and the nap which could have killed me in retrospect. I was still in no pain, though. The hole in my side started to hurt when I was taken care of by the paramedics that the cops called when they saw the extent of my injuries. I had to undergo surgery as a result of this assault, which took me months to accept as an attempted murder with a knife. I had a hole in my liver, a pneumothorax, and was bleeding a lot. 
Luckily, my other organs were not affected. While I was in the hospital, the cops came to take my statement and took Jim into custody. Imagine the surprise of my friend and her roommates when they found out that the new roommate not only knew me, but was also accused of assaulting and robbing me. One week after the assault, when I got out of the hospital, the first bad news was that the cops were not able to retrieve the recordings from the surveillance cameras in my building, which had already been erased because the procedures had been too long. The next day, the policewoman in charge of the investigation told me that, of course, Jim denied having been at my place that day, and nobody was at his flat to confirm if he was indeed at home all day. That's it for now. Go home to your parents and get some therapy. Great. Big up to my psychologist who was an incredible person and helped me a lot. And then I waited. For a long time. I had to have the seals from my building analyzed for Jim's DNA. Without video or witnesses, it was the only way to prove that he was my attacker. Or at least that he was in my apartment that day. It took a year and a half to get the prosecutor's verdict. No further action. No identifiable DNA other than mine had been found at the crime scene. I probably destroyed everything with a shower. So there you have it. We can't pursue the investigation. I could never prove it was Jim. I don't have any memory of the assault itself. I don't think I'll ever find them. But I have no doubt that Jim did this to me. I think if I ran into him today, I would freeze like a rabbit in front of a car. Today I am much better, but I still suffer from PTSD. For a while, I couldn't drink alcohol because the drunken feeling reminded me of when I was going to be unconscious. Now I only panic when I'm with someone and have trouble breathing. I can't pull the blanket over my face if I'm in bed with my boyfriend, for example. And most of all, it makes me sick to know that Jim is free to live his life and to hurt someone else. Thanks to those who take time to read my story, this will be my only Reddit post. I just needed to share it somewhere. So this happened to me two years ago when I was 18. I need to set up the scenery of my house so that the location makes sense. I live in an upper middle class neighborhood that resides in the middle of a golf course. The course wraps around and intertwines with the neighborhood. I live in one of the most remote locations of this neighborhood where we have no access to a main roadway. Furthermore, our house is a two story on about one acre. On the first floor is a kitchen, bedroom, office, and living room with a couple of bathrooms. The second floor is just a couple of bedrooms, along with bathrooms and a room that we use for social gatherings. Along the back of the house, we also have a deck with metal and wicker furniture. Now that the setting is out of the way, it was on a rare Sunday that I had gotten off of work, and I wanted the day to relax and not go anywhere or do anything. My parents knew that I never really got days off, let alone a weekend day off so they were okay with letting me stay home when they went out of town for the day. They decided that day they were going out of town to shop at a nearby mall and wouldn't be home until late. Honestly, I don't remember where my brother was. But anyways, it was a pretty normal day by myself. A lot of nothingness was accomplished until it got dark. I decided to come out of my room and watch TV in the living room since my new dog wasn't accustomed to stairs yet and would hardly walk up them. So sitting on the couch, I noticed my pup growling and the hair on the back of her neck standing up. For clarification, at this point it's around 11 p.m. and I cannot see outside at all. I try to calm my dog down, but she's getting really hyper. I'm getting anxious now too because something is really upsetting her. So I walk upstairs and pick up my BB gun that I have in my room. I figure if someone is out there, I just have to stand inside with it and hope that they think it's real. Well... After coming down with the BB gun, I take a step over the baby gate that we have to keep our pup from peeing on the carpet, and I hear a tapping. Someone or something is tapping on the glass window next to where I was sitting, and my dog had hid behind my legs. I lifted the BB gun up, acting like I was going to shoot, when I saw through the window a figure jump over and off the deck railing. I quickly called my parents. Yeah, I know, I should have called the police, but I wasn't thinking. Well, around midnight they got home and turned on the deck lights. We instantly noticed that one of our metal chairs were pulled very far out of place and positioned to look inside the house where I was sitting before. 
We never did call the police about that incident. But when I was coming home from work about a week later, I pulled into the driveway around 10 p.m. where my headlights lit up a person hiding beside a tree. This was a full-grown adult wearing a long black coat in the middle of June. We did eventually call the police about that, and I have an inkling that it was probably the same guy. So my husband Ted is in the military. We've generally lived on base at every station that we've been to because the surrounding towns can be crime ridden and sketchy. And with my husband gone most of the time, the extra security is appreciated. I work from home due to us moving so often. So one afternoon I was taking a break, had made a bite to eat and was snuggling up on the couch with my dog. That's when I heard the sliding glass door open. It was so nonchalant that I thought it was Ted. I saw my cat run from the kitchen and a shadow standing near the door entering it. I thought maybe he had come back for something, so I called out for him and was like, what are you doing home? Did you forget something? No answer. This is where I just got an eerie feeling. After I asked what he was doing here, I saw the shadow move and heard the click of the sliding door lock. From there, he walked to the laundry room and shut the door. I still have had received no response. So I'm sitting on the couch, scared out of my mind, and I call my husband hoping to hear his phone in the laundry room. I don't hear a ring, but he answers. I asked him why he came home, and he didn't answer me. And all he says was, that wasn't me. Grab the dog and get in your car. I freak out. After getting off the phone with Ted, I grab the dog and run to my car. From there, I call the military police. Waiting for them was probably the longest 20 minutes of my life. When they got there, they cleared the house and found no one. They asked me to make a statement, and even they were baffled that someone would try this on a base. We still live here, and I am so scared that he will come back. After reading two stories about hero dogs, it reminded me of one of my encounters that my own dog saved me from. This happened in the early 2000s, and I was around 12 years old. My dad had passed away about two years before, leaving my mom, sister, and myself. To help me cope with my father's passing, my mom took me to the animal shelter to pick out a dog, since having a large dog was something that I always wanted. In one of the cages was a small shepherd husky huddled in the corner that I right away fell in love with. When this incident happened, he was about one year old, 90 pounds, and my best friend. My mom worked nights, and my older sister, taking advantage that my mom wasn't home, would constantly leave me alone. I didn't mind, though, because then she couldn't boss me around, since when she was home, she would try to be mom, telling me what to do and when to go to bed. We lived in a small, middle-class suburb with a low crime rate, that I wasn't scared to be home alone. I was sitting in the living room, playing video games, and I got up to head to the kitchen to grab a drink. In the kitchen, I had a clear view through the back door and could see the garage open. Thinking that I just left it open after putting my bike away, I headed out the door to close it. My dog was sleeping in the basement since he liked to lay on the cool floor during the summer months, and I didn't think to take him with me. I step out the door and make it about five feet from it when I notice in the darkness a crouched shadow moving in the garage. I froze, trying to get my eyes to adjust to make out what the shadow was. It finally hit me when I saw the figure stand up and turn towards me. I was terrified and felt like I had been glued to the spot. I knew that this person could see me since the back porch light was shining above me. At that moment, the figure started running towards me. I was too scared to move and let out more of a yelp than a scream. But that that was all it took for my dog to hear, and the next thing I hear is him behind me snarling and growling. I could make out that it was a man, but no features. When he now froze, seeing this 90-pound beast behind me, he turned and ran for the back fence with my dog right behind him. The guy made it to the fence, and since it was only about four feet high, he hopped right before my dog got to him. After he got away, my dog came running back to me, and we went inside where I barricaded the doors. 
I don't know why, but I didn't call the cops and never told my mom or sister what happened. One thing that bothered me was that he had to have known that I was inside since the lights were on and the blinds were open. So why take the risk to hit a house when someone was clearly home? The next morning after my mom was home, I went outside to finally close the garage and noticed that what he had been going through was my dad's toolbox. I locked up the garage and never told anyone about what happened. I walked my dog to McDonald's and got him a burger and ice cream cone for being my hero. Two thousand six, Pinnacle Lake Trail, Washington. I was camping with my wife and son, and we decided to go for a hike. We walked probably less than a mile and came across a small trail leading to a kind of small, boggy pond in the rainforest. It was a misty day with light rain. The pond was darkened by tall trees hanging with moss. We were going to venture in there as it was pretty, but somewhat creepy. We probably spent two minutes navigating our way over and under some downed trees when my wife says, we need to leave now. I asked what was up and she just felt really uneasy, like something bad was present there. I said, hon, if you feel that uneasy, then let's go. Her intuition has served her and us well in the past, so I was trusting her instinct. It didn't hurt to simply leave. We made our way back to camp and drove home the next morning. When we arrived home, we saw the local news story of two women killed just two miles up the trail. The day after, we were hiking there. Could my wife have sensed a killer? Or simply some other thing? If we had stayed, could we have died? The case is still unsolved. My grandpa was born in the last years of the 19th century and spent his entire life living in rural Idaho as a farmer and rancher. He had tons of old cowboy stories that he would tell us grandkids. Most of them were funny, some were cautionary, but a few were downright creepy. When my grandpa was six years old, he, along with his older brother and a gang of kids from nearby farms, decided to go ice skating for the day. At the time, my great-grandpa was working as a ranch hand, and the family lived near Chesterfield, Idaho, now mostly a ghost town. It was a bright and sunny January day in 1902, and though the temperature was low, the sun kept things somewhat warm. They had hitched sleighs to their horses and headed down to the Portneuf River to ice skate. There were eight kids altogether, and they were excited to show off their new skates from Christmas. Along with my grandpa and his brother, there were the three Robinson kids, Tommy Bayer and the Gooch twins. The best spot to skate was next door to the Gooch's ranch. The river there was broad and shallow, so the ice tended to be thicker, and if they did fall through, they would just get their legs wet. The kids spent a couple of hours skating when a loud scream came from a willow bush on the river bank opposite them. The kids could only watch as a giant man, covered head to toe in thick black fur, came lumbering out of the bushes. It was carrying a large tree branch and was screaming in rage at the kids. They fled towards the sleighs, trying to scramble up the riverbank in their skates. My grandpa being the youngest was at the back of the rush. He couldn't get a good foothold because of the skates and fell back towards the ice. The giant was now crossing the river towards them, screaming and swinging his branch. My grandpa was sure that this creature was going to eat him. As my grandpa tells it, Lady Luck smiled down on me that day by the river. Because as the giant was midway across the river, the ice gave way. It only submerged his shins, but was slowed down considerably as it tried to get back on top of the ice. This gave my grandpa's brother enough time to jump down and cut the laces off of my grandpa's skates. They left the skates and dashed up the riverbank and jumped onto the sleigh. As they looked back, the giant man was cresting the riverbank. To their relief, it didn't chase the sleighs. It just stood there hollering at the kids and swinging his tree branch. The kids were able to make it back to the Gooch Ranch, where they told their encounter to John Gooch, 
the twins' grandfather. Word spread quickly in the tiny farming community, and soon a posse was formed to hunt down the beast. Where the kids had been skating, there was found footprints almost two feet in length. My grandpa's skates were found near the tracks. They had both been bent in half like horseshoes. The tracks headed west into the nearby mountains. The posse followed them as far as they could, but deep snow prevented their travel any further. The creature was never sighted in that area again. This story captivated the small community, and soon word traveled across the country of the Idaho Wild Man. There's actually a newspaper article describing the event. That spring, my great-grandpa decided to buy a ranch in the Little Lost River Valley, farther north in Idaho. My grandpa had many other weird and creepy backwoods stories, but he always said that this encounter frightened him the most. He was sure that he would have been killed if the giant hadn't broken through the ice and given his brother a chance to cut his laces. All right, I spent my entire slow day at work yesterday reading through this sub, so now I want to share my own little story. My childhood best friend, Mary, and I were around 11 or 12 years old at the time. Mary's family had their own campsite in a provincial park about two hours from our own hometown and would spend the entire summer each year living in their camper out there. This particular summer, I was able to go and stay with them for a week, and we were excited to spend our time adventuring around the forest. On the last night that I was there, we decided we wanted to hurry down to the ice cream shop by the lake before it closed. It was early evening at this point, still pretty bright out, but beginning to lose light. The path we took was down a short slope right next to the main road with maybe 10 feet of thick brush and trees in between. On the other side was the forest with more tall, thick brush. So we were walking along, not seeing a single other person on the path in front or behind us. We hear a sudden rustling and snapping of branches, similar to the sound of maybe a deer running through the woods. I wouldn't have thought anything of it, but then the sound of running footsteps follows. Mary glances back and suddenly grabs my arm, urging me under her breath not to look back. At the same time, the running stops. I don't know why I didn't ignore her and get a look myself. I guess I could sense the very real fear in her voice and chose to listen. We both start to panic, getting that feeling like when you're running up the stairs after turning the basement light off. We pick up speed as much as we can without breaking into a sprint, knowing the ice cream shop is only about a minute walk away at this point. The path soon breaks and we are in the parking lot. Suddenly, Mary steers me hard to the left, heading towards the lake and the boat rental instead of continuing straight to the ice cream shop, and I go along with it silently. Understanding ice cream is no longer an interest right now. Mary is clearly panicking at this point. We are both looking around but it seems whatever scared her is nowhere in sight at this point. Mary walks up to the boat rental and gets us a kayak, and we climb in and begin to paddle out to the middle of the lake. As we paddle, she tells me that there was a man behind us, and that the man had stopped running at us very abruptly upon making eye contact with her. He had been wearing a long black coat with the hood up despite it being the middle of July, had a terrible smirk on his face, and she swore that as he stopped running, she saw him put something shiny away into his coat. He appeared to have just emerged out of the bushes after we walked past, given the sounds we heard right before he came running onto the path. We reached the center of the lake and stopped paddling. I pull out my Nokia brick phone that my parents had, thank God given me just in case. I hand it to Mary to tell her to call her parents to come pick us up. As the phone rings, I see her look out past me to the shore and go pale, lifting a hand to point to what she's seeing. I turn, and there was a man, stalking his way around the path that circled the edge of the lake, staring out at us. We sat in the middle of the lake and watched him do two full laps, never looking away from us, before finally disappearing. It took a few tries to get a hold of her family. We were freaking out so bad the whole time, as the sun got lower and lower. We did manage to have someone come with the truck, but by the time we reached the shore, it was pretty dark outside. I don't know what we would have done if we hadn't been able to call for a ride. Looking back, I don't know why we didn't just go up to the ice cream shop 
and form an adult there and ask her parents to come get us then. But it worked out. We got back safe. And we thankfully never saw that man again. Back in 2013, I had just started on an education, and after the first school period, I had to go out and find an internship to be able to progress. But at the time, it proved to be almost impossible to get one. So while I was looking, I decided to take another job just to make sure that we could have food on the table. After searching for a while, I found out that a friend of my fiance's family had his own handicapped bus company, a kind of taxi service for wheelchair users or otherwise disabled people and he needed someone to cover the night shift, since it was a bus that would be on call at least 22 hours a day. Seeing that I'm quite the night owl, I immediately told him that I'd be happy to take the job, and after I got the needed license, I was hired. The job was pretty basic. Pick up people and drop them off where they needed to go, and sometimes use a machine to get wheelchairs up or down some stairs. And when there were no trips, I drove to a designated area and did whatever I wanted while waiting. I quickly found a truck stop in the area where I could park and catch some Z's while waiting. There was a gas station where I could buy coffee in the early hours of the shift, and on the other side of the gas station's parking lot on the opposite side of the truck stop, there was a rundown restaurant with a motel connected to it. So as to not disturb the sleeping truckers, if I got a trip in the middle of the night, I usually parked on the restaurant side. After parking there every night for a while, I noticed one particular room had a lot of people come and go. In the beginning, I thought nothing of it, but then one night in the end of the summer while I was half asleep with the window slightly open, I suddenly heard yelling coming from the motel, and a dude came tumbling out of the room and started running, and a few seconds later a big dude came running after him, with something in his hand that I could not make out what it was. I thought that it was none of my business and went back to my half-sleeping waiting stage. Not much time passed and my phone went off. I had a trip about an hour's drive away. So I turned on the bus and was leaving the parking lot when I saw the big guy coming around the corner. The rest of the night, I had back-to-back trips, so I didn't park until I got home. The day after, I didn't get a return to home zone until 2 or 3 a.m. When I arrived at the parking lot, the area where I used to park had fist-sized rocks strewn all over the place. Not connecting the dots at the time, I just parked a few spots over and started waiting. I fell asleep pretty fast but was jerked back into reality when a car right in front of my bus honked its horn, flashed the high beams, and revved its engine. I thought it was just some idiot who noticed me sleeping and found it funny to try to wake me up and scare me. So I jumped out of the bus about to tell him off, but instead of driving off or stopping, the driver made the start brake thing with the car, indicating that I was the one who should leave. And then I connected the dots. Not wanting to seem like a pushover, I stood still and stared at the car. Not that I could actually see anything with the high beams almost blinding me, and after what seemed like a really long time, but must not have been more than 30 seconds the car drove off. After that, I decided to park near the trucks from then on. A month or so passed and nothing had happened since the car episode, and I figured that nothing more would if I just kept parking by the trucks. Then one night, I had a long 12-hour shift on a Sunday, 6 p.m. to 6 a.m., and I didn't have time to eat dinner before work that day, and during the first half of my shift, I had back-to-back trips with no time to eat. So when I finally got to return to home zone, I quickly parked in the far end of the almost empty truck stop and got ready to eat my now very late dinner that my fiancé packed for me. I wanted to watch some TV on my phone while eating, so I sat with my back against the driver's side door and got comfy. While turning my back to the door, I had accidentally hit the door lock with my elbow. But that was my luck. As I was sitting there scrolling Netflix on my phone, I suddenly felt the bus rock and heard the clack of the door handle behind me smack back in position. I quickly turned and saw a dude with a hood over his head quickly crouching and proceeding to lay down on the ground and crawling under the bus with a big kitchen knife in his right hand. I quickly got up and made sure the other two doors were locked, and then I looked in all directions to see if I could spot him. He was still under the bus, and I was sure not jumping out this time since the knife made his intentions pretty clear. I turned on the engine, turned on the spots on the back of the bus, 
and looked around to see if I had scared him off. And lucky for me, it did. I saw him run off and into a brushy slash woody area at the end of the truck stop. I never parked at that truck stop again after that night. And I made sure that all of my doors were locked every time I was parked. This happened just over two years ago, at the end of my first year of university. I'm female, and at the time I was 21. My university is in a very large city, and I was living in university accommodation, a short walk away from the main campus. My flatmates had all finished their exams and gone home for the summer, so I was alone in my flat. I was pretty stressed because I was in the middle of my first round of university exams. I decided that it wouldn't be prudent to waste my precious study time cooking, so I ordered a pizza from a large pizza chain. It was about 8.30 in the evening when my pizza arrived, so it was on the verge of getting dark. My block of flats had a key card entry system, so the pizza delivery guy couldn't come right to my door. I saw his car pull up outside. As I mentioned, this is a big chain, so their cars are really easily recognizable, and I went downstairs to get my pizza. The delivery guy stepped out of his car as I walked over. He was tall, stocky, and looked to be in his late 20s or early 30s. He handed me the pizza box, and I said thanks and made my walk away. The delivery guy, however, had other ideas. You're very pretty, he said. I wasn't sure how to respond, so I said thanks again. Then, and almost disconcertingly, he asked, Are you home alone? This set up my creep alarm right away. So I told him I wasn't. However, my order was clearly meant for one person, and I was in a largely deserted block of flats at the very end of the school year, so he could have deduced pretty easily that I was lying. I was thoroughly creeped out by this point, so I turned around to walk back to the door of my flat block. As I walked away, he wolf whistled and called after me. Wow, nice butt. As I walked up the steps, he continued to whistle and whoop and generally be as inappropriate as possible. Needless to say, I closed and locked the door of the block of my flats, and then the door of my flat, and then the door of my room. Had this happened more recently, I would have called the pizza place right away to report the incident, and I wouldn't have eaten the pizza either. At the time, though, I wasn't in my best state of mind, so I ate my pizza and put the whole incident to the back of my mind. I felt pretty uneasy about the fact that this guy knew where I lived. Moreover, the other residents of my flat had a bad habit of letting strangers in, which made me even more uneasy. The next few days passed without incident, and I finished my exams and went back to my parents' house for the summer. When I arrived home, I decided at last that I ought to call the pizza place to report the creepy employee. I did, and the young woman who answered the phone sounded horrified when I explained the situation to her and immediately gave the phone to a manager. He took the details of my order, presumably so he could ascertain who delivered the pizza and apologized. I never heard anything back from the pizza place, but I hope that they have a zero-tolerance policy when it comes to their employees creeping on customers. Okay, here's some background info. This happened years ago, and my friend and I were both 16 years old. Her parents took us to Wildwood Boardwalk for the weekend to celebrate her birthday. We got dressed and her parents let us go alone to the boardwalk for a few hours during dusk. We started walking up a road to get to the ramp onto the boards when we hear this guy pretty far ahead of us screaming at someone. We couldn't hear exactly what he was saying, but we could tell by his arms flailing that he was furious. At this point in time, there wasn't really a sidewalk, so we were on the road and we would see him jump in his car and take off. As he approaches, he almost runs us over. We jump out of the way. Me, being the tough 16-year-old girl, I throw my arms up like, what the heck? Well, he sees this and immediately slams on his brakes, pops his trunk, and jumps out of the car. We were frozen in terror. He starts saying, come here, come here. And then he pulls out a gun out of his trunk and points it directly at us. I could feel my legs weaken and my heart is in my throat. 
Right in front of us was a little intersection, so we book it down that side road as fast as our legs could go. We ran for a bit before I had the courage to look behind us. Luckily, he wasn't there, so I assumed that he didn't follow us. We were so shaken up that we went right back to the hotel to tell her parents. Unfortunately, everything happened so fast that we didn't have much to go on, so nothing ever came from it. The Mystery of Portlock, Alaska The community of Portlock began in Port Chatham Bay in the Kenai Peninsula as a cannery in the early 1900s. Its inhabitants were mainly Russian folk, specifically from the Aleutian Islands, which form a curving archipelago that connects Alaska and Russia while delineating the Bering Sea from Pacific Ocean. In 1921, the community established itself enough to warrant a U.S. post office opening in town. The mysteries of Portlock began only a few short decades after its founding, with the disappearance of some town folk in the 1940s. Sheep hunters had vanished from the hills surrounding the town, and reportedly their bodies would later be found in the lagoon and waterways, mutilated to a degree of brutality that no one thought a wild animal capable, or even desirous of doing. Mysterious prints from some unfamiliar and massive beast measuring 18 inches long were found by hunters tracking moose in the hills surrounding town. Apparently, when the hunters tracked this mysterious animal, they found no moose, but a massively bloody scene. Melania Kell told the story, according to her memory to the Homer Tribune, when she was only a baby, her family suddenly fled from their seaside home in Port Chatham, a community adjacent to Portlock leaving their livelihood and all else behind. Her family was not alone. All of the residents of Portlock left their lives behind in terrible fear. According to her, Nantinak had been stalking the townsfolk, a local Sasquatch-like creature that is said to haunt the Kenai Peninsula. She believed her own godfather had been killed by this creature in 1931, when he was struck in the head in manner that seemed beyond the strength of any human being. Despite being sighted in other regions of the Kenai Peninsula, the beast seemed to favor Portlock most of all, as whispers of a spirit preying on its people traveled throughout the settlements. Were one to write out all of these stories, they would sound very familiar to those of us even with the slightest interest in cryptids, hunters mysteriously vanishing, glimpses of a hairy beast stalking in the shadow of trees, mysterious sounds that seemed to belong to no known beast, but despite this similarity, the stories of the Nantinak have been told far longer than those of Bigfoot. Whatever it was that prowled the wilds around Portlock, it clearly struck a deep and abiding terror in these people. By the early 1950s, Portlock was all but entirely abandoned, marked by the closing of the post office in town. According to Brian Weed, co-founder of a group called Juno's Hidden History, before Portlock began its life as a cannery, it had been host to a small village many years before. It seems those inhabitants also abandoned their fishing camps, reporting that they were being bothered by some beast or spirit. Weed told KINY Radio that later, when the cannery was abandoned, those running it begged the inhabitants to stay, even employing armed guards to assuage their fears. But no amount of begging or precautions seemed to motivate the townspeople to stay. When it's put into perspective just how many people died during this time, this is no surprise. It's said that as many as three dozen people went missing from the small village in only 20 years' time. Strangely, Portlock only appeared on the U.S. Census twice, once in 1940 and again in 1980, curiously reporting exactly 31 residents each time. This seemed like it could have been kind of a clerical error. But for some, it adds to the dark mystique of the town's history. Could there be people living there still? Was the area repopulated again in the 80s only to be abandoned once more? According to locals today, the area is markedly haunted and not merely by Nantique lore. Even before Melania's time, there were stories told of other spirits that haunted the Kenai Peninsula, such as that of a pale-faced woman shrouded and draped in long black cloth that dragged in the wet earth behind her. 
she was said to emerge from the seaside cliffs, screaming and wailing before vanishing back into them. Could this creature that prowled the port town and surrounding wilderness for hundreds of years be a massive lineage of bear? It's hard to imagine that people so intimate with the vast wilderness and all the explicable terrors it holds would be so grasped by such a delirious fear that they'd leave their whole world behind. Perhaps a few too many unthinkable tragedies happen in too short of a time. Although dozens of murders or accidents is still hard to explain. Maybe this really was an encounter with the self-same creature we call Bigfoot. If the census is correct, did people try to live in the area again, only to be scared off by the same beast? Portlock is now, by all accounts, a ghost town. Home only to crumbling lumber, rusting cannery equipment, and other traces of a once vibrant community. To this day, it's not been settled again despite its bounty of resources and breathtaking beauty. The sway held by the local lore may keep that land untouched for many years yet. nineteen ninety four the hills of Bella Vista, California, east of Redding, south of Lake Shasta. I had guests staying at my remote cabin. One evening my friend was outside with his wife and ran inside. You have to come out and see this. I was like, oh crap, now what? As many strange things occurred in those remote woods. I leisurely followed him outside, off the deck and out into the yard. He says look, pointing above the cabin roof. Directly above the cabin are these baseball-sized flashes of blue electricity, like 25 at once or more. They were randomly flashing as if a bunch of cameras were going off. There was no sound to them. I can't recall how long this lasted. Judging from the time, they must have seen them, came all the way inside to tell me and still occurring once I got outside. It must have been at least three minutes that the flashes occurred. I lived there for a few years and never experienced this before but it wasn't entirely surprising. So last year, I went backpacking in the central Sierras with a friend. We were about to set up camp in a spot just a few feet off trail. I ventured farther away from the trail on this rocky area to get a better view of the lake. If you looked close enough, there was a trail. Not on any map, but a clear trail nonetheless that looked like it led to the base of a peak, which is known for climbing. I started following it and came across the most peculiar camp setup. It wasn't like any backpacking setup I'd ever seen. There were a couple of backpacking tents, but there was also these white foldable tables, a canopy tent and a grill a full-on cabinet-style backyard grill, clearly heavy equipment that requires at least two people to carry each item. The nearest road was six miles away, and the only way up to that spot was foot or horse. How the hell did they manage to haul that stuff up there? I didn't see anyone. I saw all that stuff, turned around, and let my friend know. She went back up to check it out, but she didn't see anything. Either she didn't walk down the trail far enough, or my mind completely made that up. Maybe the altitude and sun exposure got to me. I don't know. Either way, I didn't feel safe staying there, so we camped somewhere else. Anyone know how that stuff could have gotten up there? I've been on Reddit for about two years now but I just now found this subreddit. After reading a few of the top posts, I realized that what happened this summer to me is a perfect fit here. I haven't written anything in a long time, so sorry if this isn't the most articulate post. This really messed me up for a while and I'm still not completely okay, but it's easier to cope. It was the middle of summer and my parents had left for the weekend to go to our house in the Cape Cod. It's about a two hour drive away so it's no big deal for them to leave me alone for a few days. My mom had made some pulled pork and pasta for me to heat up to eat whenever. 
and I had some money if I wanted to order a pizza. Things were all good. The first night I was alone, I stayed up until 3 in the morning playing Xbox, so I woke up really late the next day. I checked my phone when I woke up, and I saw that it was a little past 1. I had made plans to play some street hockey with my friends at 3, so I threw myself out of bed and stumbled into the shower. I take really long showers, so when my parents are gone, I go mental. I was in there for about 45 minutes on my phone scrolling through Reddit and Twitter and whatnot when I heard my front door open. The bathroom is directly up the stairs from the back door, and that thing is pretty loud when it opens and closes. I immediately froze, since obviously I was supposed to be alone. I waited for about two minutes, ears trained in, trying to hear anything else. Nothing. I figured it was just the wind or maybe my parents were home early, so I turned off the shower, wrapped my towel around myself, and slowly walked down the stairs to check it out. So the stairs to the kitchen are pretty tight and walled in, so I can't see into the kitchen when I walk down. Even though my house is old as crap and each step on the stairs makes a super loud creak, I still took my time and tried to be as quiet as possible. I probably took 45 seconds walking down all 12 of the stairs. So when I get to the second to last stair, right before I could see around the corner into the kitchen, I take a little breath to compose myself. In my mind, I knew I was being stupid. There obviously wasn't anything in the kitchen. There's no way I wouldn't have heard another noise, and there's no reason for them to still be in the kitchen, even if there were burglars or something in the house. After sort of mentally chastising myself for being such a wuss, I sort of chuckled to myself for being so stupid, and just normally walked the last two stairs and turned the corner into the kitchen. Standing about two feet away from me in the middle of my kitchen is a man staring straight at me perfectly still with a massive smile across his face, just staring at me. The thing I remember most vividly wasn't his face or his smile, but his arms. They weren't just at his side. He held them in the strangest, most abnormal position I've ever seen. They were where one would normally hold their arms, but he had rotated them to the point where they were almost completely reversed, as well as lifting them up and a little behind himself. I don't know why I remember this so much, but it's just the most demonic, abnormal position I've ever seen. Honest to God, I think I almost had a heart attack right there. Looking back, I can realize how creepy this situation was, but in the moment, I just took a step towards him and punched him as hard as I could in the jaw, sort of half slapping slash pushing him towards the ground. The second I connected, I beelined up the stairs, dropping my towel in the kitchen with my heart beating out of control. I sprinted into my room and locked the door behind me. I quickly put a chair up against the doorknob like you see in TV. Almost without thinking, I immediately called 911 and nearly in tears told the operator what happened. As I sat on the floor of my room in practically the fetal position, staring at the door praying that a cop would be here soon, I noticed the light coming from the gap between my door had stopped. He was standing outside of my door. There's no words to describe the feeling I had. I was paralyzed with fear. Watching the shadow across the bottom of the door shift in tiny ways, I stayed balled up, staring at the gap, praying the man would go away for what seemed like an hour. All the while, the 911 operator was asking, Hello, sir, are you there? Hello. I didn't want to make a noise, and even if I wanted to move my arms to bring the phone to my mouth, I don't think I could have. Eventually, the light returned to the gap and I heard the faintest of footsteps slowly creaking the wooden floorboards as he walked down the hall. It was silent for minutes as I just sat there curled up unable to even speak. I heard banging on the front door and the sound of two officers entering my house. I finally felt safe and I opened the door to the two of them standing there. I almost cried. Nowadays, my parents don't even leave me home alone anymore, thank God, and I check every lock on the house before going to bed. I still get nightmares occasionally, and my heart starts racing whenever I see someone standing still, but I'm doing all right. Even working with sketch artists and a few lineups, the police never found whoever was in my house. That sends shivers down my spine every time I look outside, half expecting to see him standing across the street, smiling under a lamppost. I have no idea what he wanted, or who he was, but regardless, this event has scarred me.
I was 14 at the time of this story, so keep that in mind for context. I sat on my bed, in my house, on my own, as usual. My parents were going to be out for the night, and we lived in a peaceful area, so even the strictest parents would have let their son watch over the house. As I was on my laptop watching videos, I hear a knock from the door. Mind you, this was 2 a.m., and I was already paranoid from my previous experiences. There was no way I was going to answer that door, but my curiosity was piqued. Since my house has two floors, there was a window right above the door, which I could pull the blinds up to a slit to see who was at the door. My porch light was on, so light wasn't too much of a problem. Even though my paranoia peaked, I had to look to see who was outside. When I looked, there was nobody. I was about to just place the blind down when I saw someone under the light at the end of the cul-de-sac and almost jumped backwards. This person was in a conveniently suspicious looking hoodie and tracksuit with no light showing his facial features. His arms were to his sides and he was staring directly at me. It was weird. He didn't move at all. He just stood there under the light. After what seemed like 10 minutes, he had just turned around and walked into the darkness of the main street. I sighed and went back to watching videos. Perhaps he was just some weird guy who came from the train station near my house. I had no idea, but any justification was better than the alternative. Eventually around 3 a.m. I fell asleep. I woke up at about 4.40 to the sound of my dog silently growling behind me. I thought it was because he wanted to go out in the garden, so I turned around and froze in terror. The person from the street, he was in my doorway. No light hit him from the front, and so even then I could only make out an outline of his face. We had another moment, where I just stared into the void which was his face, only for him to break the silence with advice, which seemed silly at first glance, but I have forever took it to heart since. Lock your back door. And as he did last time, he turned around towards the stairs, and with me still frozen in place, left my house through the back door. When I wasn't frozen stiff with fear, I sprinted downstairs and got to the back door. He was in the garden. I could only see his outline. He stayed still for a moment, only to sprint off into the woods. I never found out who he was. I didn't care to tell my parents what happened. And yet to this day, they still ask why I insist on keeping the back door locked. Honestly, I believe he was a warning. If he had been an unstable psychopath, I wouldn't be here right now. Considering some experiences I have had since, I say locking your doors, even in peaceful areas, is great advice. So, 2 a.m. security checker, thank you. Even if your intention was bad, I still learned something from you. Several years ago, I took a 911 call for a family reporting their teenage daughter was possessed. They claimed no possibility of drugs or a history of mental health issues, which I, of course, didn't believe for a second. Family members were holding her down, and I could hear two people screaming at each other in the background. I asked the caller to tell whoever was yelling at her to stop. The caller said, It's her. I responded that I knew it was her, but whoever was yelling at her at the same time to stop. The caller said again, it's her, both voices. I kid you not, it was the creepiest thing I have ever heard. I've been doing this for 25 years and have heard many things. I know of man's inhumanity and the horrible things that people do to each other, but this was a different kind of evil. I was clearly hearing a young girl screaming at the same time an adult male was yelling back. I couldn't understand either language, but they were clearly two different voices. The family swore that both voices were coming from her at the same time. It made my skin crawl. The lieutenant listened to the tape later, and he looked at me and said, Do you ever wonder? Yes. Yes, I do. I've seen a lot of things in my career, things that would make a citizen doubt my sanity, 
from being dispatched to chase a UFO to responding to calls of ghosts. But the most unusual thing that happened to me was witnessed by several officers and a dispatcher. One evening, I had brought in a guy for a domestic violence, and as he was a bit rowdy, I was joined in booking by the sergeant and another patrolman. I'm in the process of booking Mr. Tough Guy when I glanced into cell number one. There was a guy in there, short haircut, glasses, and a white t-shirt just staring at us. I ignored him because I didn't want him to start banging on the window demanding a phone call or something. So I finished the booking process and escort Mr. Tough Guy to his cell, walking past cell number one. The guy in the cell just stood there, never saying a word or moving. We all then leave booking and go about our business. Sometime later, the sergeant asked me to check the paperwork for the prisoners to see if any were ready to transport to the county jail. I grab the paperwork and go into the booking to do a head count. Cell number one is empty. I panic and tell the sergeant who also panics, and he and I begin to make phone calls to the detectives to see if they had moved the guy or had released him. They all say they didn't go into booking at all. I then check the computer and paperwork again, and the head count was accurate so no one had been placed in cell number one. We go to the dispatch office to check the surveillance video for booking. We rewind the footage to where I can be seen booking my prisoner. We fast forward to the point in the video where we all walk out. As soon as we walk past the door, the guy in number one blinks out of existence. We were all freaked out by the occurrence, believe you me. When we tried to transfer the video to a DVD and USB drive, the guy in the cell did not appear. We still hear and see stuff every now and then, and prisoners in the detox tank can be seen talking to someone in the direction of cell number one, even though it appears empty. To this day, I'm wary of going into booking alone. This is back in the mid to late 1990s. I was riding patrol on the midnight shift when I received a burglar alarm to a closed business. From my experience, this means that someone just tried to, or successfully, burglarized one of the businesses on my beat. When I arrived at the business, the business was a funeral home. Okay, no big deal, I'm telling myself. I park about 50 yards away, blacked out, looking for any movement in or out of the business. Nothing moving. I make an approach on foot, using my flashlight very, very little. Gotta try and keep the element of surprise. I approach the door, hoping that it would be locked. The door is unlocked, and I can hear the alarm going off. My backup arrives to help secure the perimeter. I call for the canine unit to respond. Canine officer arrives, and sees that it's a funeral home. He said he cannot deploy his dog, because the dog won't discriminate against an alive or dead person and would attack. Oh crap. I've gotta go in and check this funeral home, open every casket, Check every gurney to make sure that no one is hiding in this funeral home. I had to do a gut check and remember why I signed up for this job. The words of one of my training officers echoing in my conscious. No one asked you to do this job. And his other famous saying. Don't worry son, police work isn't for everyone. Well, I wasn't going to let that SOB get the best of me. My partner and I carefully entered the building my partner flatly refusing to open anything that could contain a dead person. I told him that I would do the checking and that he just needed to cover me. We start methodically checking the building in the dark, room by room, casket by casket. I carefully lifted each lid and checked each coffin. Most were empty, but some were occupied. The ones that were occupied, I had to reach in and lightly touch the person to make sure that they were ice cold. If they weren't cold, they were the bad guy hiding in the coffin. That was a long night, a long time ago, but still, just as fresh like it happened yesterday. At the end of it all, there was no bad guy and no burglary. My ex-husband and I left a beach town. We were there visiting friends, another couple at their cottage, all day and evening. We just left as the sun went down about 9.30 p.m. We took the highway there, but I hate highway driving, so my ex took the supposed scenic route home. 
He drove rural roads and we wound up at a stop sign, a T intersection, turn left or right, no road ahead, only trees. Okay, he went right knowing that we should be west towards our home. Minutes later, we were right back at the stop sign and T intersection. Odd, so my ex turned left, knowing it was the wrong direction, east. He did it anyway, and minutes later we came to the same stop sign again. I'll add, no embellishments. The road that kept leading us to this stop sign was acres of corn on both sides. Also farmhouses with interior lights on, people home and awake. Anyway, the third time I could tell that he was a bit rattled but wouldn't share. He said, I'm turning right, and you, me, watch for any road signs. I did and he did too from the driver's side. Nothing, just tree lines. We ended up back at the same stop sign again. My ex said F this and hit reverse. Peeled backwards on the gravel road halfway into a farm driveway and turned around. Then went back the way we'd came slash entered the road. From there we did get home. My ex will never admit the eeriness of that night. Are going on a semi-loop three times. Perhaps in the bright light of day the roads would make sense. But this was the only time I've ever seen my ex frantic or panicked. Even as a skeptic, he knew something was off, continually arriving at the same stop sign. We were also older, in our 40s. I might not be explaining the circumstance as well, but it's still the gospel truth. Also, I want to point out my ex had and has an uncanny knack for direction. Better now with GPS, etc. He had it innately at this time and before. When he reversed and gunned it backwards, I knew he was afraid. He's a wonderful, kind person. He'll never talk about it, though. Or anything weird. That night. As a police officer... What is the scariest thing that a suspect has ever said to you? I'm not sure it was the scariest thing, but it gave me some reason to pause. As usual, I was working the street crimes and had finally arrested a target I had been after for a very long time. He was about 25 years old and was the admitted leader of a street gang named the Dark Side Posse. This is his story. The Dark Side Posse was the first street gang we experienced in our city. Sure, a few biker gangs had some ties to our city, but this was the new type of drug gang, which recruited kids and teens to do their dirty work. Similar gangs would some years later become affiliated with one of the national gangs like the Bloods or the Crips. However, at the time, they were the first and only gang and were just local. The leader was a fairly intelligent guy. He, in fact, had a full-ride scholarship to a university and a basketball scholarship. Unfortunately, He was already involved in the family business of dealing drugs. He was caught with dealer weight during a car stop and did a little jail time. That was the end of the scholarship and getting out of the neighborhood. At one point, I decided to talk to this posse leader. So I parked my car on his corner and just sat there, which was bad for business. He eventually came out and asked what I needed to leave the corner. Almost a bribe offer, but not quite. I told it I needed him to stop selling drugs on that corner and to take his business somewhere outside of my city. I told him that I knew that he was using kids to move his product, and just because he screwed up his own future, that didn't give him the right to mess up the futures of these kids. Boy, did that make him mad. He told me point blank that this was his corner, and he would sell drugs all he wanted, and I wasn't smart enough to catch him. He also made a veiled threat about making sure I was taking care of my own family, and how easy it would be for him to come visit my neighborhood. This is not what you want to hear from a drug dealer or a gang leader. I wondered how he made the correct assumption I had a family, and then I realized that I was wearing a wedding ring. I took the ring off that night and never put it back on. I vaguely explained slash lied to my wife that it was an undercover thing. From that day, I made it my mission to catch this gang leader and user of children. I came up with a plan which would involve the transfer of a number of officers. The chief bought into my plan and set up round-the-clock walk patrols in just a four-block area, making drug dealing in his immediate neighborhood impossible. 
Boy, was I popular with the officers who had to leave their air-conditioned cars and walk beats in the heat of summer, especially as they were not aware of the overall plan. Using a good, confidential informant, I got my target to move to a location which was good for audio and video surveillance. We actually recorded him completing drug transactions and taking money, then signaling to a child on a bicycle to deliver the drugs. I took my evidence to a grand jury and got a multi-count sealed indictment against him for leading a drug distribution network and employing juveniles in the distribution of drugs. Bail was set at a staggering $1 million cash. This was unheard of in this area in the 1990s. I wanted his arrest to have maximum impact on the neighborhood, so I had the state police team's unit execute both a search warrant on his house and make the arrest. About a dozen highly trained troopers in special raid gear crashed the house with machine guns, and he was in custody in less than a minute. This team was awesome to watch in action. Once the house was secure, I went back into the kitchen, which is where my dealer was seated, with his hands cuffed behind his back. I said to him, This is a multi-count, sealed indictment, and warrant for your arrest. Your bail is $1 million cash. I looked at him and he was shaking. His eyes were wide, trying to make sense of what was happening to him. Gone was the cocky thug who thought that he could intimidate me. All that was left was a criminal who looked scared to death. He stayed in the kitchen for about 15 minutes, but no other words were spoken between us. He just kept quietly shaking and looking down at the ground. We finally got the word to take him outside, and I realized the reason for the delay. As we exited the front door, cameras were snapping from the press and we were on the front cover of several newspapers. I think they waited for the press to arrive and did what is now called a perp walk. He went away to prison. Unfortunately, others took over his drug trade, but the dark side posse collapsed without a leader. About seven years later, I was at the scene of a disturbance outside a social club with a bad reputation. I'm standing on the front steps as people are filing out. A rather large, well-muscled man stops at the door and says, Remember me? I looked at him for a minute and said, yep, and called him by name. He said he just got out and was going straight. I didn't believe him, but it seemed things between us were now okay. I would read later that he got mixed up in some kind of organized crime hit and may or may not have been in either witness protection or prison. I don't ever expect to see him again, and that's a good thing. So this was back right after 9-11 happened. I'm a female, and I was 24 years old, and I was driving my way back across the country to get to my son, who was with my ex. I had been out of state taking care of a sick family member. It was in the middle of the night in New Mexico, and I saw police lights behind me. I was exhausted and annoyed, because I hadn't been speeding or anything. There were not really any other cars on the road at the time, and I was close to the exit for the hotel that I had planned to stop at for the night. I pulled over, and the cop came over to the driver's side window, which in itself was weird, because usually they come up to the passenger window on busy roads, and this was a highway. So I give him all my stuff, and he just stared at me for the longest time. He walked to his car and then returned almost immediately. He told me to step outside the car. Okay. I was worried at this point, because I had gotten tickets before, but being asked to step outside the car was not the norm. I did as he said, and he asked if I had been drinking. I said I hadn't, and then I asked why he pulled me over. He said I was driving erratically, which was not true. He then asked me if I was a terrorist, which was absurd. I was a young American white woman just driving, so there was really no reason for this question. It's weird, and I was a veteran with an ID as well. He gave me a walk-the-line drunk driving test, which I passed, and then said that he needed to search my car to see if I had drugs. I thought about this for a minute because I knew my rights and all, but it was so late and I was just so tired. I just didn't want to deal with all of the BS of refusing, so I gave him the okay because I knew I didn't have anything in my car. So when he got to my truck, he opened up a small suitcase I had that was my dancer stuff. He asked about it and I told him that I was a stripper. This really set him off and he started screaming at me about being a trash person. This made me angry and I started looking around at my situation. I was alone for the most part with this weird guy 
and every once in a while, a car would pass by. But for the most part, the roads were empty. It was the middle of the night, and I didn't have anything on myself to protect myself, and he obviously had a gun. He told me that I needed to walk back into the tree line that was next to the road. I stared at him and said no. I demanded that he call for backup and for other officers to come. He was thrown off by this. I said I wanted a female officer, and I would no longer comply with anything he said, and then I started trying to wave down cars when they passed by. He told me to calm down, wrote me out a speeding ticket, and let me go. I never paid the ticket and never heard a word about it. This was 20 years ago. At the time, I was really shaken, and I just forgot about it. But looking back, I don't think that he was a real cop. So there's a park in Tucker, Georgia, called John's Homestead. What it actually is, is an old vacant farmhouse that sits awkwardly in disarray along a busy highway. Some hundred-year-old homestead donated to the county to build a park and trail system over a few good acres. Although the adjacent highway is often busy, this particular patch could almost pass as the rural back road it once was. The homestead, two churches established a century ago, old cemeteries, and a few acres of wood in between bustling urban communities. To be honest, I don't remember much of the history of the place aside from the landowner being named John Johns, and an old picture of him didn't look too happy. I know the entire property creeps me out though. I only went a handful of times, not too far down the trail from the parking area, which is maybe a quarter mile from the homestead. I suddenly felt like I was being watched. It suddenly got quiet. I still made it to the old house, then circled back around. I stopped another time and had the same creepy feeling the whole time. And I'm telling you, you feel so far off the road and into the woods, despite having that highway running virtually right beside you the entire time. So I told myself that I wasn't going back. But I did. One more time. I really wanted to take a stroll before dark, and I was running late coming home. So I pulled over to John's homestead. I don't remember it feeling too weird on the trail. Maybe it was the heavier evening traffic. I could easily hear through the trees. Maybe it was the two middle-aged women on the blanket near the small stream sipping wine. Only time I ever encountered others on the small trail. But the walk to the house was fine. I get to the house, walking around it. I notice how pitch black it seems inside, despite the apparent lack of complete and intact boarding on doors and windows. It's got a chain link around it since it was deemed structurally unsafe. Very suddenly, I realize it's about to get dark on me and that feeling starts creeping back. So I swiftly walk back towards the trail. I'm just a few steps into the wooded area when I hear a loud thud. Something big hit the ground. My brain is trying to convince me that it was a tree limb, but I immediately realize that there were no snaps or cracks. I look around for just a few seconds but briskly walk my way out of there and get to my car as it's getting just too dark to see. I didn't think much of it until I read a few days later that human remains were found just a few feet away from where I was standing when I'd heard the noise. Other than a body found, the county never released any identity or any more details, and this was over a year ago. So maybe this little spot in Tucker isn't exactly backwoods now, but what's there that feels off? Why did this one small stretch of woods never get developed? What's so special about this particular crumbling house? It looks so out of place in the bigger picture of the area. What the hell did I hear? Who was found dead? And what happened? So this happened earlier in this year. For a little background, I'm a 30-year-old male, married, 29 at the time, with a young daughter. I live in a rural Northern California town, pretty much right in the epicenter of the gold rush. And I don't know if it's all the ways the land was taken or the ways people killed for wealth back then, but it's always seemed to have a higher share of strange recluses and sovereign citizen types. That being said, this is not a haunting story or strange people of the woods, 
but it was by far the most frightening encounter I've experienced as a father. Some time ago, I ended up with an extra day off, and my wife and I decided to go for a drive and check out a semi-local gun show. From time to time, I'll get tables at them and have friends who do them regularly. So we went to visit as I'm always looking for obscure parts and pieces of old military weapons and had some family that lived in the area of this show as well. We had a hell of a winter last year, so unsurprisingly it was a cold gloomy day. We drove about an hour and knew the promoters so walked right in. As I was passing tables in search of the right stuff, I was carrying my daughter with me. She was very small and ridiculously cute, so everyone wanted to look and ask about her which is normal from what I'm observed from parents. At times, you even draw a small crowd, usually of sweet little old ladies and some grandpa types. As a side point, I had one really grumpy lady tell me that she was way too young. I looked at her confused and said she's like three months old, she'll never remember. Back on topic, there was one man who seemed a bit more excited than most men his age, but he said that he had worked as an EMT and in a NICU for years so it seemed reasonable that he was happy to see healthy babies. As the afternoon went on, he passed me a few more times, moving against the crowd. That was the first sign, and commented on how beautiful she was. As babies often do at that age, my wife soon needed to breastfeed our daughter. She went out to the car and had blinders in the back seat so she could have privacy and keep the baby from distractions. I turned on the heater, locked the doors, and went back in to help a buddy sell during a busier point. About 10 to 15 minutes later, my phone starts ringing with my frantic wife on the other end. About three minutes before, I had noticed that law enforcement had gotten up and walked outside of the show. It took a minute to calm her down, but apparently the guy had followed us outside and been watching closely. My wife got the sudden feeling that makes your hair stand up whilst feeding in the car. That was when she saw a shadow standing outside her door, locking it from opening, holding a small metal tube, a mag light. At that same moment, a sheriff pulled up who had also seen us go to the car. The officer asked what was going on, and the man tried to say that he was talking to my wife who rolled down the window slightly and said she was not and didn't want to either. The officer asked him his name, and then when the officer turned around to run the name, he tried to scurry away. The name was fake, hence why the other officers got up. Detained, he gave his real name, and within one minute of calling it in, the man was turned around and arrested. Turned out, he had a felony warrants for kidnappings. The man was waiting for the nearby cars to leave. He was about to try and take my wife and infant daughter. Had that cop not been right there, who knows how it might have unfolded. Luckily, there was a cop when we needed one. My brother is two years older than me, and we've probably spent tens of thousands of hours and then some in the woods together. Whether it was building forts slash BMX tracks to LARPing and hunting, we've traveled across the U.S. exploring caves, canyons, cliff diving, mountain climbing, camping, hunting whitetail mule deer, wild boar, etc. since 2016 when we get the time off. I feel like adding this is important because there's genuinely nothing I wouldn't do or fear when I have him by my side, but this time was different and we both felt it. We've had our fair share of adventures and stories to tell of all sorts, but this one has felt like a lingering stain on my memory. We were both mid-twenties-ish, and it was 2019, and this was probably my fifth time hunting the area, and the first that I brought my brother along. It's a large forest area of public land that has a few country roads which are basically two tracks that stretch miles throughout the area. We make the trip up in my truck with our tents, three in total, one for each of us, and another to change in and keep our gear in. Without making this long-winded, we set up camp a couple miles back from the truck, which we drove for quite a few miles through the trails, basically middle of nowhere, nearest main road is probably eight to ten miles away. We arrived late in the night, set up camp, and quickly fell asleep after the long trip. We spent the next day scouting slash tracking, then made back to camp for the night. We cooked and then ate, had some beers, and BS'd around. The night was still early, but we had a long day and decided to head off for the night. 
everything up until this point was normal. I was suddenly awoke to something smacking my tent and hearing my brother's voice call my name. I knew something was off. I called back to him and he immediately unzipped my tent and made his way inside. I could tell that he was disturbed when I went to ask him what was wrong and he immediately grabbed my shoulder and told me to shush. The sun wasn't up yet so I think it was around 4.30 to 5ish a.m. We sat in my tent and what we heard still confuses me to this day. I can only explain it as whale sounds. Different tones of extremely loud noise that I could feel throughout my body. It would come and go, but there would be only a few seconds of silence in between the sounds. It would vary from high-pitched squeals and everything in between to very low sounds that had literal ground-shaking reverb. I regrettably didn't think to grab my phone or record anything that was going on, because what I was hearing didn't seem real, and in the moment I was awestruck. The sound went on until daylight started to break. I believe it was about an hour, but I'm not really sure. Neither of us spoke, and at the time, it felt like we could feel the energy around me, almost like my body was covered in white noise, if that makes any sense. It wasn't even minutes after the sound stopped that it started to rain, and one of the craziest thunderstorms while I was camping happened. The forecast didn't predict or account for any rain the days we were going to be there prior to making the trip. All the stakes for our tent our gear was in completely ripped out of the ground and both of our tents had multiple stakes ripped out as well. Those things we drove into the ground with an axe and would make some insane force to unearth even a single one. My brother dismisses it and won't even talk about it, saying it was just machinery being dragged. But at the time, we both shared the same feeling of fear and dread. Just seems odd that it was still the middle of the night and we were so far removed from any nearby communities slash industry to hear and experience this occurrence. This is a story my friend told me that happened to her older sister. She goes to a large, private religious university in Utah. She was staying in an apartment not too far from campus with three other girls. The semester had just started, and two of the three girls were asleep. My friend's sister was on her phone sitting in the living room when she heard what sounded like footsteps outside the window behind her. She listened closely and dismissed it as a stray cat or dog. Soon after, she heard a thud against the dining room wall coming from the outside, and heard what sounded like muffled whispering. My friend's sister is an excellent marksman, so she decided to scare whoever was outside by opening the blinds, turning on the lights, and grabbing the shotgun she kept on the mantle and pointing it at the window while screaming for the other girls to wake up. She saw a short man wearing all black and a ski mask running away. The cops came shortly after and she filed a report. Fast forward to a few weeks later, my friend's sister keeps seeing a small white truck with tinted black windows following her. She dismisses it as her imagination, but it freaks her out a little bit. One weekend, her roommates have gone out of town, so it's just her by herself. Right as she's trying to fall asleep, she hears a pounding at her door. She bolts to the door and looks through the peephole to see a cop standing there. Who are you? She asks. I'm a cop, says the guy. Open up. It's the law. He yells menacingly. My friend is starting to call BS, but she's scared of disobeying him if he actually is a cop. Why are you here so late, she asks. Remember a few weeks ago when that guy tried to break into your house? I have an update on him. My friend is freaking out now, because why would a cop come try to talk to her about a case so late and by himself? He wasn't even the officer who helped her fill out the report. Show me your badge, she demanded. He pulled it out and shoved it into the peephole and my friend sighed a breath of relief. Right as she was unlocking the door, she glanced down at his legs and noticed this cop had very elevated platform boots, a machete on his utility belt, and the name on his uniform didn't match the name on his badge. You're not an effing cop, she yelled at him. The fake cop screamed and started slamming on the door saying, I'm an officer of the law and you will obey me. Open up, police. She called 911 and held her weight behind the front door, clutching her shotgun until the cops arrived. The guy was long gone by then, but he left behind his cap, which was a prop from a party store. The day after this, my friend broke her lease, 
moved to a new city in Utah, transferred schools and bought a Doberman to keep her company. They never caught the guy, so hopefully he never does this to another girl again. My cousin had moved into a house in St. Kilda with her fiancé, and not long after began receiving strange letters in their mailbox every day. The letters made no sense and seemed to be very religious and were quite amusing. They began collecting these letters and sticking them to their fridge and having a little giggle with their friends over coffee while reading what they thought were the ramblings of some strange religious group. After a few weeks, my cousin and her fiancé became friends with their neighbors and invited them over for dinner. While sitting in the kitchen, their neighbor noticed the letters and exclaimed, You get them too? My cousin's fiancé, Scott, laughed and asked if hers said the same thing. But his laughter was cut short as he noticed a very worried look on her face. He asked what was wrong, to which she replied, You haven't worked it out yet? She then proceeded to tell my cousin and her fiancé to take the first letter of every word and put them together. They got the letters and proceeded to do so finding a shocking, hidden message in each detailing the writer, still in a crazed fashion, stabbing, assaulting, and killing someone. Their neighbor explained that it was from an ex-policeman who was corrupt and now mentally unstable, who sent letters out to the houses of the people that he was involved with, lived, or used to live. Although these people, police and criminals alike, had long since moved, he continued to send letters to the same address, as the weeks went on, my cousin continued to receive these letters with increasing frequency. No longer was it a letter a day. They found a new letter every time they left the house. It wouldn't matter how long they would go out for, whether it be an hour or five minutes. When they returned home, there would be a new letter. This started to trouble my cousin, as she now knew that this man was watching their house all the time. Another frightening thing my cousin would later find out from her neighbor is that the person sending the letters soon began to address these twisted letters to the new occupants. One of her neighbors moved from her house as she began receiving letters with her name now appearing instead of the old owners. My cousin and her fiancé eventually moved and were not harmed by the sender of the letters. I answered a welfare check call one night late between 2.30 and 3.30 a.m. on an elderly woman who lived next door to the caller and had not been seen for some time. This night, we were having a bad thunderstorm without the rain. I get to the complainant's house to speak to her first, wondering why she called at this time. She tells me the lady next door is in her 90s, lives alone, and she has not seen her in weeks. She explained that she has called, went over, and knocked on her door but the lady will not answer. I start thinking she's probably deceased and has been for some time. The car has a three inch layer of dust on it. The mail is piling up and no lights are on. First, I walked to the side door and knocked on the door with my flashlight, knocking loud enough that an elderly person with some hearing should hear it. After a few minutes of no response, I turned around and walked to the backyard looking at the windows and find everything okay. The complainant is with me and is saying that she doesn't know any of the relatives of the lady. I'm sure by now that she is probably deceased. I walk to the front of the house and notice that her blinds are up on the front windows, and I can see a glow from inside. I'm, however, not tall enough to look into the windows, which are probably seven feet off the ground. The complainant runs next door and grabs a bucket for me to stand on. I get on the bucket and bingo, I can see the living room. The glow was from the TV, which was on a blue screen, and is bright enough that I didn't need my flashlight to see in. I looked first at the floor to make sure that she had not fallen there. Couch, recliner, everything was empty. The telephone home base was blinking red with the missed calls and voicemails. From the living room was a hallway that was dark and I couldn't see down. Using my flashlight, I could only see an open door down the hall. Still, no signs of life. I turned around and told the complainant that everything looked okay and nothing was disturbed. I turn back around and an elderly woman is looking back at me with her face right up next to the glass. 
I couldn't breathe. It felt as if I had been hit in the chest by a bat. I fell backward and off of the bucket. I hit the ground hard and the complainant rushed to me. I pushed her off as she was trying to help me up, and I ran back up on the bucket. My heart was pounding, but I had to see. Instinct had my hand on my gun. The other was up to the window. I looked back inside and saw a frail elderly woman standing in the hallway, wearing a long nightgown with her back to me. She turned her head to the side and looked at me out of the corner of her eye and slowly walked out of view and down the dark hallway. That really unnerved me. I got down and looked at the complainant, who was standing there with a puzzled look on her face. All I could say was I saw her. By now, the wind had picked up and it began to rain. I began to walk back to my car by the road, and I turned back to the complainant and said, Don't come back here. I got into the car and drove to the police department. I never found out about the lady who lived there. The complainant didn't call back, and the house now has different tenants inside. Some things are better left alone. When I was growing up, we lived near a town called Welty in Oklahoma. It's not really much of a town, just a tiny store, some churches, and a lot of farms. We lived off of the main road, close to an area called Macabre, which is also nothing but farms and a cemetery, and not even considered a town. Very middle of nowhere. My dad told a lot of creepy stories about this place, especially having to do with orbs and weird deer. I do have memories of seeing floating orbs floating over the trees, and have no idea what those were, but I never personally saw anything else. My dad has always been a skeptic, and never chimed in on these stories. He has Alzheimer's and has a great memory of the past, but terrible short term. The other day, he was telling me how much he loved living out there, and wished he could still live there, and I brought up the orbs and the creepy stories my family always shared. He agreed that they were always creeped out out there, but then he told me that he actually saw something really odd once. He told me one night he was sitting on the porch by himself, and a man ran through our yard wearing what looked like a deer head. Not just the antlers, but like he had on a deer's head. He just ran through and continued on down the pitch black road. My dad didn't know what to think of it. He just told me he thought people out there had too much time on their hands. My mom and brother also saw what they said was a deer walking upright, all the way down the road. I know deer do this, but they said it just kept walking like that in the middle of the road. My aunt also said they passed a man who was wearing a deer's head on the road one night. There aren't any streetlights in this area, so he was just out there in the dark road alone, just standing there. Who was the scariest person you ever encountered as a police officer? The one that stands out to me is a 911 call where, on a cold winter night, when you could never wear enough clothes to stay warm, the apartment resident has an argument with a man who said he was going to return with a gun and shoot him. The apartment was a couple of blocks away. We were at the police station and my partner was on the toilet with the runs. He had smoked a cigar earlier and swallowed a bit too much tobacco juice. Life in patrol where there is always a side story. I was very impatient and rushed him off the pot. I was thinking if we didn't hurry, it wouldn't end well for the victim. When we arrived, another two-man police car arrived. We all walked into the apartment building, pistols in hand. I was point. Three cops very close behind me. Lighting was dim. Long, narrow hallway leading to the apartment. We quietly walked to the apartment door, not hearing any telltale sounds. The door was ajar. It opens inward. I stood on the hinge side, back away from the opening, out of what we call the funnel of death. All three cops right behind me, so close that we're all touching, our guns still in hand and ready for whatever fate brings us. This kind of thing is so frequent that our pulse is barely elevated. It's a way of life for us. I hear music, not unusually loud. Lights are off. It's dark in there, but it's 2 a.m., so that's expected. 
With my free left hand, I push on the door. It barely moves. The carpet is rubbing on the bottom of the door, giving it a bunch of resistance. We don't announce our presence, although we should have, thinking it doesn't hurt to look first before entering, then evaluate, because we still have the advantage. No one knows that we're there. So I lean in, center my left hand on the door, push it open and it's not easy, gun handed extended, and leading the way as the door comes fully open. My body is now fully in the funnel of death, my eyes straining to see into the dim lit room, three cops still right behind me. What comes into focus next is a man seated against the back living room wall, shotgun low and pointed at my belly maybe 30 feet away. All my mind is saying is, it's gonna hurt, back out of the kill zone. But I can't. The word gun won't pass my lips fast enough. I never hear those words as audio exclusion has taken over, which I had learned is a natural response in extreme situations. I'm trying to step back and push the officers back, but my partner is all over me and the other cops were all over him. Of course, it's probably only a split second, but it seemed like a lifetime. As the cops behind me give way and I back up out of the kill zone, I see the gun fall to the floor and the man simultaneously drops to the floor and prones out. He yells something, but I'm conditioned red, so I don't comprehend anything. To this day, I don't know why he didn't shoot, but from his point of view, as the door slowly, freakily opened, all he saw first was my nine. He would have likely skated on any charges. As the door swung fully opened, he then saw a uniformed cop with the business end pointed at him. He was thinking it was the game over for him. As my partner gathered info for the report, I walked outside into the freezing weather, which now felt like a warm summer night. Additional cops were arriving. One, a close friend of Richard Washington, walked up to me and asked how the call was progressing, and to his surprise, I grabbed him in a bear hug and held him like a lover. I told him it was good to see him, that I just had a close call. The next day, a news reporter wanted to have an interview, which had been cleared by an admin. All I remember saying was that when I woke up the next morning and looked out to my backyard preparing to come to work, the trees and grass looked so much greener and prettier. It was so good to be alive and healthy. While working narcotics, one of my partners reported a fight. I ran around the back of a building. As I came around the corner, I came face to face with an 18 year old kneeling with a gun to the head of a guy on the ground. It took less than a second to see number two and number three doing the very same thing. I never saw number four. Oh, and it was 3 a.m. and dark. My gun was out and aimed at number one in the half step it took to come to a stop. I yelled police, drop the weapon. As the word weapon came out of my mouth, my finger was on the trigger. Just as I started to squeeze, number one did the smartest thing of his life. He, while holding what turned out to be a Ruger Red Hawks, with both hands, pushed it away from him, landing two feet away from him but closer to me. In the millisecond it took for the gun to hit the ground, I saw motion at number three, raised up and saw a mirror image of a man raising up his weapon, pointed at me. I fired twice. I heard two shots returned. I was later told it was the echo of my shots. And if it was said by anyone else but my partner, I would still believe the other guy shot as well. The guy turned and ran away between the buildings, as well as the other three. I still thought there were only three at this point. I was 27. I thought my career was over, as I just shot at a guy and missed with an apartment building behind him. We chased at least two of them over the hill from West 25th towards Major Hoople's, just to give you some idea of where it was and who I worked for. I grabbed the Ruger as we chased the former owner of it over the hill into the brush. By the time the bosses got there, we had one in custody, and I was asked about the description of the one that I shot at. I gave my description to several bosses who obviously did not believe a word I had said. Six to six two, slim black male wearing a tracksuit, the old polyester style, zipper jacket with some word in white letters on the back. Oh, what collar? Petty blue. 
our bosses and their bosses walked off a bit and would spend the next three minutes shaking their heads and looking back at me. Why three minutes? Because that's how long it took a responding zone car coming from the west towards Lutheran to go speeding by a guy, limping fast, headed west away from our location. They stopped, hooked him up, and brought him to the scene. Guess what he was wearing? His limping? It was the cause of the two shots in his left leg right into the car keys in his pocket, which they had to dig out along with my two rounds. My shots were low, but they were less than one and a half inches apart at over 75 feet away, under stress with a gun pointed back at me, in low light. So, you know, F that guy. This one time, I went out on the call of a suspicious person at a house near where I was at. When I get there, the guy tells me that someone knocked on his door, and when he went to see who it was, there was a woman standing in his driveway with some sort of child-sized doll with horns, and it looked like it was all bloody and cut up. So, he asked the woman, who was looking away from him, what she wanted. She turned around and told him, It needs food. Then started screaming at the top of her lungs and ran at him. So, like a normal human being, he slammed the door shut in her face and called the cops. I get there, and there are well-defined claw marks on his door. There's also a good bit of blood, I suppose from her fingers. So I call it out and start the search on foot. I also had two or three units driving around the area to see if they can't find this chick. So I'm about a block away, and we get another call that the woman is back at the guy's house, but in the backyard. So I run about a block back to the guy's house and bust into his backyard. The lights are out, so I have my flashlight on and I'm looking around. I see the chick huddled in the corner next to an evil-looking doll thing, and I ask her if she's okay. She doesn't say anything. About this time, one of my mobile units comes back to the house and parked his unit where the headlights were shining on her, so we could see how scary this chick looked. She had long black hair. Her clothes were rags. She had no shoes, clearly homeless, and she kept whispering things to the doll. So my buddy and I approached and tried talking to her, and she just kept whispering to the doll. We couldn't understand what the hell she was saying, so we decided to drag her out of there. The second we put hands on this chick, she went berserk, punching, kicking, slapping, all kinds of stuff. So we're fighting with her trying to get her on the ground, and she's not going down. This chick was strong as hell. Well, in the fight, she somehow got away from us and was sitting in a crouched position with her head tilted to the side and making the creepiest growl slash snarling sound that I've ever heard. Then she screams at the top of her lungs and charged at us. So my buddy straight jabbed her in the face and knocked her clean out. We cuffed her and hauled her off to the hospital where she tested positive for PCP and various opiates. She was charged with battery of a peace officer resisting arrest and trespassing. Later, she was institutionalized for some sort of mental disorder. Not quite sure what it was. My department didn't have anything more to do with her after her booking into the jail. I'm a former, long-time Airborne Ranger having served for many years in the 275 in Washington State. After my service, I was a Forest Service firefighter and disaster response contractor. Suffice to say, I'm very experienced in outdoors, professionally trained. In 2009, I was hiking in the Weyerhaeuser Forest Reserve near Ofut Lake in western Washington State. The preserve was adjacent to the home of a buddy's father, and before setting off into the lumber preserve, his father had implored for me not to go hiking in there alone, as it was a very dangerous area and a very frightening area. He had lived there for 30 years and refused to let his kids to ever step foot into the forest. Being a young, confident ranger, I laughed off his superstition and headed out into the virgin forest. It was an unusually hot and humid day in late spring, and I was armed with a Glock 19 9mm pistol and feeling very capable and competent. 
I had made it about three miles into the forest and came to a massive bowl section of perfectly manicured pine forest with no undergrowth, just tan spruce pine needle bed as far as the eye could see. It looked like I was stepping down into a forest bowl the size of a modern football stadium. I got about halfway down the bowl and literally every sound in the forest became totally deafeningly silent all in an instant. It was as though I had stepped into a soundproof studio room in one step. No bugs, no wind, no ambient sound, nothing. By this time, I had been to combat twice and graduated ranger school and was a pretty salty individual, but I'm not ashamed to admit that I was overcome with a feeling of fear, dread, deep, guttural, paralyzing fear. I gathered myself together and turned around and practically ran the entire way back to Curtis's father's house, got in my truck and left, and never went back. I've spent years thinking about what happened in those woods, and to this day I have no answers. I was completely sober, fully aware of my surroundings, and in good spirits and health at the time of this incident, with no mental, physical, or psychological issues. I can't say what the incident was caused by but I have never been so deeply in fear in my life. Even thinking about it now, over a decade later, makes me feel uneasy, as though whatever was in that forest is still there. All this I swear on my scroll to be true. My old roommate's dad was a formal naval officer and then FBI agent. 20 years in the Navy and 12 to 15 years or so in the FBI. One of his strangest stories was from his FBI days. I'll paraphrase it below. A kidnapping case. This girl disappeared from her grandparents' RV sometime between like 5 p.m. and midnight. They were up front. Next thing they know, she's gone. She was supposed to be sleeping in the back. One stop at a rest stop. Then they were in stop and go traffic, so they figured that she must have popped out the door at some point. This is near the California Nevada border, so we meet them, talk to them. This is within about a day or so, and the girl's still missing. No sign of her. She was only 15. Local police department theory is that she ran off because she's 15 and wants to get away from her lame grandparents for the summer. But there's a busted window, glass inside the vehicle so we're treating it like a possible kidnapped person. After a few hours, there's a couple different theories on the case. One is that she ran off. Another that she got snatched. Nobody's seen the girl in almost two days now, and disappearing in the desert for a young girl is tough. Next thing you know, we get a phone call. Naked girl lost and confused, picked up by some trucker on a two-lane road out there called Nipton. Runs into I-15 between Barstow and Vegas somewhere, right near the border. Matches our description. Me and three other guys head out there to meet with the sheriff who's got her. Turns out, she's our girl. She's fine. No R word. No bruises. No exposure. Nothing. Completely healthy. Completely fine. Even clean like she took a shower. Won't tell us a dang thing. Doesn't remember anything. According to her, one minute she's in the RV. The next, she's naked walking down the side of the road in 100 degree heat. We talked to her for two hours while her grandparents headed out to pick her up. We had our social services lady talk to her. Nothing. I've seen people hiding things. She wasn't hiding anything. She honestly didn't remember. It was the weirdest thing. Anyway, girl was found. She was fine. So we turned it back over to our local PD to figure out what happened and determine if charges were pressed and all. I kept in touch with a guy I knew there because I was curious and we were in a fantasy football league. A few months later, he tells me the parents sent the girl to a therapist to look for repressed memories to make sure that she wasn't R-worded or anything. Therapist said that she seems fine, but honestly has no recollection of her time at all and doesn't think that there's any point to delving much further since she has no symptoms and is largely more confused by the reaction than the event. So to this day, we've got a busted RV window with glass on the inside, likely from a moving RV on a jam-packed freeway, likely in broad or lightly fading sunlight, with zero witnesses. A 15-year-old girl gets out, or is taken out, and is taken somewhere safe nearby for almost two days, 
and then is stripped naked without being touched sexually, cleaned up and deposited on the side of a separate road a few miles away. She didn't have a drug in her system that we could detect. She remembers nothing at all. Nobody knows what happened to her clothes or anything. Been almost 20 years since this happened, and I can't figure out what the hell went on with this girl. Still bugs me at night that I have no way to explain it, aside from she lied the whole time. But I know liars, and I'd bet money that she wasn't lying at all. I arrived to work at 6 a.m. I finished work at 10 p.m. the previous night and ended up running into an assault on an old man on the way home. My commute was about an hour, so instead of getting home at 11 p.m., I get home at around 11.45 p.m. I have a quick bite with my wife and get to bed around midnight to 12.30, up at 4.15 and back into work. At about 6.15, I'm on station duties and a man comes in and says that he thinks his wife is missing. He's very sketchy on details, and I'm just having to drag information out of him. Essentially, they had a fight. She stormed out and didn't come home that night. I check her in the system, and she's a respondent for a couple of DV orders. I dig a little deeper, and I discover that they are actually against her son rather than her husband. I'm very, very tired and a little bit cranky. I look at the bare information I have and send the chap home to wait for his wife. I check the hospitals, our own system to make sure that she hasn't been arrested, and local fire and ambulance services. Nothing. I circulate her details to all units in the city and record the incident. I've done enough to cover my butt and technically there isn't actually anything else for me to do for a while. I go and get a cup of coffee and all I want to do is go to sleep, but something didn't set right with me. I was suspicious of her husband. He seemed like he was hiding something. I went down to my skipper and asked him if I could go to the house and have a look around and maybe talk to the husband again. The skipper isn't delighted about it, because it means he'll have to cover the desk while we're short-staffed, but he agrees like a trooper and off I jolly well trot. I arrive at the house and talk to the husband again and ask him if I can have a look around. There might be something that might shed some light on where she might have gone. I have a scout around the house and find several containers of pills with weird names. A quick Google later, and I discover that this woman appears to be on a cocktail of antidepressants, mood stabilizers, and some other stuff. Oh, and I found an insulin kit. I ask her husband about these, and he mentions that his wife has had some emotional problems, but that he didn't think it was relevant. I set him down and put it to him that there's a lot of medication here, and does his wife have more than one insulin kit? He goes pale at that point. She left all her medication at home. I ask him where she keeps her purse, and we end up checking her bedside locker. Her purse is missing, but I snag a framed picture for future reference. I have no idea what this woman looks like, and I ask her husband if I can search the room. He's beginning to break down at this point, and tells me that I can do whatever I please, and storms off down to the living room. I'm feeling distinctly queasy at this point to say nothing of a banging headache from sleep deprivation. I don't find any suspicious holes in the wardrobe where she might have taken clothes, any secret stashes of cash or drugs. I don't know what possessed me to do it, but I searched the bed. I turned over his pillow and there's a note under it, and it's a self-unaliving note, explaining in no uncertain terms that the missing person is intending to end her life and that she can't go on and that she's sorry for being a burden. I radio the station and update them. I then have to walk down to the living room and tell this woman's husband that he had been sleeping on her self unaliving note overnight and never noticed. That was probably one of the hardest things I've ever been called upon to do, bar dealing with dead children. I found her eventually, though it took another eight hours. We pinged her phone to a nearby town, but that just gave us a general locality. I put the town to her husband, but he said that she didn't have any friends or family there. After 15 minutes later, he calls me back and tells me that they've spent a weekend there shortly after they got married. I call the hotel they stayed in on that occasion, but they've no one by that name. I went down in person and showed them the picture, and the lady at the desk told me that a guest answering that description had just left off for a walk on the pier. I went out to the pier and found her, and we had a bit of a chat. 
nothing dramatic. She told me I looked awful, and I said that I was just very tired. I asked her to give life a chance for a few more days, that her husband loved her and that she wasn't a burden. She agreed and we brought her home. A couple of days later, she came to the station with a box of chocolates and a card that read, Thank you for not letting me unalive myself. When I realized how close I had been to just letting the matter rest because I had ticked all the boxes on the list, I went to the toilet at the back of the station and threw up for what felt like an hour. She sends me the same card every Christmas. In the fall of 1998, I went to Somerset, Vermont to go camping along the Somerset River. A forest road runs up to an airfield with free dispersed campsites. It was first come, first served, and in the summertime, it would be packed with all kids partying and living their best lives. Still, my girlfriend and I planned this trip in the fall because the fall leaves in Vermont are something special to see, and we knew the campground would be empty in the middle of the work week during the off-season. I set up our tent, and we walked around the woods down to the river and just enjoyed the season's natural beauty. We lay in the tent, talking as the sun went down and drifted off to sleep. Sometime in the night, I woke up to two voices outside the tent. It sounded like two men whispering to each other, but it wasn't in English. I couldn't distinguish what they were saying, but I distinctly heard two male voices. Suddenly, there was a long, low whistle from off in the distance and I heard one of the men make a click sound in acknowledgement. Everything was quiet after that. I waited until sunrise and went outside the tent and looked around. I didn't see anyone. My heart was pounding in my chest, and I was wide awake. I woke my girlfriend up and we left. I still wonder where those guys came from, and why they used whistling and clicking sounds to communicate. The Somerset campground is far off the beaten path, and I didn't hear or see any signs of a vehicle. Rural Vermont has a lot of strange legends and folklore. Years after this happened, I learned about the Bennington Triangle and the disappearances of people in the 1950s. I left the state and I joined the army a few months later. I've only been back to Vermont a few times since then, but I never camped there again. I came here, hoping anyone could share similar experiences or give insight. I took a trip to stay in a cabin in the middle of the woods high up in the mountains in the city of Ranger, Georgia, USA. This neighborhood was 30 minutes up in the mountains, away from civilization, and even the cabins were spread far apart. The front deck of the cabin was completely exposed to the woods, so I acknowledged that any animals could stroll along if they pleased. But I stayed there for about a week and me and my boyfriend sat outside on the front deck every night, very late, and at no point felt in danger. It was peaceful with fireflies out and sounds of crickets every night. Until the fifth night. It was eerily dark too. The moon was covered heavily. It was about midnight, and all of a sudden I didn't feel peace like I did those other nights. The forest went completely quiet, and I felt a horrible sense of dread. I genuinely feared for my life. I sat there in my chair looking out into the dark forest trying to rationalize and calm myself down that it was just my mind playing tricks. But all of a sudden, my boyfriend said out loud that he also felt unsafe. That's when I realized it wasn't just me. We then both heard a blood-curdling scream, and we pulled out a flashlight to see what it was. Turns out it was a gray fox. They make scary screaming sounds. The weird part was that the fox was just running and had its ears and tails down like it was scared. This was in June, and I read that foxes scream like that when it's mating season or if they're in danger. Their mating season is winter, and this happened in June, so I do believe that this fox was in danger or afraid, as well, adding to our fear. The cabin has three floors, and we were able to climb out the window and sit on the roof because we wanted to still be outside and relax. Didn't matter how high up I was, I felt something truly evil and stayed inside. The only other time I felt something so evil 
or like someone was watching me was when I had a few paranormal experiences at a haunted house. Georgia doesn't really get mountain lions that often. Maybe a bear, but it didn't feel that way at all. It just felt so unnatural. I've been a cop for a while now, and this is one of the calls that still haunts me. I get a call for a domestic assault that had just occurred, and I learn that the victim is at the neighbor's house. I get there and find the female victim's throat had been cut from ear to ear. The neighbor is holding a towel up to her slit throat, and the victim is struggling to breathe. The paramedics are on their way, and I take over holding the towel for the neighbor. I'm trying to apply enough pressure to reduce the bleeding, but not so much pressure that I'm strangling her. It was a delicate balance. Quick law lesson. You know that there are laws against hearsay, right? Basically, I can't testify in court about the events that someone else told me about that I didn't witness personally. The person who witnessed it would have to testify to it. One of the exceptions is what's known as the dying declaration. If someone is on their deathbed and believes that they are about to die, their statements are exempt from the hearsay rules. I have some serious doubts that this woman is going to live. I want to ask her who slit her throat. In order for it to qualify as a dying declaration, I need to be able to testify that she believed she was about to die. So I asked her two questions. The first was, who cut your throat? Which she answered. The second was, do you realize that you may be about to die? Which she answered yes. Our eyes were locked and I still remember the emptiness. Within a few minutes, the medic showed up and my partner and I went next door to look for the suspect. The door was ajar, and we could hear a baby screaming upstairs. We went in with guns drawn, and the metallic smell of blood was overpowering. We made our way upstairs, past smeared bloody handprints on the walls, and found the child upstairs. He was unharmed, and the suspect was long gone. Thanks to the excellent performance of the medical staff, the victim survived. I met with her a couple of weeks later, and I was very apprehensive to speak with her again. I had basically looked at her and told her that she was going to die. When she opened the door, I could tell that she didn't recognize me. She had very little memory of what happened after she was assaulted. I told her who I was and she hugged me, crying, and she thanked me for saving her life. The suspect ended up pleading guilty, so I never had to testify as to what I had told the victim that night. And it still haunts me, to this day. The scariest call that I've ever had was a medical call involving a three-year-old girl. The first department I worked for required all officers to be first responder certified. Basic medical training, not enough to be an EMT or medic, but above first aid. We would normally respond to medical calls until the EMTs arrived just to secure the scene. This particular call came out as a three-year-old girl having a seizure. The location of the call was at a large hotel slash resort. I worked at the beach. The closest vehicle access was the front entrance, and I had to go on foot to the actual room. When I pulled up to the front, dispatch upgraded the call and informed the girl had just gone into cardiac arrest. I started running to the room, which was nowhere near the front of the hotel, and after finding it, the family was in complete hysterics. I saw the little girl on the ground in the kitchen, who was still seizing. However, I could see that she was turning blue in the face. The mom grabbed me and started screaming for me to save her daughter. I hadn't performed CPR since the academy. I told the mom and everyone to go out into the hallway and for someone to run to the front to guide the EMTs when they arrived. Suddenly, it was now just me and the girl in the room. The gravity of the situation suddenly hit me. There was no way that EMS would get there in time to help her. I paused for about 10 seconds and just tried to collect myself. Or froze up, I don't know. It's cliche, but those 10 seconds felt like an absolute eternity. Somehow I snapped out of it and began CPR. Amazingly, with the first compression, she suddenly let out a giant cough and started to breathe again. I've been a police officer for five years now, 
responded to countless fatal wrecks, shootings, stabbings, murder scenes, etc. But nothing was as scary as sitting there on the floor next to that girl, knowing that if I didn't do something, she was going to die. My dad told me this story. He said it happened to him his first year as a cop. He was on patrol just like any other day when he got a call from the base. He liked to call it that. He needed to go to where a 911 call was dialed about a mile away. It was a kidnapping. He gets there and pulls up behind a green van sitting in the ditch and approaches it with his gun drawn. He opens the door and the first thing he sees is a guy in his 40s and a blood-soaked shirt with blood still seeping from his neck. There were multiple stab wounds. He looks to the back of the van where he sees the kid, hands on his face, covered in blood and crying with a Swiss army knife on the floor. You can imagine what went down. Sure enough, the kid was being hauled away in the van, tied up with a nylon bungee cord, when he remembered that he had his three inch blade pocket knife. So he cut himself free and stabbed the kidnapper nine times in total in the chest and neck while he was driving. After my dad called it in, he stayed with the kid who was still sobbing while repeating, I killed him. I effing killed him. He was going to take me away and arm me. So I killed him. When I was 11, I moved to a rather large city due to my dad getting transferred at his work. Before that, I lived in a relatively small town, known for its smelly garbage dump. I loved that town with all of my heart, and I still love it even today. But this experience shattered my little kid illusion that it was safe, and nothing bad could ever happen to anyone. I lived in a very close-knit neighborhood, where all the parents knew each other, and all of the kids were friends. At the end of my street has a small, half-built house that became sort of the neighborhood hangout. It had been abandoned during its construction for unknown reasons, and it sat there for nearly two years before we all decided that it was the perfect clubhouse. All of the kids would walk home from school together, stop in to tell their parents where they were going, and then head down to the house. One Saturday, I went across the street to my friend's house and asked if she wanted to go to the clubhouse with me. She said she was eating lunch, but she'd meet me there as soon as she was done. I was only seven at the time but my parents trusted me enough not to get into any trouble or run off somewhere, so I headed down to the house to wait. I was sitting on the front steps of the house when a white car with very darkly tinted windows pulled up to the curb. To my young mind, it looked exactly like a police car without any lights or indicators on it, so I thought they were undercover. I was seven, cut me some slack. The driver of the car rolled down the passenger window and leaned over the seat, and I could see that he was wearing a police officer's uniform and aviator sunglasses. He waved me over and, not wanting to make the cop angry, I approached the passenger side of the car. Hey there, you think you could help me with something? He asked me. He seemed nice enough, so I told him that I'd try. He went on to show me a picture of a little girl that I'd never seen before and asked if I knew her. I shook my head, and he told me that she was missing and that her parents really wanted her back, but he was having trouble finding her. At that point, my friend from earlier, Anna, showed up. The guy asked Anna if she had seen the little girl, but she had neither. He then seemed to get really sad and shook his head and said, I just really wish I could find her. Do you two want to help me look? If you get in my car, we can drive around and see if we can find her. To me, that sounded awesome, and I threw all notions of stranger danger out the window. I'd never been in a police car before and thought I'd have the time of my life. But Anna seemed to have her head on right and politely declined. This visibly upset the guy and he got really angry, telling us that he'd arrest us if we didn't get in his car and help him. Anna and I both started freaking out, and we booked it back to my house when the guy reached into his glove box and pulled out a set of handcuffs. He sped off as soon as we started running. At that point, we were both crying, but we managed to get to my house and tell my mom what happened. She immediately called the police and asked if they had an officer patrolling in our neighborhood, but they didn't. So the real cops showed up to my house and asked me and Anna a ton of questions, and I realized that the scary guy's police uniform was way off. 
They tried to get a description from us, but he was wearing a hat and sunglasses that blocked most of his face, so it didn't really amount to much. We were, however, able to provide a description of the little girl in the picture. As far as I know, nothing happened with the guy. I've tried searching for any news articles, but I haven't found anything. The description we gave of the little girl didn't match any missing people within a hundred mile radius of our town, so nothing came of that either. After that, none of the kids in my neighborhood were allowed to go to the clubhouse or be outside without at least one adult supervising us. About three months ago, I posted my experience backpacking in the Allegheny National Forest and hearing drumming, which I am chalking up to actual people banging on drums now. This weekend, we returned to the same trail system, Minister Creek. We set up camp at a different site about three miles north of where we stayed the last time. The evening was uneventful and we went to bed in individual tents around 9.30. At about 2.30 a.m., we were woken up by a huge boom. It wasn't a gunshot, sounded more like a black powder cannon going off, echoed throughout the valley. We came out of our tents and discussed what we had all heard, a little on edge since it was so close to us, but eventually tried going back to sleep. The boom really has nothing to do with what happened later, but it was just a weird night. As I'm laying in my tent unable to sleep staring at the ceiling, I kept seeing shadows on the tent walls. I would swear I'd see a silhouette of a person walking towards the tent. But as soon as I'd look at it, it would disappear as quickly as I noticed it. I decide that I'm just seeing things and close my eyes, eventually falling asleep. Next thing I know, I'm being woken up by a young-sounding female voice saying, Dad, Dad, Dad. I jolt awake, unsure I actually just heard this. So I'm just laying there. I check my watch, which says 5.13 a.m. Wide awake at this time. And about 30 seconds later, right next to my tent, I hear very urgently, Dad? Dad? There was something off about the voice too. It was just creepy. I got major, major chills, like nothing I've ever experienced. Now A, my daughter didn't come with us. And B, there were no females in our small group. It's pitch black out. I see no flashlights. No more light from the fire. I'm trying to rationalize what I'm hearing and set up in my tent thinking maybe a camper from another site wandered into our site thinking that she was at her dad's tent. I unzip my tent, shine my flashlight out, and catch a glimpse of a black bear walking off into the woods. I uncontrollably at that point let out a huge OF, waking up the rest of my group. Bear didn't care and just walked off into the darkness. So of course we were searching around with our flashlights and find nobody else around us. This whole experience was just crazy. What did I hear? Do black bears make noises that sound like a girl calling for her dad? Was it a ghost warning me that there was a bear in our campsite? A guardian angel? Or did I have some sleep disorder induced auditory hallucination that just so happened to perfectly coincide with a black bear roaming through our camp? Either way, both of my experiences overnight backpacking in the Allegheny National Forests has been pretty weird. I'm not a cop, but my coworker's father is, and he hit me with this whopper of a story once. For some background reference, I live in Austin, and all of these occurrences were within the Austin Police Department and happened in 1978. An APD officer pulled over a blue Mustang for not having a rear license plate, a man and a woman inside. The officer tries to run the couple through dispatch, but the system is down, so he lets them go with a citation. After letting them go, however, Dispatch let him know that the man has an outstanding warrant. The officer pulled the couple back over, and the man, David Lee Powell, knew his arrest was imminent. Crawling into the back seat, he loaded his AK-47 and opened fire as the officer approached. Mortally wounded, the officer called for backup before dying on the side of the road. Officer Villagas, my coworker's father, hears on the radio that an officer is down only eight blocks away and takes off straight for where he thinks the killer is headed. 
the highway. Before arriving, however, he finds a blue Mustang in an apartment complex parking lot, with its lights off cruising at a really low speed. He peels into the parking lot, blocking the only exit off and called for backup. Then a storm of bullets pound his police car, some from Powell's AK-47, some from his lady accomplice's pistol. As they're exchanging fire, Powell hurls a small oval-sized object towards the front of Officer Villagas's police cruiser. To the officer's horror, it was a hand grenade, and he was sure that death was imminent. He explained his last thought being of his wife and kids, and how he is so sad that he wouldn't be able to see them again, and that being the scariest moment in his 38 years on the force. But the grenade didn't go off, and Powell and his lady friend were out of ammo. As backup arrived, Powell took off behind the apartment complex into the woods, whereas the lady accomplice attempted to hide in a ditch. Seeing her in the ditch attempting to reload, Officer Villagas ran up to her and kicked her square in the face, shattering her jaw. Powell was later caught in the woods after a manhunt and received the death penalty for his actions that day. I'm keeping some of these details vague because I seriously don't want the host to find out that I published this story. I don't think they would approve. I hope that's all right and I'll still try to make it as comprehensive as possible. I spent a year studying in Mexico recently and as you do on exchange, I tried to travel as much as I could. Between the semesters, there's a big break and me and my buddy that I spent the most time with during the exchange decided we'd go on a longer backpacking trip through Mexico together. We had a rough plan on where to go and what we wanted to see, but we hadn't even booked our flight back yet, nor were we sure from where we would take it from. We wanted to keep it flexible. We had an amazing time, and a few days before our trip ended, we finally described we would take our flight from a city that was close and really cheap flights, but the city itself didn't really have anything to offer. Then, on Airbnb, we found a room very close to the airport, in a house with a pool, and we thought we'd just treat ourselves to a relaxed pool day at the end of the trip. It turned out that the hosts were a family, the husband was Mexican, and the wife was from Europe and could even speak our native language. So we arranged that we would take a bus to the airport, and that they would pick us up from there. When we had finally arrived at the city, it was already dark, and the bus driver refused to take us to the airport, since it was not directly on his route so he just dropped us off on the highway. That was already a pretty crappy situation to begin with, standing with our backpacks at the side of the road in the middle of nowhere in a not-so-safe city in Mexico. But I called the hosts and sent them our GPS location and they say no problem, they'll come and get us. So the husband came to pick us up and it was a very uncomfortable situation getting into a car with a stranger in the night in the middle of nowhere. It also didn't help that the guy looked like Danny Trejo without a mustache, and as I tried to make small talk with him, he only gave monosyllabic answers or straight out ignored me. Well, he's just not a big talker, I thought, and I hoped that we would arrive soon. Looking back, I can see a million red flags, but for some reason, at that time, we just didn't see them. Either we were too tired or, to be honest, we didn't really have any other choice than going along anyway. But yes, we arrive, and that should have immediately set alarms off. We were in the middle of effing nowhere. There were fields with sheep and goats around, and all of a sudden, a gravel road branches off from the paved road, and along that gravel road, there are about six huge mansions, all with two-meter walls around them, topped with NATO fence, huge gates, and at least two gigantic guard dogs per house. When we entered the house, we were greeted by the wife, a bubbly middle-aged woman that was very talkative but pleasant. She had actually cooked dinner for us, and we ate while exchanging small talk. The husband just sat at the table not saying a single word. After dinner, we more or less went directly to bed because it had gotten late, and we were tired from a long day. The next morning, we saw that the weather was not that good. So we decided to go into the town and just see the few touristy things it had to offer instead of spending it at the pool. 
When we came back, it was already dark, but we decided to just jump into the pool anyways to cool off because it was very hot and humid. The wife joined us, and at some point, my friend made the mistake of asking how they were able to afford such a house. It didn't really match the price range of the jobs they were telling us that they were doing, and she just deflected a bit and added that her husband was very handy because he had grown up in the streets, and basically he built the house himself. We realized that it maybe was not the best topic and just broke the conversation off. That was the last day of our trip and we had our flight back home early the next morning. We still had some weed left that we had bought on the trip, and we thought it would be nice to smoke one out since it was our last night. But as this was a family home and they had kids around, we thought it would be better to speak to our hosts and ask if they would mind. So later in the evening, we asked the wife if it would be okay if we smoked on the terrace, which for some reason she found quite amusing and started laughing. She shouted to her husband who was lying on the couch watching TV, My love, the boys ask if it would be okay if they smoke some weed. What do you think? And he just laughed but didn't give an answer. We looked at her with a dumbfounded expression and she told us, sure, just go ahead. So we went to the terrace and started smoking our joint. Later they joined us and we just had a chat. And this is where things start to really get messed up. For some reason, they start asking all sorts of questions about the weed, where we got it, how much it was, who we got it from, and how much we would have to pay for that back in Europe. They just seemed way too interested in the weed, and at one point the wife just nonchalantly revealed to us, yes, we thought about doing that as a source of income, selling weed, but too many people die doing that because the cartels don't like it. Actually, my husband used to kill people for doing that. I immediately felt sober. Did she just say, and as if he read my mind, her husband added, yes, when I was about 16. I killed a lot of people for the cartel for money. And he just said it in a tone as if he just said that he used to mow lawns when he was a teenager. I still thought that I must have misunderstood. So I texted my friend who was sitting across the table from me, trying to not make eye contact. Because I knew that we would freak each other out. He confirmed that I had indeed understood right. We discussed what we should do and agree that there's no immediate threat and that we should just stay. We don't have anywhere else to go anyways, and it's already late. But things got even crazier. We tried to keep our composure and not completely freak out while still making conversation with our hosts. A few minutes later, though, the husband got up and went inside to get something, and he came back with a literal kilo of weed, pressed into a brick. He proceeded to break bits off the brick and roll them into a joint. That would probably have knocked out Snoop Dogg. It was about the size of my thumb, and I guess it had about two grams of weed in there. Of course, he offered the joint to us, but we politely declined, saying that we were already pretty stoned. He seemed a little offended, but fortunately he bought our excuse. But it got even worse. A few minutes later, we hear a couple of loud bangs. The wife became a bit uneasy and asked, what was that? To which he answered calmly, nine millimeters, to confirm my suspicion that that had indeed been shots. I would say it was around seven or something shots, fired pretty quickly after each other. The wife got nervous and asked if we should maybe go inside, and what do you think they are shooting at in the air? At cows? At people? But he just shrugged it off and we stayed outside. Again, a few minutes later there were more shots, this time even closer. The wife got even more upset and asked again, should we maybe go inside? What do you think they're shooting at? Should we go inside? And I think I will never forget when he answered in the calmest way imaginable. No, everything's okay. I didn't hear any screams yet. I don't know why, but the way he just calmly said that freaked me the F out and is still making my heart beat whenever I think about it. After that, we quickly excused ourselves and went to our room. When we finally could talk, we basically both lost it and panicked. What were we supposed to do? We were locked in a house with a contract killer in the middle of absolutely effing nowhere, and people are shooting outside. We decided it was probably our best bet to stay, because we thought, well, we're his guests. He's not going to harm us. Hopefully. And it's better to have walls and dogs, and a serial killer, in between us and people shooting around. So we barricaded ourselves in the room, and didn't sleep a second until the morning, when we noped the F out of there and went to the airport. I was never so happy to 
to be patted down at security in my whole life. This is my first post ever, so sorry if it's worded weird or the formatting is off. So me and my boyfriend, his best friend, and his girlfriend drove up to the Big Bear 626. Then a day later, another friend of ours drove up 627, and he was supposed to sleep downstairs and couples sleep upstairs, since there's only two bedrooms. The first night we stayed there it was kind of creepy, because the cabin was pretty remote and of course there's absolutely no lights outside. It is the woods with coyotes howling and bears, but nonetheless completely normal activity. On the 27th, around 12 a.m., my boyfriend and I are in bed, when suddenly our friend sleeping downstairs comes banging on the door, freaking out, saying he saw shadows in the woods, and that the motion light came on and there was thumping outside. We got a little freaked out, but my boyfriend gets out of bed to check the entire cabin, and even goes outside. Nothing. We go up to the other couple's room, where there's a porch with sliding glass door that looks out to the woods. It's important to note that I'm a naturally very anxious and scared person, while my boyfriend is a rock. He's calm and logical, while I tend to jump to the worst scenario. My boyfriend goes over to check the last place in the cabin, so he pulls the curtain and jumps and yells, Oh my god. At this point, I'm terrified. My boyfriend is 180 pounds, and he's a CrossFit coach, and to see a big guy like that scared is nauseating. He locked the door and backed away slowly. He quietly says, There's a large man standing outside staring at us. He's just standing in the woods looking at us. At this point, I'm thinking he's messing with me. He looks at me and says, Go lock the door. That's when I knew he was serious. Everyone is freaking out. I run and lock the door behind us, and we all decide to stay in the room to keep an eye out. It's the middle of summer, and it's really hot, but we refuse to open a window. I'm so scared, but trying not to show it, as everyone else seemed to have calmed down. About 30 minutes go by, and nothing happens. I get annoyed with the heat, and the fact that there's five people in a tiny room, and three of them are men, so my boyfriend and I go back to our room. I'm still pretty spooked, so my boyfriend tries to cheer me up. At this point, it's about 1.30 a.m. I told him I was too scared to sleep with the lights off. He tells me that's totally fine, and he understands so we just lay with the lights completely on. Finally, I start drifting to sleep when I hear a thud. I set up and look at my boyfriend. He looks back at me. Then the power cuts. I immediately start sobbing. I'm trembling, and I can't see anything because it's pitch black. I try to get out of bed and run, but my legs get tangled in the sheets and I fall. My boyfriend picks me up and we grab our phone and run to the other room where everyone else is staying. I'm hysterical at this point. I try to contact our host, but nothing will go through. I try to call my dad, but all of our phones say no service. We are alone out there. Thank God the friend who drove up after us had a different carrier, because his phone had one bar. So he calls the local sheriff. I realize now it's a bit of an overreaction, but at the time we thought we were going to die. He's on the phone with the sheriff, and they transfer us to the utilities company. We give the address and they tell us that we were too far in the woods and they don't cover that area. At this point, we're wondering if the entire area has no power or if the man outside had just cut our power. I cry more, and we call 911 to report suspicious activity and a power outage. They send the fire department. A few hours go by and it's 3 a.m. and suddenly the power comes back on. We fall asleep, and the next day we talk to some of the locals of the area. We told them our power went out. And they said that was strange, because that shouldn't have happened. He told us the only reason that happens out here is because of a snowstorm. He said he couldn't explain it. When I was eight, we moved to a military housing adjacent to the big base. I was a weird child and spent a lot of time in my tree reading, if I wasn't out with the local hooligans playing in boxes like overgrown cats. There was a pomegranate bush in our backyard, 
so I would eat one while lounging on a thick branch with an R.L. Stein novel. I kept noticing this guy walking back and forth on multiple occasions, but who was I to judge what an adult does? I was home alone one day, so I stayed in my backyard while reading in the shade of an overgrown bush, but still visible to passers-by. That same guy was looking around our backyard that faced tennis courts and open desert wilderness. He starts casually trying to lift the gate hatch, so I ran inside and locked the doors. I told my parents later on, and they listened but thought I was being dramatic. About a week later, I was at my friend's house with three other girls. We were in bathing suits playing in hose water in a mini pool, trying to find relief from the sweltering heat. My friend's house faced a large park, and one of them noticed this guy watching us. Someone went in to tell their parents, but the guy must have noticed us all, going from wild animals to a small circle with little animation. My friend's mother was from Korea and ran out with a wooden spoon, yelling in rage Korean. She chased after the already retreating lurker but gave up, locked us inside and called the base police. I told them about the lurker, but I couldn't be sure it was the same one. The mother noticed he had a camera with him. It was the 90s. We ate Keebler cookies, vanilla with fudge in the middle, while her mother sobbed to the police. Trafficking is a more tangible fear for some than others. Base police called my parents, and they finally took me seriously. The house was searched, which I thought was just normal protocol. I was heavily monitored by them and not able to do much without my mother in arm's reach. One day, about a week or so later, we were eating lunch at a fast food place and I recognized the guy. I tell my dad, and he asked me if I was sure, and when I confirmed, he lunged at the guy and threw him back in his chair. Base cops came and looked through his camera to find pictures of me with my friends and at recess. He was arrested immediately. The weirdest part about it, he had broken into our house and made some rat's nest, I assume, of my things in his room. They found everything from baby pictures to clothing. Worst part about it, there were no charges because my dad was about to retire and get a big job in Michigan. He was also high ranking, which probably had nothing to do with it. When talking to my mom about it years later, she told me he had accessed our attic and cut through the AC vent to watch me through it. That would explain why my room was always hot, but now I wonder if she's the one being dramatic. And yes, this story is true to the best of my recollection. This happened to my dad back when he was stationed at Ofut Air Base in Nebraska in the early 80s. He lived in the dorm not that far from a guy named John, a radar tech who was the same age as him. Dad never really talked to him, but had seen him around. Said he was no one special. Didn't particularly stand out to him. Just another young guy like himself. Then in January of 1984, there was a lot of activity in the dorm with John, and my dad saw him leaving with the authorities. Didn't take long to learn why. John had murdered three people. One while living in Maine, two while stationed in Nebraska. Other names for the man, John Jobert, are the Nebraska Boy Snatcher and the Woodford Slasher. Turns out, he was a screwed up guy for a while, having first stabbed someone when he was 13 and attacked several others before he first killed. Yet, he got in the military at the same time as my dad. Goes to show how ordinary everyone seems when you don't truly know the people working around you. More than 10 years ago, I had to take a semester off school because I, a 35-year-old male, owed the university housing department money from the previous year and I couldn't afford to pay that atop my regular tuition. My summer job had come to an end, and I needed to find something quick to start saving up so that I could return to school in the winter. Fortunately, my friend's dad had an opening at the shipping warehouse that he worked in, and he offered me the job, understanding it would only be for just a few months. 
It was a pretty easy gig, and I was doing pretty well at it. Enough so that the direct management team had started trying to convince me to stick around part-time, even after I went back to school. I was considering it too, until my supervisor quit and was soon replaced by a guy that we'll call Jake. Jake seemed like a pretty friendly and outgoing guy. He was quite a bit larger than me, but he seemed like a pretty gentle person at first. He had just left the military and seemed excited to be back home with his wife and two kids. He took a liking to me too, and was constantly praising my work ethic. Then things started to get weird. One day, Jake seemed stressed out and said his kids had been acting up at home. I wasn't a parent yet myself, so I asked him what was up and just generally how he dealt with that. He joked and said something like, The best way is just to kill the oldest one and keep their skull on your desk. That way, whenever the younger siblings act up, you can point to the skull and remind them to get back in line. He said it in such a tongue-in-cheek, obviously joking kind of way, but it sent shivers down my spine. I tried telling myself that he just had a dark sense of humor, but I never looked at him the same way after that. A week or so later, he invited a bunch of us over to his house for dinner after work. I wasn't super keen on attending, but I felt pressured into going, so I tagged along with a coworker. While there, Jake, who I'd learned wasn't just ex-military, but apparently was in one of the special forces of some branch or another, showed off his collection of knives, noting that one had a notch in the tip from where the knife had broken when he stabbed an enemy combatant with it. At work, Jake started bringing in a USB drive full of pictures of his confirmed kills from his time in the military, and he'd show them to anyone and everyone who seemed interested. I flat out refused to look at them, but many of my coworkers seemed interested, which left me feeling like I definitely didn't want to be there much longer, and also like I couldn't go to HR and be the one guy who snitched on Jake. Honestly, I was young, stupid, but also scared of what he might do. I quit not long afterward, however, and I briefly mentioned to my friend's dad as I left that Jake was one of the factors that led to my decision. A few weeks later, I learned that Jake had been terminated and escorted off the premises by police when, after a local shopping mall had experienced a shooting that garnered national attention, he joked about recreating the event right there at the warehouse. I wanted to share this story to warn people, but it's not necessarily a creepy encounter. Just sort of a story that is weird and freaked me out. Please delete if it's irrelevant, but I do not know where else to post to warn people. I'm traveling around the country in my car. I've been driving for over a week from the city I lived in and have so far slept in my car to save money. It wasn't until I got to a big enough city that I decided to treat myself to an actual bed that would be comfortable. I opted to choose Airbnb because it's cheaper than hotels. I booked this Airbnb the day before I arrived to the city, so there weren't many options left. I had found this apartment on Airbnb that looked very new and modern, and it was in a great location. The price was decent for its location, and it almost seemed too good to be true. The only downfall was that it was listed as a new listing and had zero reviews. I figured that the price was low because it was a new listing, and I decided to give it a shot. Must be legit because it's Airbnb, right? When I got to the apartment building, it was older looking than I had expected. I later found out slash realized that my Airbnb was most likely the only renovated apartment in the building, and the building seemed to be in poor condition. It looked more like a dorm hall rather than an apartment building. Anyway, I let it all slide because I wasn't paying too much, so what could I expect? The apartment itself looked like the pics, so that was good enough. Everything went well for the first two days. As a female traveling alone, I always make sure to be safe. I don't go out when it's dark, and I always lock the door. Every single lock, including the chain thing. Anyways, on the third day I was out all morning, and came back to the apartment to change to head to the beach. I had again locked the door, including the chain. I was in front of the door watching TV while changing, when the door suddenly unlocks and someone opens the door. I am beyond lucky that I had put the chain lock on the door, or else it would have opened all the way. I was naked and no one else was supposed to have the keys. My first reaction was, excuse me? 
and I closed the door right away, locking it again. I came from the back of the door and did not look slash see who was opening it. I sat in front of the door, scared and shocked, realizing that this person could technically still get in here since they obviously have the keys to the apartment. At first, I thought maybe it was the owner coming back after I checked out, but I was not supposed to check out until the following day, so that wasn't possible. After crying for a few more minutes, I recuperated myself and called the owner and told her what had happened. She told me that no one else should have a set of keys other than her and I, and that she's at work and it was not her. I was scared to stay in the apartment because someone could come in. I didn't want to leave because I had all of my valuables there. It was a lose-lose situation. I then called my dad, who told me that it was not okay that someone has the keys and that she needs to take care of this as soon as possible. So he talked to her, and she told me that she will be there shortly with a locksmith to change it and give me a new pair of keys. She then proceeded to tell me that she had only had this apartment for six months and that before I stayed there, there was only one other Airbnb booking. She also mentioned that it had been sitting empty other than those two bookings because she had been renovating the apartment which now makes sense why the building looks like absolute crap and doesn't match the apartment. She told me that the only possibility for who that was could be the previous owners or someone related to them. Isn't that illegal? That possibility slash theory really messed with me. How was it possible that I was gone all day every day and the 10 minutes that I was home during the daytime, someone tries to come in? Did they know that I was there? What were they coming in for? If this apartment has been sitting empty for half a year, maybe they did this frequently. Or maybe they saw me come in and tried to do something to me. These questions are constantly on my mind. I just know that I am so lucky that I put the keychain on the door, or else. I don't even want to know what else could have happened. Needless to say, I won't be leaving a good review. And I won't be staying in an Airbnb that has no reviews, or seems too good to be true. Edit to people thinking that it's the contractors, apartment building workers, etc. The owner said that no one else has the set of keys except for her and I at the time. So the only option was the previous owners, someone close to them, or the other person who had previously stayed at the Airbnb and made a copy. Either way, that experience was messed up. So I'm currently staying at an Airbnb with some family before I go back to my normal boring life, and I've been noticing some things that just don't feel right to me. 1. There are no normal doors in the house, only barn doors with their bottom stopper removed, which make it incredibly easy to simply push them off the hinges. 2. There are peak holes in different areas of the house that makes it easy to see into other rooms without someone seeing you. But what has been the final straw for me? is that last night I swear I started hearing movement in the attic of the house, but have no way to check because I don't have a stepladder that can reach the entrance. Update as I'm writing this. I've just heard tapping on my ceiling. I'll update this in the morning if I have not been murdered by a serial killer. Wish me luck. Before bed update, because I realized I forgot to mention why I'm not as paranoid or worried as someone who is alone might be. I have a 180 pound dog that would rip anyone to shreds if they tried to hurt me or my family. And yes, she is awesome. Update. Seems we have a pretty good end to this little creepy encounter. I messaged the owner and he drove over to the Airbnb to look at the stuff. Explained that one of the previous renters was a bit insane in the membrane and drilled holes in the walls and how he hasn't had the chance to fix them yet. As for the noises in the attic, the owner grabbed the ladder to let me look around and I found a big fat raccoon up there. This isn't about me, but my dad and I together. When I was in kindergarten, my dad was deployed to Iraq for a year. He was sitting around a lot and got through three seasons of Lost in that time, but every once in a while he would have to fly a combat mission. Because I was so young, 
I was scared to walk into the school for the first month or so. I didn't want to leave my mom. To help the fear of school, my school counselor gave me a sheet that, if I was brave enough to go to school, she would mark the piece of paper with an X. If I had enough X's, I got a piece of candy. After this fear subsided and I was walking into school normally, my mom mailed the sheets to my dad to show how far I had come. My dad kept these by his bed, so every day he had to go and fly a combat mission he would think, if my five-year-old son is brave enough to go to school, I'm brave enough to fly a helicopter. It gave him confidence and led him on. It was a scary time for all of us, but we got through it. We laugh about it today. In 2007 to 2008, I was deployed to Balad Airfield. For those who were deployed to Iraq, you probably thought of it as a vacation spot for most of the other bases. The base would always get indirect fire every day, but they had the worst aim. My job at the base was to watch what they called the RAID camera, which would look out 4,000 feet in four cameras facing north, south, east, and west. My job was to catch people placing IEDs or anything that looked suspicious around our base. I was Army, but our captain was Air Force. I don't know why it was like that. I was a private first class at the time and was just following orders. Captain Jackson will never forget his name. So much wanted to catch someone. And on my shift, he found his vehicle that he thought placed an IED. Long story short, he saw it. I didn't. But I didn't speak up because of rank and found out we killed a family of four. I had two kids of my own right now. And sometimes I can't sleep at night because I'm alive, and that family is not. If only I was more strict with my captain and told him, No, sir, I didn't see what you saw. No, you're wrong. No, I did not have PID. I hate it every time. Around the anniversary when it happened. I hate it that he got a slap on the wrist. I hate that it was just okay. My dad related this story to me when he was quite old. Never said an awful lot about his World War II days. He was on the beach at Dunkirk for four days. Didn't like the Stukas unsurprisingly. On one of the days, him and a buddy were told to take a truck and go to pick up some wounded from a barn away back from the beach. They had a Bren gun carrier with them. They got there safely, although he did say that they could see German tanks in the fields on the way. As they were loading the troops, a German armored car and a motorbike plus sidecar with a machine gun mounted on it came into the farmyard. First shot from the armored car took out the Bren gun. Truck took off with the armored car chasing it and machine gunning the guys in the back. My dad was in the front passenger seat with someone sitting on his lap. That dude got a bullet in the head and was killed outright. The road they were on had high hedges and they couldn't get off it. Eventually, they came to a gate and the driver crashed through it, straight into the middle of a squad of German tanks. Luckily, the crews were outside of them cooking a meal, drove straight past them to a canal at the edge of the field and jumped into it. Dad and his buddy spent the next eight hours up to their necks in the water hiding from the searching Germans and eventually made it back to the beach. Lucky man, survived North Africa and Monte Cassineo afterwards. Didn't have a lot to say about that apart from the MC being hell on earth. My name's Natalia, but people call me Tally, and I'm a 21-year-old language student from Leicester currently doing a year abroad in Bordeaux, in the south of France. I haven't made too many friends here. I'm not too much of a party girl like my big sister. But the friends I have, I hold dear to me. I won't bore you too much with the details of my life here. But so far, after the first few months, nothing too eventful has happened, besides a couple of run-ins with some local troublemakers. But other than that, I've had a really nice time. The food here is lovely. 
The city is beautiful, and the weather is a lot nicer than back home. British people making jokes about the weather back home again, ha ha. A couple of weeks ago, we took a trip around the south, to my friend Clement's hometown, June. There are lots of beautiful little villages scattered around this part of the countryside, which are very peaceful, calm, and the people are pleasant. This is not an area that tourists typically visit. You find that the locals are often bemused to find a foreign person in this little part of the country. Not too far from Gune, there is a slightly larger village called Eugenie Le Bans. I may sound like a broken record here, but this is another very stunning part of the country that probably not many people know about, besides the locals. In the town, there is a Michelin star restaurant, and we decided to pay a visit here for my boyfriend Brad's birthday, his 23rd to be exact. And as it was now two years since we had met, it was nearly our second anniversary too. He had taken time off of work to come to France to visit me, and we were glad to be spending some time together again finally. We booked a table for four in the restaurant. Me, Brad, Clement, and his girlfriend, Jeanette. Initially, we had wanted to book into the restaurant's hotel as well. However, it was too dear for students like us. We booked into an Airbnb instead on the outskirts of town. We enjoyed a lovely meal and then sat outside drinking wine and smoking cigarettes in true French fashion. We then went for a late night stroll through the town, enjoying the quaint little frog statues situated within the town. After we got too tired, we decided to head back to our Airbnb and rest for the night before we would just head off to our next destination. Clement's girlfriend, Jeanette, was Catholic and always wanted to visit Lourdes every year as part of her faith. We eventually made it back to the room and had another glass of wine and a couple more cigarettes before we headed off to bed around 1 a.m. I woke up at around 3 a.m. to the sound of something scratching by the door or window. I couldn't tell as I had never been there. I wondered if it could have been a dog or perhaps another small animal like a cat maybe. However, the sounds faded away almost as quickly as they appeared, and I quickly drifted back off to sleep. Not long after, however, I was awoken again, not because of any sound from outside this time, but because Brad had gotten up for the bathroom. I lay back down on the pillow and closed my eyes, but then a sudden sense of dread filled me. I don't know how, but I had a gut feeling that somebody was watching me. I looked around the room, with only the moonlight bringing in just enough light to see. I looked over to the window, which should have been closed via the shutter. But again, with Brad not being used to the life around here, he had forgotten to lock it. I could see it slowly being pulled open by a hand outside, its silhouette lit by the moonlight, attempting to open the window while holding something that I couldn't quite make out. I then heard what sounded like an old-fashioned camera shutter closing repeatedly. I hadn't heard one of these in many years, not since my grandfather would take family photos of us. But as I've heard this so many times before, it was unmistakable to me what the sound was. It felt like an eternity passed by before I could bring myself to open my mouth to yell out to Brad. The person at the window quickly began to climb down, and whilst briefly in the moonlight, I caught a clear glimpse of a very distinctive ring on the left hand. I didn't get a long look at it, but it did appear to be wooden, with a distinct marking on one side. Seconds later, the assailant was gone. Brad rushed outside to try and see who it was, but all he saw was an empty street and could hear the sound of footsteps becoming more and more distant. We didn't sleep a wink the rest of the night. Neither of us dared to. We checked out of the room as early as we could once there was sunlight. Clement and Jeanette went to get the car while me and Brad returned the keys to the lockbox. I messaged the host about what happened, and while he did seem sympathetic, he said he wouldn't be taking any action against what happened. A few days have passed, and we still have no idea who tried to break in. Brad thinks it was the host as they weren't too apologetic. However, Clement says it's because they're rich snobs and don't care about foreigners, so we'll likely never figure out who it was. The creepiest thing for me is that some perv has a photo of me lying nude in bed, and I have absolutely no idea who it was, and whether or not it might end up online somewhere.
I've told so many stories about the Vietnam War, PTSD, the loony bin at the VA hospital. So many things I regret. I got a full measure out of that war. Never was hurt much, but I was messed up. So be it. I wouldn't have it any other way. Can't even imagine myself otherwise. I really can't. And here's why. In 1966, when I was 18, I enlisted in the United States Army. You see, there was a draft, and I didn't particularly want to go to college right away. Plus, I was curious about war. I mean, I could have gone to college and gotten a deferment, but it would only be a deferment until I graduated. So, might as well just get it over with. After college, who knew? I could have business opportunities. Maybe a girlfriend. Maybe even a kid. Now was the best time. All the young men my age expected to be drafted sooner or later. That's just the way it was. This was before the draft became disputable. Selective Service had been hosing up young men since 1942. During World War II, the draft was universal, mostly. Afterwards, the draft just became part of the weather. A young man sailed through on his way to becoming an adult. Even Elvis did his bit. Muhammad Ali's simple defiance of the right of the United States of America to draft him was still a year or so in the future. Which is not to say there wasn't defiance of the draft before 1967. But it was quiet and confined to certain select and privileged scions of wealth. What happened was that when 1946 rolled around and the immediate danger to the nation came to a satisfactory conclusion, things lightened up. Selective service didn't need everybody. So they started making exceptions. Students were allowed to delay the draft. Medical excuses, what used to be called 4F, were no longer shameful. If you knew a cooperative doctor, it was easy for the doc to diagnose a condition that made one unfit for service. High blood pressure, bone spurs, bad heart, bum leg, whatever. Very little stigma involved, though someone had to play the doctor. But still, a physical disability on your permanent record, that wouldn't do much for the career of those fortunate sons. Other options were needed, and for the sons of the wealthy and influential, those options appeared. There were cushy jobs in the Army Reserve or National Guard, where you could play at being military without any risk of being sent overseas. You had to know someone, or rather, Dad had to know someone with a little pull, someone high in the Reserves or National Guard. Fortunate sons of the rich and influential were quietly being excused from military service by becoming weekend warriors in a reserve or National Guard slot that required only a few days a month of his time. And if the lucky boy was too busy with frat parties and campus hijinks, well, no one was taking attendance. I guess I was a fortunate son. I certainly thought so. My dad had been in the Signal Corps, then the Air Force, for over 30 years. He retired as a full bird colonel. He knew lots of people with influence, but there was no way he helped me dodge the draft. I would have never dreamed of asking. I could have just skated by on a deferment. Dad would have seen the wisdom of that. I had no idea there would be a draft lottery four years later. About the time I would have graduated and become re-eligible for the draft. No inkling that such a thing was even possible. Instead, I did my time. Three years in the army, 18 months of it in Vietnam. I saw some stuff that I can't unsee. I went through some major changes, and I didn't come home as the same person. I got back in the fall of 1969, went straight from the jungle to a dorm room at CU Boulder in about three or four days. I was staggering around campus trying to get oriented, and then on December 1st, they did the first draft lottery. The one for draft-eligible men born from 1944 to 1950. That would have been me. My number was 359. I would have never been drafted. Never. I could have just gone to school. I had already been accepted at a couple of colleges when I enlisted. Gotten a 2S deferment. And then the 1969 lottery would have given me a pass. Not my fault. Not me draft dodging. Not me heading for Canada or popping my eardrum. Not me shaming my family, disappointing my father and myself. Just the luck of the draw. It was unsettling, seeing that now meaningless number applied to me. It turns out that I could have skipped all of the last three years. Seemed funny at first, 
kind of hurt my head just to think about it. And that made me laugh too. Weird. Here I am, three years late getting my college degree, older than dirt compared to my student contemporaries, and a campus villain to boot. Some enlightened guy who forgot that war is not healthy for children and other living things. So that should be the end of the story, right? Oh, the irony. Joke's on me. I couldn't let go of it. I wasn't thinking, if only I had done that. If only I could go back in time and decide to just go to school. It didn't feel that way. It felt like I had already done that. Had gone to school and missed the war. Drawn a pass in the lottery. No dishonor. And gone off to law school or something. 359. I felt odd. Like I was remembering something from an unknown dimension of my memory. A life I never had. That lottery number just haunted me. And not in a good way. 359. And everything in the last three years just goes poof and disappears. Made me queasy. Seemed like I could have cheated something important. Because I didn't know that boy who skated the draft, went to school, and lucked out on his draft number. I didn't like him. Didn't like his life and didn't want to be him. And I'm not sure why, but I'm pretty sure of that. I don't care how lucky he was. He dodged service to his country. I didn't know that was important until I did my service. I didn't feel like I had missed that other life in an alternate universe. I felt like I had already lived it, and it was for some reason a dishonorable, meaningless life. Maybe so. Me? I felt like I had somehow escaped back to 1966, and this time I had done the right thing. You gotta ask yourself a question. Do I feel lucky? Well, do you, punk? I didn't have regrets. Just the opposite. I felt like I had dodged something awful. That alternative timeline whistled past my ear like a stray 12.7 millimeter round. It felt like a threat. Felt like a failure. Kind of surreal, you know? 359. That was supposed to be my lucky number, I guess. I should feel like I threw away the winning lottery ticket. For some reason, I don't feel that way at all. No. Go ahead and pull the trigger. Dirty Harry, I do feel lucky. I feel like a fortunate son. So right at the onset of Operation Restore Hope in Somalia, our unit was one of the first ones deployed. I was in the United States Marine Corps. After spending a night at the Mogadishu airport, we moved into the back of the embassy and started setting up firing holes, etc. Because that area had been abandoned for so long, except for the Somalis using it as a graveyard, there was tons of trash, critters, etc. there. A couple of us were rinsing off while standing on a large pallet when a big, ugly, four-inch centipede bit me on the ankle of my right leg. Within a minute or two, my leg was paralyzed and two buddies had to carry me to the aid station. The doctor had nothing to treat it, so he said I could either wait to see what happens or head back to my area and wait. We decided to wait, and after watching a red streak move up my leg and then subside, I could walk again. It was fortunately not as bad as it could have been, but I was curious what other critters anybody else has been bitten by. This past weekend, I was at a bachelorette party in Scottsdale, Arizona. We rented an Airbnb that is managed through a property management company located in a cul-de-sac that had one other rental. The other houses were residential. The front door had a key code that they changed for every new guest check-in. On the last night, we stayed up until about midnight before all going to our separate bedrooms. Two girls locked up. Front door. Back door made sure the garage door was closed and that the garage entry door was locked as well. We were all into true crime, so definitely overly aware, if that's even possible, of our safety slash surroundings at all times. Fast forward to 3.30 or 4 a.m. ish, and one of my friends wakes up because she heard a door slam closed, 
and someone say, hello? She's freaking out and can hear this person walking towards the room that she's staying in with two of our other friends. The intruder opened up the door, and my friend shouted, who are you? And the intruder, who looked like a girl our age, said sorry, and ran out of our house through the garage door. She and the two girls in her room got up and closed the door and checked everything else, and it was all still locked. On the other side of the house, one of my friends had woken up later in the night because she had a super unsettling feeling that someone was watching her while she slept. Her room had floor-to-ceiling windows with sliding doors going out to the pool. She had no idea that any of this other stuff happened until the next morning. It was really scary the next morning because everyone else had slept through all of this happening. If the intruder had bad intentions and my friend hadn't heard her enter, a very different and scary scenario could have taken place. We concluded that the property management group was not changing the entry door keypad codes or using the same exact code for both rental houses on the cul-de-sac, and the girl was drunk and got the houses mixed up. Either way, very creepy night. My husband and I got married during level three lockdown in New Zealand. We wanted to do something special the night of our wedding, so we got an Airbnb in a harbor near where we live. The place was the back house of someone else's house and kind of in slash near a forest. It was also pretty small, one room and a bathroom. We had just gotten married, so we were acting very in love that night for lack of any better word. We also had the windows open because we believed that where we were was very remote. When we decided to go to sleep, my husband decided that since we were in New Zealand, there was no need to lock the door. And like an idiot, I went along with this. We go to sleep and a few hours later, at about 3 a.m., there is a distinct loud knocking on the wall that our heads are laying against. There were about seven knocks spaced out evenly to be exact. It was that kind of sound that, to me, was deliberately trying to wake us up. I shrieked, and then my husband looked out the windows for movement. There wasn't any movement or sound after, just extremely still. What's also weird is the Airbnb had motion-sensing lights on the opposite side of where the knocking came from. It was almost like whoever it was knew not to set off the lights. Also, because I think people will ask, I know in my gut that this came from a person and not an animal or wind, etc. After a few hours of being terrified, we didn't hear anything else for the rest of the night. The next day, I asked the Airbnb host about it, and they said they didn't know anything and were genuinely sorry. They even let us stick around past checkout to enjoy the view a little longer. To be honest, I genuinely don't think it was them. I know this isn't as creepy as some of the other stories on this subreddit, but I still wanted to share because I don't understand why. Why would someone want to just wake us up, especially if the door was unlocked? A part of me wants to think that it was someone homeless looking for a place to sleep. But then why would they try and wake us up? Why not peek in a window that we stupidly left open? Another theory is they were doing something perverted and watching us earlier in the night. Again though, why would they want to wake us up four hours later? I appreciate any and all speculations, because frankly, these questions keep me up at night. There was a time I almost stayed in a murder house Airbnb for my bachelorette party. I was one month out from marrying my best friend and the time for my bachelorette party had come. I had spent so much time talking about this saying, if we don't almost die, did we even do it right? I definitely didn't mean it in the way it almost happened. My ladies and one wonderful gay gentleman were leaving our area on Friday after work to head to San Diego. I have horrible anxiety and had a stressful day at work, so my friends attempted to get the party started by pre-gaming before the drive. Designated drivers excluded, of course. I accidentally got a little too turnt, and my anxiety was flaring up again, so I decided to try to sleep until we got there. My group consisted of my mom, mother-in-law, all the girls in the wedding, and my one guy friend. 
Most of us are all college age girls. We get to the house and I'm still under the influence and very out of it. When we got there, I really needed to use the bathroom. My mother-in-law approached my friend that was driving us and frantically started whispering about something. I thought I caught the phrase, someone's in the house. That caught my attention. So I asked my mother-in-law if I had heard her correctly. Was there someone in the house? And she replied calmly, no, honey, everything is fine. I was the kind of intoxicated where everything is blurry and to see something, your eyes really have to zoom in or you can't make it out. I kind of felt like Baymax in Big Hero 6 when he runs out of battery, if that makes any sense. So I make my way up the stairs to this beautiful house. I walk in the doorway to say hi to my sister-in-law who is setting some things up. I stop when I see men's slides by the door. I carry on assuming that they're my brother-in-laws. When I remember that he's not here and the only other man on our trip doesn't wear slides like that. Huh. I shrug it off. I quickly say hi to my sister-in-law and make my way to the bathroom. I slump over while I pee and my head is spinning. I look up and notice a couple of weird things. It's only me and my sister-in-law in the house so far. Everyone else is making their way up with their bags and suitcases. So why is there already shampoo and body wash in the shower? Why is there a men's button-up shirt hanging in front of me? Then, I notice something super creepy. There is a second door in the bathroom. The top and bottom half are separate, so they can open independently. The halves are only velcroed together, but the door is locked from the other side. Now I'm confused, but I'm also very drunk, so I plop my confused butt on the couch and try to sober up a bit while we all get settled in. Then, my mom and mother-in-law look a little concerned. We rented the whole house to ourselves. The host knew it was for a bachelorette party. Now we notice the cameras inside the living room. We weren't told about these. It's around this time that my mom notices that each bedroom has its own lock code to get in. But there's one bedroom that she doesn't have the code for. Not to mention that the doors automatically lock. We notice this when the front door shut behind us and locked automatically. My mom uses the code she does have and starts inspecting the rooms. Each room has a different theme and one of the rooms is decorated with a gun on the wall. At this point, my mom is unhappy with how weird this is turning out to be and contacts the host to complain about the cameras and how we weren't aware that there would be any. He assured us that he doesn't watch them. They're only there for safety purposes in case any of the tenants wreck the house. My two mamas both start to settle down and set up for the party. That's when my mom gets a call from the host, yelling at her, asking why there are so many cars in the driveway. How would he know that unless he was watching the cameras? At some point, he's screaming at my mom over the phone so loud that she has to pull the phone away from her ear. Put a pin in this. On the phone, the host and my mom are going back and forth about issues within the house. Like why it seems like there is so much stuff here if we have the house to ourselves. And that's when the host lets something slip that makes both of my moms believe that he's in the house with us, which would account for the room we can't access and the weird door that's locked from the other side of the bathroom. But even worse, remember how he was screaming at my mom earlier? If he's in the house, why can't we hear him? It's because the locked room we can't get in might be soundproofed. That was enough. And my two mamas jumped into mama bear mode and yelled at us to grab every bag we could and run to the car and pack up and go as fast as possible. It didn't help that half of us were intoxicated trying to carry stuff down the stairs. Thankfully, I was mostly oblivious to the situation at the time and only noticed a mild sense of panic in the group. We all rushed to another hotel while all of the husbands, boyfriends, and my fiance were calling us frantically to see if we were okay. We settled in and had a great night after that. The next morning, I woke up with very little understanding of what had happened. I woke up in a beautiful hotel with the sun shining and happy, while the other members of the group woke up with leftover terror and panic from the night before. While it was definitely a scary experience, it gave us one hell of a story to tell when we got back. It was a cool and wet December day off the coast of North Carolina at Camp Lejeune in December of 1982. I had just gotten out of trouble for saying lewd things to a chief. 
I had gotten from being on the coxswain of an 80-ton mic boat hauling marine tanks to the beach, back to running the deck of an LCU that carried three tanks. Minus my E4 Chevron, the skipper busted me to an E3. I was at the back of the boat on the controls of an anchor we dropped to help pull the 350-ton landing craft off the beach when it all started. I could not see, but I knew something was wrong by the way the boat's stern was wanting to pull towards the beach. I had been here once or twice. Before I got the order, I started to bring in the cable which was attached to the anchor. You really did not want that two-inch cable getting caught in either the screw or the shaft. Still, we kept swinging towards the churning surf. We were going to broach sideways on the beach, and there was no stopping it. At the time, we had loaded two trucks and two artillery pieces before we started to broach. After we secured the anchor and as I got near the front of the boat, I felt the first shudder as the boat started bouncing on the sand. Then there was a loud bang and the boat shimmied as waves picked up the 10-ton ramp and dropped it. Everyone on the boat felt it. I rushed forward, only to find the ramp winch had stopped working. It was not responding to the controls. I opened the hatch to the compartment where the winch was, and it was obvious what had happened. The smell told me the winch had burnt out. It had to be hand cranked to bring it up, 100 revolutions to raise it one inch, and it had to come up almost 15 feet. As the boat bounced in the sand, it started to get off the beach. The craftsmaster did a good job getting the craft turned. Unfortunately, when he turned into the waves, the inoperable ramp started causing problems. It was possible we could lose it. The waves would pick up all 10 tons of it, then let it slam down hard over and over. It seemed the ocean got rougher each passing minute and Davy Jones wanted that ramp. The vehicles had not yet been secured, so there was no choice in turning around and getting them off the boat. It had to be done. The craftmaster timed it well and buried that ramp in the sand as the waves lifted it. Then the trucks were able to disembark. That's when the real trouble started. As the boat turned to get off the beach again, a series of huge waves hit us, pushing us sideways, leading us to sitting on the sand. High, but far from dry. We were stuck. Good for the ramp, bad for the boat. The waves kept pounding into the port side of the boat, causing all 350 tons to rock in the turf. It got to the point where we were going to need help getting off the beach. The amphibious CB unit had a 30-ton bulldozer there. They tried to push us off the beach to no avail. After a half hour, it was decided to get another boat to attach a tow line and pull us off. The tide was going out and time was short. It was a simple job. Put on a life jacket then have two lines tied to me so I could go outside the stern gate to attach a 30-pound shackle to the tow line. Typical Boss Wayne's mate stuff. Most everyone in my rate had done something like that before. You just embrace the suck, do your job, and move on to the next one when you're a deck ape. We got off the beach. The other LCU pulled us off and had us floating in minutes. Was only one problem... We were informed over the radio that we had a huge hole in our starboard aft quarter. The bulldozer driver never told us that he tore open our boat. Being the crap bird at the time and most everyone else concerned with the ramp, it was up to me to find out how bad it was. I dropped down the scuttle into a small compartment between the engine room and the aft spaces where I opened the hatch. I knew immediately it was pretty bad. When I opened the hatch, the water pressure behind it forcefully pushed the hatch open allowing the water to pin me against the bulkhead below the surface. I may have peed myself at that point, not really sure. It could have been the adrenaline coursing through me as I was temporarily trapped underwater in a flooded compartment. In seconds that seemed like minutes, the pressure subsided and I was able to enter the compartment that was only four to five feet in height. It was very bad, a five foot long by three foot high opening and after steering half of it below the water line. I waved at the other boats through the hole, even swam out of the hole to see the damage from that view. By the time I got back on deck by climbing up the side of the boat, we had other reports of water leaking into compartments forward. After searching the entire starboard side, we found five to six other small holes, which were easily fixed with wooden conical-shaped damage control plugs. 
Just pound them in with a sledgehammer and it'll stop the leak. Then we had to focus on the large hole. No way the parts and equipment we needed was going in the small hatch. All the wood, metal braces, and other equipment had to come through the hole from the outside with the help of another boat. Two of us went down to repair the boat. Once we had everything we needed, they closed the hatch behind us and we did what sailors have done since people went to sea. We fixed the hole. That was a major feeling, hearing that hatch close behind you as you entered a flooded compartment. We were trained for this though. After beating the jagged steel mostly flat with a sledgehammer, then putting up one section of wood over the hole, we started jamming mattresses and blankets around the edges. After a second layer over that, braced to wherever we could, the two of us stopped enough water for the pumps to keep up. Problem solved? No. Just as we got back to within 300 yards of the ship, our engines started to sputter and then they died. We found out later that water went up the air vent to the fuel tank due to lack of preventative maintenance long before I got there. The ship managed to get lines on us and pull us into the well deck. It was a rough entrance. With no control, the rolling waves had their way with the boat, sending us crashing into the batter boards inside the well deck. It was the fastest I ever saw a ship's deck go from flooded to dry during my three years at Assault Craft Unit 2. After seeing the boat dry, we did a pretty good job of fixing her. Just like they taught us, I was going to get put in for an NAM, which was amusing. Go from captain's mast to getting a naval achievement medal in just over four weeks. Plus, I had just re-enlisted a few months prior to my interaction with the chief. We worked all night repairing the boat with the professional help of the ship's company on LPD-1, USS Raleigh. Had to drain our fuel tanks and refill, but we were ready to get underway for operations before sunrise. Then the next morning came, and the previous day was forgotten. It only gets worse from there. The next day started off as the previous one. It was cold, wet, coastal North Carolina December morning. We were all tired from working all night, repairing the boat from the previous day's adventures. As the senior chief said, it was a great Navy day. He had no idea what was coming. Neither did I. If I had, there is no doubt that I would have swam ashore than run for the hills. We had been sent to a different ship to pick up three M60 tanks, then proceed to the beach. We married up to the back of an LST, a tank landing ship to load, the type that can actually land on the beach itself and unload once it extends its ramp. It was not too bad out on the water, rolling four-foot seas. That made it tougher to load, but we had done it in far worse conditions. It was timing. Move the tank when the ship is in the trough of the wave. We got him on board for the short ride to the beach. The craftmaster already told me that an engineman would be on the anchor. He wanted me to ramp controls to show the new seaman once again how to lower the ramp and bring it back up. Quite often, when a boat hits the beach, sand will build up on the ramp. You must wash that sand off by lowering it as the boat turns, or else the winch can burn out as it did the day before. Everything was going as it should when we approached the beach. I had cracked the ramp open just enough for me to see over top of it without the waves causing it to move. There were a lot of sandbars off the coast there. Our flat-bottomed boats usually scoot right over them. This one was big enough to slow us down more than usual. It felt like we hit the beach. Seconds later, we did. To go back a few hours, around midnight, a flight surgeon wanted a ride to the beach. He had never ridden a landing craft. No problem. High tide came close to the first aid station, so they moved it to within 50 yards of where we landed. Not counting the two new people, we were an experienced crew trained to handle any situation. It was cloudy, but clear enough for air ops. The driver of the first tank was a cherry straight out of tank school. He thought we had indeed touched down and released his brakes after being told to keep them on until myself or another seaman said otherwise. This next part kind of sucks especially for me. If you're squeamish, stop here. You know what is coming. The worst part, I remember every second. After we crossed over the sandbar, a wave picked up that 350-ton boat loaded with 150 tons of tanks 
and pitched us onto the beach. Hard. The tank driver thought we were already on the beach, so when he started to roll, he tried to hit his brakes, but only stopped one tread. That made the tank pivot and pin me against the hatch that led to the ramp winch. I say pin me, but I had no idea at the time that in reality it crushed me. At first, I didn't know what happened. I couldn't move. Looking over at the seaman I was training, I saw the look of horror on his face. I heard the craftmaster scream, move that tank. That is when I looked over my shoulder and saw the tank. Dang, is all I could get out as the tank started to reverse. The seaman grabbed me and sort of peeled me off the tank. I was stuck to the tread. He got me down on the deck and the crew had all of our medical supplies out before the flight surgeon got to me. I knew it was bad. Oh man, oh crap oh man was what I heard from my shipmates. Still, they knew what to do. At one point, I thought I had died. A specter dressed in black climbed over the side of the boat and approached me. I swear, I thought it was death coming for me. Turns out, it was a Navy SEAL corpsman who was in a Zodiac boat nearby. He heard it over the radio and came to render assistance. Between the corpsman and the doctor, they put the torn chunks of flesh back in place and got me into a Stokes stretcher, the one with a life jacket at one end. Somehow I ended up with my feet at the life jacket end. This became important to me later. As they loaded me onto the very tank that crushed me, I saw all that blood on deck and knew that my chances were not good. I remember leaving the boat and being put into a shittuck and whisked away as several corpsmen from the aid station jumped in. As we were flying, I was face down and could see out of the open door as we cruised over Swampland. All I could think of was if this bird crashes, I'm going to float upside down and drown. That actually scared me. I tried my best to tell them, but I couldn't talk. It was getting hard to breathe, much less speak. They got me to the hospital quickly. Turns out, the Hilo Pliot flew dust off missions in Vietnam. His job then was medical evacuation. But he said he made that Chinook do things it was not supposed to do as he lifted off. As they took me off the bird, I saw even more blood. It didn't take long to get more in me, though. They radioed ahead and got the blood type from my dog tags. The only vein available in those seconds was on my neck. The doc stuck the needle in as we were rolling towards the ER. I felt that cold blood reach my heart and spread throughout my body. Weird feeling. I stayed awake throughout the entire ordeal, in the ER and pre-op. I thought I was going to die. All that blood on the deck of my boat on the helo, and now on the floor. I actually said, I'm gonna die a few times. I thought of my daughter. She was 13 months old and would never remember me. That was my last thought as they put me under. I did not expect to wake up. Sometimes I do wake up and wonder if it was all a dream. Then I move. No, not a dream. It still hurts. This happened in earlier 2017. I was a 23-year-old girl and had just finished college. The field I studied was not huge in my area, so I decided to leave. I moved to the biggest city in my country to make a post-graduation course and look for a job. As I was still unemployed, I decided I would wait to make a long-term rental contract, worrying about a bad commute to work. In the first couple of months, I was switching from Airbnbs and hostels all the time. I was already tired of this. I decided that this would be my last move and then, with or without a job, I would settle. I was already running out of money and decided to stay in a dorm in a hostel next to where I was taking classes. Sharing a bedroom is not a problem to me during a trip, but when you're living somewhere, trying to create a routine and have some privacy, sharing a bedroom with a complete stranger just sucks. I would share the dorm with three guys, but my bad encounter was not with any of them. They were nice apart from one of them snoring really bad at night. No biggie. In another dorm, though, was the creepiest person I have ever met. 
He was in his mid-30s and was not traveling. He was a native from the city that we were in and was using the hostel as a new house since his parents kicked him out of theirs. He introduced himself and tried to be nice and flirty to me. I was polite initially, but declined his interest. He wouldn't stop. He started following me all day long inside the hostel. Anywhere I went, he would show up in less than five minutes. On my second day there, I left the hospital to a job interview, and by the time I arrived, late in the night, he was seated alone in the front stairs waiting for me. He told me this like it was the most natural thing on earth. He would buy me snacks, ask me out, try to get information about my personal life. All of this while I had already made clear my lack of interest in this friendship. All of this happened in three days. I was already exhausted of his presence, but what I didn't know is that it could have went way worse. As soon as one of the guys that were sharing the dorm with me left, he asked the hostel staff to switch dorms and stay in the same as me. Obviously, he didn't tell me this. So imagine how surprised and disgusted I was when I saw him coming up to the dorm with all of his belongings. I was so scared of his presence around that I slept wearing jeans to avoid any sort of advantages that he could take from me while sleeping. The very next morning, I decided to leave. The situation had exponentially went worse, and I couldn't handle it anymore. While I was packing, this guy showed up, noticed what I was doing and started to cry, asking me not to leave him. Then, to make things more creepy and disgusting, he told me he would miss seeing my face while I was sleeping, and thank God he had taken photos. I was trying my best to keep calm about his behavior, but I just lost it when he told me he had taken pictures of me while I was sleeping. I took his phone from his hand, asked to see his pictures, and deleted all of them. There were a bunch of photos of me sleeping the night before. I left the hostel, and I really regret not reporting him to the staff. So I'm closing in on two years since I moved into my current roommate's place, which got me thinking about an incident from two years back. To set the scene, I'd moved a long ways from home back then, out of state into a whole other region of the United States. I had moved because of a better job market. Well, at least for someone like me who never did bother with college. Because of a better social climate. To put a little distance between me and my parents, since they do drive me a little too crazy for me to be that close to them. And because I hated the weather where I used to live. I was 30, for the curious. Striking out on my own for the first time. It was risky. I didn't exactly have much in the way of money, but it was something I needed to do. I had nowhere concrete to stay yet. I knew a few people in the area, but none I could stay with long term. Just some friends who let me room with them for a few weeks in their tiny apartment while I got things in motion. And I'm not complaining about it being tiny, because I was grateful to be allowed to stay a bit. Just the tininess factored into why staying longer wasn't going to be a thing. We all agreed it was just too cramped with four people sharing space. So I decided to start Airbnb hopping instead. Eventually, Airbnb got too expensive for the long term while I was trying to save up money. I wasn't saving up anything, between what I was making at my new job and the cost of decent lodging. Plus, you know, having to eat. So I decided to rough it in my car for a little while, figuring I could save up faster by cutting lodging costs completely. I just joined Planet Fitness to shower and shave there, slept in a car center with a grocery store, laundry mat and storage center, and went to a nearby library for internet. I was planning to start looking for a place to live a short ways in. In the meantime, I kept working and saving up a good deal faster, figuring I'd at least wait until I had three or four pay stubs to provide proof of income, as seems to be the norm for people seeking roommates. So the time came where I decided to post an ad on Craigslist for a room share wanted. Craigslist had worked out okay for me in the past with making car sales. And while I'd try responding to posted roommate wanted ads, they fell through. Just never worked out. So I have my ad up, explaining my situation, minus the living in the car part because I didn't want anyone knowing that I was homeless. I was new in town. I worked this sort of schedule. This is what I'm like. 30-year-old male. Didn't matter if I lived with men or women. 
wanted something LGBT friendly because I'm gay, etc. Included a recent and unique picture of myself for authenticity. I get a few responses. Nothing. Nothing. Hmm. And then Daryl shows up. Daryl is allegedly a school teacher. He's in his 50s. I only saved one of his emails, the most important one, so some of the details are a bit fuzzy. He seems normal enough, pleasant enough, that I'm just a little wary already. But we exchanged some short emails, introducing ourselves, explaining what we're looking for. He asks if I have a car. I tell him I do. I just ask him for a few more details, and who oh boy. If it's alright, I'd like to just go ahead and post the full text of his last email, minus a few town names that might narrow it down, because a summary really just didn't do it justice. I have a house in this town, which is near this town's border. The reason why I asked about a car is because I live out in the woods and you'd need one to get around. I don't text. I'm a very private person. I'm very sick and I've been through a lot of tragedy since 2008. Many of my family members have passed away from cancer. I basically live alone in my dream home that is cluttered with tons of stuff, as I had to clean out all my dead relatives' houses. At one time, I was basically a millionaire as I owned several rental properties. I lost it all trying to save my family. But that's a long, depressing story that I don't want to bore you with right now. Every once in a while, I look through Craigslist housing wanted ads to see who's out there looking for a place to live. I've tried to have two people before come to live with me, and it really didn't work out. The first one was a woman who was desperate because she was living out of her car, and I read her ad and felt sorry for her. When she came to live with me, she snuck a boyfriend into my house during the day. I found out about it when the police called me in work, because they were called to my house when he beat the crap out of her, over her stealing his drugs. The next person to come and live with me was a young African-American man, 20 years old. He was the son of my neighbor across the street. I knew him since he was a baby. I'm deadly allergic to cigarette smoke and I never saw him smoking. I thought he was a good kid. I started coming home and thought I smelled something burning all the time. It was the middle of winter and when I questioned what the smell was, he'd say, Oh, I had a fireplace going today. I hope you don't mind. Then I started getting really sick and developed a lung infection as I have lupus and have had a heart attack. My doctors keep telling me that my lupus condition was deteriorating, as they couldn't find another cause. Then, one day, I came home and found a cigarette butt in my kitchen sink. I went up to his room and went inside, and found cigarette butts all over with burn marks in my carpeting and on my grandmother's antique bedroom set. When he got home, I freaked out and told him he had to leave. I've just had these bad experiences. My house is in disarray, and I really could use someone to help me straighten things out. I have a guy that comes over every Saturday to do the yard work, but I need help with things on the inside. I'm in my 50s. I'm not gay, but that's another thing I'd have to discuss. I don't know what LGBT friendly means to you, but that makes me wonder for a minute. I just thought that your ad sounded like you were a good, honest kid, and maybe we could help each other out. I know your workplace is a distance from the town that I live in, but it's not too far to commute. I just thought it might be interesting. I would really prefer to talk by phone. I won't be available tomorrow, but if you're off on this day, that day, or whenever, maybe you can give me a call then. I usually go to bed around 9 or 10. Just let me know and take care. Daryl. So yeah, I get this guy's horribly unlucky life story in which everyone he ever knew and loved died. He's had a string of horrid experiences with people. He didn't know I was gay after I mentioned it in my ad. At this point, I have to wonder what his body count is. I'm not interested in finding out firsthand. I kindly turn him down, by which I mean I responded with, Daryl, where do you come up with this stuff? And asked him if anyone's ever actually bought it. I tell him I'm insulted that he'd think I'm so dumb and I'd fall for that, and that's that. Afterwards, I never get a response from him via email, but I do get a few calls to my phone from unknown numbers all leaving voicemails where a very staticky voice shouted my name a few times in a really aggressive manner, like, OP, OP, pick up your effing phone, I know it's on you, stuff like that. None of the numbers worked when I tried them back. It weirded me out, so I said something to the security people who worked in the shopping center where I slept. 
They said they'd keep an eye out for anything strange. Tapered off after about a week with no further incident. Either way, a week or so later, I got contacted by the person who would become my current roommate, and things are going much more smoothly. As for Daryl, the supposed school teacher with the worst luck, I hope that I don't ever have to meet him. Every family has their secrets, and ours was that Yia Yia was a bit crazy. One could point to her sudden and animated outbursts of anger in awkward places, her decades of pill-popping that made her loopy and fall over. There was her seemingly random religious proclamations, her lifelong gambling obsession, her propensity to nick items from stores without paying for them, and sometimes getting caught. It became the inside joke of our family. Whenever a new incident happened and the word of it spread amongst our family, there was an ashamed amusement over it. A laugh and sort of exasperated that's yeah yeah. It could reach boiling points sometimes. Like when we would receive calls from the police because she was acting irate in a store, or cursing at family members because they disagreed with her assertion of events. In my high school history class, I had to do an assignment which just about every American high school kid must do at one time or another. You interview a relative about their life. The idea is to glean what it was like to be alive during historical events we all live through. I decided to interview Yia Yia. I had always known she grew up in Greece. I had known she lived there throughout the Second World War. I knew she came to America by way of meeting and marrying my grandfather, an American GI in Europe. This assignment brought new aspects of her life to light. She recalled being in a field and watching German and Bulgarian soldiers march into her town. She recalled seeing her neighbor executed in the street by Bulgarian soldiers. She told me about watching her mother eat sawdust and breadcrumbs mixed with vinegar during the Greek famine and Jewish neighbors disappearing. She recalled hurrying home one night during the war as she was out past the curfew and being stopped by Bulgarian soldiers at a checkpoint. She relayed how they threatened her life and she was only saved because a passing German officer put a stop to what these Bulgarians were doing, believe it or not. It took me decades to realize and wonder if there was more to that specific story that she didn't say. In the context of a war in which literally millions of women were violently assaulted by soldiers of armies traversing and occupying their towns. Not all of her stories were her being a victim though. Some were defiant, maybe even heroic, she told me about how she beat up the wife of the commanding Bulgarian general in charge of the occupation of her town and had to hide for days as soldiers searched for her. She told me about being rounded up with other women in her town, being put onto trucks and driven into the mountains. She survived to tell me the story by jumping out of the truck while it was driving and hiding in the mountains for a period of time. Yia Yia was born in 1923. Greece was invaded in 1941. She endured these catastrophic events as she was coming into womanhood. More forgotten to those outside of Greece, however, was that Greece also had a brutal civil war that began when the Axis occupation ended and didn't end until 1949. It's often considered the first proxy war of the Cold War. Yia Yia really had her youth robbed by the brutality of war. My own experience with war came when I was 20. I was sent to Afghanistan as an infantryman and saw war through that lens. I had to fight for my life on numerous occasions. I had close brushes with death. I watched an 18-year-old friend take his last breath with his head in my lap as we sat in a field. I put two other friends into their body bags as well. I saw civilians caught in the middle of it all. Many stories too intimate, still too fresh to tell, even to those that I am closest to. Of course, I've also lost many friends to self-unaliving since. If surviving war was one journey, coming home is another. Coming home is really the journey of recovering from it. It's a process, not an event. For many, it can be a journey that never ends. A decade plus removed from my service overseas, I've been better able to put much into perspective. I've started to realize the similarities between Yee Yee and me. Replace pills with various other substances especially marijuana, searching for spirituality in different places, 
the violent and random outbursts of anger that terrified family members. This is how we carry it. The trauma. The guilt. The frustration. It isn't pretty or neat or easy to explain. How can one even begin to explain it all? Especially to those who have no concept of what it's like to live through something like war. Yeah, Yeah passed away in 2015. I didn't realize most of what I just said until after she passed away. I'm not sure how I could have used this knowledge while she was alive. I do think that I could have been more patient with her. Maybe I could have listened to her more about her life. Maybe about what she saw. I think these, because it's what I often wish for, for those around me. I feel a camaraderie with Yee Yee now. An understanding. In a way, it now feels how we spoke about her. Is how we speak about me. How she acted was inexplicable to many in our family. But me, I get it. This was the story that my dad and grandfather told me the day that I graduated basic training. As I understand it, my grandfather was a Vietnam vet attached to a Florida National Guard unit. My dad started his army career in 1982 to the same unit. While it's uncommon for family members to be in the same unit, it's not unheard of, and it's much easier for it to occur in the National Guard because those jobs are all based on availability and limited slots. During one weekend, they were doing live fire exercises. This particular exercise focused on two separate teams attacking two separate enemy bunkers. The first team was my grandfather's, and they were tasked with clearing out the bunker. The second team was my dad's, tasked with live firing an M60 into the second bunker. My dad was the gunner. On my dad's team was a private, and he was in charge of scouting the enemy bunker with binoculars and giving my dad the okay to fire. The problem was that the wrong bunker was scouted, and when he gave my dad the okay, my grandpa's team was simultaneously storming the same bunker. So my grandfather had just cleared the bunker and was suddenly in a hail of 762 millimeter rounds coming for him. And that's how my dad almost killed my grandfather. About a year ago, I spent a decent amount of time working in a different city than I live in. One day was particularly cold, and the Airbnb I had booked was pretty far away. I didn't have a car and had failed to pack a warm coat. I ducked into the K-Bart nearby to buy something I could wear on my walk, with the intention of returning it the following morning. My best option was this enormous, extra-extra-large fuzzy bathrobe. My walk home led me through this beautiful botanic garden along a waterway. It was nearing midnight and I was halfway through my journey. I'm usually quite aware when I'm out, particularly at night, but I had let my guard down a bit, due in part to the enormous bathrobe I had wrapped around me. It was like wearing a fuzzy suit of armor. Suddenly, I felt intensely uncomfortable. I couldn't quite put my finger on what I'd heard, but my immediate thought was a couple of males holding a whispered conversation. I rounded a corner and ducked into some trees sucking my breath in and straining to understand what I was hearing. Light footsteps. Voices. Two men neared my hiding spot on the path, and I internally berated myself for not being more careful. Nobody was out, so screaming would do nothing. I'm a very small female, so the situation was one of my worst nightmares. As they passed, I heard, she's around here somewhere. I felt physically sick, until one of the guys let out a low whistle and I heard the jingle of a collar, a dog scurrying past my spot, and a good girl, followed by smoochy noises. An intense sense of relief followed. They were talking about their beloved dog, not hunting me. They seemed harmless, endearing even. I readjusted my bathrobe to cover my head. It was so cold, and popped out from the trees. I didn't realize until I later looked at myself in a mirror that the bathrobe arms were now on top of my head, sticking out like some grotesque, bulbous monster appendages. I also didn't realize that the men had stopped, or were walking very slowly, only a few meters ahead on the path. 
One of the men screamed in terror when they saw the emergence from the trees. The other swore loudly, and they both took off running across the bridge over the waterway, followed closely by their dog who was now barking frantically. I still have the picture I took of myself in the mirror after the incident, and I get the giggles every time I see it. I must admit, it was a rush to finally be on the other end of a let's not meet. Reading some of the stories on here reminded me of something that happened during my holiday this past Christmas. I went on a family holiday with my dad, mom, and brother to Tasmania, which is kind of like a big island to the south of Australia. I wasn't terribly interested in the trip, just wanted to spend time with my family, so I left all the bookings to my dad, which I'll never do again. He has his own Airbnb that he manages, so I thought that he would be able to find decent places on his own. When we rocked up to the Airbnb, my dad booked. The first thought I had was, if I wanted to sell drugs, I would do it here. My mom wasn't impressed at all and was already telling my dad off for booking it. I didn't say anything. Maybe the inside is nicer. It was a dingy little house. The paint was peeling, the roof was rusty, and there were plants overgrown to the side of the building. Imagine it's grown into the actual foundation and wooden planks. There were three entrances. The first one I worked out was the entrance for the host. It looked okay, not as bad as our entrance. A little tidier. I went downstairs, so we figured out after a while the host most likely lived below us. The second looked like it was the main entrance to the house, but it was sealed shut. The door looked like it would break down if anyone was even to push on it slightly, and was obviously unused. The third was ours. Aside from the overgrown plants, it was fairly normal. From the looks of it, we figured out later that it looks like the host had divided the house up somehow. She lives below, we live upstairs. But there was one half of the house upstairs that wasn't accounted for. Hard to explain, but the space we occupied only accounted for half of the house, and it only went up to the main entrance I spoke of, which is in the middle of the house. We checked in, just grabbed the keys. The host has never contacted us at this point. All was well on the inside. It looked a little old, but wasn't creepy from the get-go. I did notice some odd things. I only mentioned this to my dad. There were a bunch of antique instruments displayed at the entrance, and right on top of one of the pianos were three things that looked like urns. Now to explain, I am of Chinese descent. These urns freaked the F out of me, guys. Some people think they're for displaying, but we use it to store dead people's ashes. So I really, really didn't like them being there. I told my dad and he didn't like it either. But he went and tapped the urn to see if there was something in it. He couldn't tell though. But he mentioned that the one he tapped was definitely ones we use for ashes. It had scripts on it for like safe passage to the heavens from what I could make out. After I stopped freaking out, I went and picked first dibs on the biggest room as per my usual but then noticed that there were heaps of mirrors around the room. Again, another thing. Not sure if it's a Chinese thing, but we don't like sleeping with mirrors facing us when we are in bed if we can help it. So I went to move one of them, which was smack dab in front of the big bed. It was leaning against a door, and when I turned the mirror away, the door actually opened ajar a little. That freaked me out. I got my dad and we decided it's better that I slept with my mom in another room, and he would take this room with my brother. There was another room, but it's getting along, so I'll explain in the comments if anyone is interested. Again, my dad being dad, he opened the door a little and shouted, Hello? Before I told him to shut up. I had a peek inside, but couldn't make out much. Only that it was dusty and seemed to be part of the other half of the house. My dad soon after put a chair in his suitcase on top of it, in front of the door to keep it shut. Fast forward to that night. Everyone was sleepy and went ahead to bed. I stayed up a little because I had some emails from work to catch up on, and went to work in the living room area. At one point in the night, around 11.30pm, I remember there were a few thumps on the roof. Sounded like someone's footsteps. Then followed by the loudest and most horrendous noise. It sounded like a train was on top of me. It was screeching like steel on steel, and it lasted maybe for 30 seconds. I literally froze at that point. I didn't know what to do. 
thought my dad would come check on me, but no one ever did. I didn't say anything the next morning, because I thought that I may have imagined it out of tiredness. The following night, same thing again, except I was in bed this time. Just got into it, so not asleep yet. It was around the same time that the exact same noise started up again. My mom woke up, but was frozen like me. Dad came to check on us, and we were all just frozen there listening to this noise, wondering what the hell it was. After it stopped, we were freaked out, but managed to shrug it off and went to sleep. Before I fell asleep, I remember hearing some faint thumps that stopped shortly after it started. The next morning, we kind of had a meeting of some sort to discuss this. This is when I told them about the night before. We were extremely unsettled at this point, and luckily it was checkout day. We just got the hell out of there, and we never found out what it was. The creepiest thing was, after we packed up and was well away from the place, Dad was driving, but he still looked really disturbed so I asked him if he was okay. He said, I am now, but I did not have a good sleep last night. I pressed on and asked him, was it the noise? He said no. That didn't bother him much compared to another thing that he experienced. What bothered him most was when we left for our tour on the second day, he still had his suitcase on top of the chair blocking the door in his room. He just showered, so he also left the towel on the chair to hang. He said when he came back, he noticed the door was slightly ajar. The chair had moved slightly, and the towel was on the floor, as if someone tried to push it from the other side, but unsuccessfully after they noticed there was a lot of stuff on the other end. I forced him to ask the host about the noise in the door. She replied that the door was the door to her art room, and the noise was just a possum on the roof. I do not believe her. The noise was not something an animal or even a human, can make. I think about this incident every year right about this time in the Christmas season. It was a true event, and I think about it a lot when I see people stressed out about the season or their plight. The incident always serves to remind me about the true meaning of Christmas, to be grateful for the things you have. And as a reminder of no matter how bad things might be for you, there is always someone else who would give anything to be in your shoes. In the Coast Guard, it's just about every Coastie's dream to be stationed at a coastal rescue station at some point in their career. The rescue stations are in some ways like your local fire department, but in place of firemen and fire engines, there are coasties and rescue boats. It was late December in 1989, and I was a seaman, E3, at Station Checto River, located in Brookings, Oregon. The small harbor in Brookings is home to a number of pleasure craft, a number of small to mid-sized commercial fishing boats, hobbyists really, and a small number of large, serious commercial fishing boats. By 1989 to 1990, the economy wasn't doing so well, and a number of people were having hard times. The crew of one of the large, serious fishing boats decided to go fishing over the Christmas holiday to earn some much-needed extra money. Early on Christmas Day, we received a radio call from the U.S. CGC Citrus that she had picked up some survivors of a sinking. They were the survivors from the commercial fishing boat from Brookings that had gone to sea the evening of the day before Christmas Eve. The U.S. CGC Citrus was too large to enter the harbor, and so the station dispatched a 44-foot motor lifeboat to rendezvous with the Citrus and take the survivors back to the station and then on to their families. The survivor debrief I sat in on was not a regular member of the crew. He was a regular member of another commercial fishing boat. However, that particular boat was not going out fishing in the near future. Our survivor was invited by the captain and his crew as a favor, as he was in hard financial times and his boat was not fishing. Fishing communities are tight-knit communities and try to help each other out when possible. During the debrief, the survivor talked about how he and his wife had a big argument about him going out to fish during the Christmas holiday. He wanted to earn money so there would be gifts for the family and to pay bills. His wife thought it was more important for him to be with his family during the holiday. To the dismay of his wife, he prevailed and went out to sea to fish. 
the survivor recounted that it was about 2 o'clock a.m. on Christmas Day, and all hands were on deck hauling in crab pots. The boat suddenly and unexpectedly began to heel hard over to port and began taking on water. The boat rolled over and sank so quickly that there was just enough time for the crew to scramble into their immersion suits and get over the side. There was not enough time to radio a distress call, and the fishing boat was not equipped with an emergency position radio indicating beacon. They were only on the second evening of a scheduled five-day fishing trip. No one would notice that they were missing for at least three days. As the crew was floating in the water, the survivor recounted that they all knew they were in a life-and-death situation and things were not looking good. He further recounted what he would not give to at that moment be at home at the kitchen table, arguing with his wife about going out fishing and not fighting for his life. The water temperature of the Pacific Ocean near Oregon in December hovers between 45 degrees Fahrenheit and 50 degrees Fahrenheit. A person in those water temperatures without a life jacket will last only about nine minutes before becoming unconscious, and with a life jacket, about 15 minutes before becoming unconscious. In both cases, a person can only last one to three hours before dying of hypothermia. Not long after sunrise, a seaman apprentice, E2, on lookout from the U.S. CGC Citrus, spotted the survivors in the water. The lookout was just two weeks out of basic training. Normally, people who come fresh out of basic training are immediately assigned to a month of mess duty in the galley, washing dishes and swabbing the mess deck. Due to the duty rotation of mess cooks, the seaman apprentice was instead placed on lookout duty roster. BZ kid, this is what the Coast Guard is really about. After the debrief, our survivors were taken home by family members, and so ends our story, gentle readers, but not the lesson. So if you're stressed by the holiday or saddened by life, just remember this story, a real story, and remember to be grateful for what you have. On an FTX in South Korea, spring of 1990, the lieutenant decides that he wants us driving the APCs and Vulcans with our hatches down, using the glass periscope things that surround the hatch area, so we can practice driving the way we would in a real combat situation. Which, by the way, I didn't do once in Desert Storm. We only lowered the hatch if the gunner needed to fire. The problem is, and we told him, the glass is older than Jesus. It's orange with age cracked, etc. We can't see a thing. Finally, his compromise was to just do the best we can and have our team chiefs poke their heads up and direct you. He also wanted them to stay as low as possible. You know, snipers. Okay then. FTXs are filled with a lot of pretend stuff, but this was another level of stupid to me. Being a high-speed soldier in CO wannabe, I shut up and do my job. It's hard for me to see though, and my team chief is having a difficult time directing me without poking his head all the way up out of his hatch. About an hour into this, we come to a very steep hillside road, and the convoy begins to climb it. We get to the top, then start to go down. As I crest the hill and start down, I see the convoy stopped in front of me. The road was muddy enough for melted snow. We had a hard time stopping. I slid for 15 feet or so. I missed hitting the APC in front of me by a foot or so when he stopped suddenly. The whole column was stopped on a hill. I later found out it was because the lieutenant was lost. He stopped to look at his map in the terrain. He was at the front of the column, which was now located at the bottom of the trail on the other side of the hill, so the entire battery was stopped on this muddy trail. A second later, the Vulcan behind us crests the hill, sees my APC stopped, but can't stop in time. He slides and hits us, which pushes the nose of my APC towards the edge of the road, which is currently over a 50-foot drop to the bottom. How we didn't go over the hill, I'll never know. Momentum is conserved in a system, and we probably should have. I guess he didn't hit us very hard, just enough to give me a good scare. He still moved us a good five feet, though. One of the Cat USAs was driving, and he was horrified that he almost killed us. Cat USAs were Korean soldiers who lived and worked with Americans instead of being in the ROK military. It was better pay and conditions for them. 
He kept apologizing after it was all over, thinking I was mad at him. Poor guy. He was one of the better ones we had. I went ballistic about the LT. This idea almost got me and my team chief killed. I jumped out, ripped off my helmet and yelled, where is he? And went running to the front of the formation. Just as I get within choking distance of the O1, our platoon daddy, who was helping him orient the map and figure out where we were, grabs me and slams me to the ground. He won't let me up until I've chilled. The O1 is all like, what is wrong with him? I unleash a string of cussing that the world has rarely seen directed at him, along with many threats of bodily harm. Long story short, some NCO convinced him that I was just shaken up from the near miss and that it was a bad idea. He suddenly changed course and let us drive with hatches up so we could see until the new glass came in so that we could drive safely. I'll be the first to admit, it wasn't the smartest thing in the world, but that O1 one was transferred to another battery about a month later so he must have made someone angry. The entire year I was there, we never did get new glass. Go figure. Thank you so much for listening to the stories in this video. I hope you enjoyed them. I hope you get an excellent night's sleep, and I hope that you enjoy the extra rain at the end. Good night, everybody, and I'll read to you in the next video.